For the past five years, Spark has been on an absolute tear, becoming one of the most widely used technologies in big data and AI. Today's cutting-edge companies like Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Uber, and many more have deployed Spark at massive scale, processing petabytes of data to deliver innovations, ranging from detecting fraudulent behavior to delivering personalized experiences in real lifetime, and many such innovations that are transforming every industry. Hi all, I welcome you all to this full course session on Apache Spark, a complete crash course consisting of everything you need to know to get started with Apache Spark from scratch. But before we get into details, let's look at our agenda for today. For better understanding and ease of learning, the entire crash course is divided into 12 modules. In the first module, Introduction to Spark, we'll try to understand what exactly Spark is and how it performs real-time processing. In second module, we'll dive deep into different components that constitute Spark. We'll also learn about Spark architecture and its ecosystem. Next up, in the third module, we will learn what exactly relational distributed datasets are in Spark. Fourth module is all about data frames. In this module, we will learn what exactly data frames are and how to perform different operations in data frames. Moving on, in the fifth module, we will discuss different ways that Spark provides to perform SQL queries for accessing and processing data. In the sixth module, we will learn how to perform streaming on live data streams using Spark. Wherein, in the seventh module, we'll discuss how to execute different machine learning algorithms using Spark machine learning library. Eighth module is all about Spark graphics. In this module, we're gonna learn what graph processing is and how to perform graph processing using Spark graphics library. In the ninth module, we'll discuss the key differences between two popular data processing paradigms, MapReduce and Spark. Talking about 10th module, we'll integrate two popular chains, Spark and Kafka. 11th module is all about PySpark. In this module, we'll try to understand how PySpark exposes Spark programming model to Python. Lastly, in the 12th module, we'll take a look at most frequently asked interview questions on Spark, which will help you ace your interview with flying colors. Thank you guys. While you are at it, please do not forget to subscribe to Eureka YouTube channel to stay updated with current training technologies. There has been hype around the world that Spark is a future of big data platform, which is 100 times faster than MapReduce and is also a go-to tool for all solutions. But what exactly is Apache Spark and what makes it so popular? And in this session, I will give you a complete insight of Apache Spark and its fundamentals. Without any further ado, let's quickly look at the topics to be covered in this session. First and foremost, I will tell you what is Apache Spark and its features. Next, I will take you to the components of Spark ecosystem that makes Spark as the future of big data platform. After that, I will talk about the fundamental data structure of Spark, that is RDD, I will also tell you about its features, its operations, the ways to create RDD, etc. And at the last, I will wrap up the session by giving a real-time use case of Spark. So let's get started with the very first topic and understand what is Spark. Spark is an open-source, scalable, massively parallel in-memory execution environment for running analytics applications. You can just think of it as an in-memory layer that sits above the multiple data stores where data can be loaded into the memory and analyzed in parallel across a cluster. Coming to big data processing, much like MapReduce, Spark works to distribute the data across a cluster and then process that data in parallel. The difference here is that, unlike MapReduce, which shuffles the files around the disk, Spark works in memory and that makes it much faster at processing the data than MapReduce. It is also said to be the lightning fast unified analytics engine for big data and machine learning. So now, let's look at the interesting features of Apache Spark. Coming to speed, you can call Spark as a swift processing framework. Why? Because it is 100 times faster in memory and 10 times faster on the disk on comparing it with Hadoop. Not only that, it also provides high data processing speed. Next, powerful caching. It has a simple programming layer that provides powerful caching and disk persistence capabilities. And Spark can be deployed through Mesos, Hadoop via YAN, or Spark's own cluster manager. As you all know that Spark itself was designed and developed for real-time data processing, 
So it's an obvious fact that it offers real time competition and low latency because of in memory computations. Next, Polyglot. Spark provides high level APIs in Java, Scala, Python, and R. Spark code can be written in any of these four languages. Not only that, it also provides a shell in Scala and Python. So these are the various features of Spark. Now, let's see the various components of Spark ecosystem. Let me first tell you about the Spark core component. It is the most vital component of Spark ecosystem, which is responsible for basic IO functions, scheduling, monitoring, etc. The entire Apache Spark ecosystem is built on the top of this core execution engine, which has extensible APIs in different languages like Scala, Python, R, and Java. As I have already mentioned, that Spark can be deployed through Mesos, Hadoop via YAN, or Spark's own cluster manager. The Spark ecosystem library is composed of various components like Spark SQL, Spark Streaming, Machine Learning Library. Now, let me explain you each of them. The Spark SQL component is used to leverage the power of declarative queries and optimize storage by executing SQL like queries on Spark data, which is present in the RDDs and other external sources. Next, Spark Streaming component allows developers to perform batch processing and streaming of data in the same application. And coming to machine learning library, it eases the deployment and development of scalable machine learning pipelines like summary statistics, correlations, feature extraction, transformation functions, optimization algorithms, etc. And GraphX component lets the data scientists to work with graph and non graph sources to achieve flexibility and resilience in graph construction and transformation. And now, talking about the programming languages, Spark supports Scala. It is a functional programming language in which the Spark is written. So, Spark supports Scala as an interface. Then, Spark also supports Python interface. You can write the program in Python and execute it over the Spark. Again, if you see the code in Python and Scala, both are very similar. Then, R is very famous for data analysis and machine learning. So, Spark has also added the support for R and it also supports Java. So, you can go ahead and write the code in Java and execute it over the Spark. Next, the data can be stored in HDFS, local file system, Amazon S3 Cloud, and it also supports SQL and NoSQL database as well. So, this is all about the various components of Spark ecosystem. Now, let's see what's next. When it comes to iterative distributed computing, that is, processing the data over multiple jobs and computations, we need to reuse or share the data among multiple jobs. In earlier frameworks like Hadoop, there were problems while dealing with multiple operations or jobs. Here, we need to store the data in some intermediate stable distributed storage such as HDFS. And multiple I.O. operations makes the overall computations of jobs much slower. And there were replications and serializations which in turn made the process even more slower. And our goal here was to reduce the number of I.O. operations through HDFS. And this can be achieved only through in-memory data sharing. The in-memory data sharing is 10 to 100 times faster than network and disk sharing. And RDDs try to solve all the problems by enabling fault-tolerant distributed in-memory computations. So now let's understand what are RDDs. It stands for Resilient Distributed Dataset. They are considered to be the backbone of Spark and is one of the fundamental data structure of Spark. It is also known as the schemaless structures that can handle both structured and unstructured data. So in Spark, anything you do is around RDD. You're reading the data in Spark, then it is read into RDD. Again, when you're transforming the data, then you're performing transformations on old RDD and creating a new one. Then at last, you will perform some actions on the RDD and store that data present in an RDD to a persistent storage. Resilient distributed data set is an immutable distributed collection of objects. Your objects can be anything like strings, lines, rows, objects, collections, etc. RDDs can contain any type of Python, Java, or Scala objects, even including user defined classes as well. And talking about the distributed environment, each data set present in an RDD is divided into logical partitions, which may be computed on different nodes of the cluster. Due to this, you can perform transformations or actions on the complete data parallelly. And you don't have to worry about the distribution because Spark takes care of that. RDDs are highly resilient. That is, they are able to recover quickly from any issues as the same data chunks are replicated across multiple executor nodes. Thus, even if one executor fails, another will still process the data. 
This allows you to perform functional calculations against your data set very quickly by harnessing the power of multiple nodes. So this is all about RDD. Now let's have a look at some of the important features of RDDs. RDDs have a provision of in-memory computation and all transformations are lazy. That is, it does not compute the results right away until an action is applied. So it supports in-memory computation and lazy evaluation as well. Next, fault tolerant. In case of RDDs, they track the data lineage information to rebuild the lost data automatically. And this is how it provides fault tolerance to the system. Next, immutability. Data can be created or retrieved anytime and once defined, its value cannot be changed. And that is the reason why I said RDDs are immutable. Next, partitioning. It is the fundamental unit of parallelism in Spark RDD and all the data chunks are divided into partitions in RDD. Next, persistence. Users can reuse RDD and choose a storage strategy for them. Coarse grained operations applies to all elements in data sets through maps or filter or group by operations. So these are the various features of RDD. Now let's see the ways to create RDD. There are three ways to create RDDs. One can create RDD from parallelized collections and one can also create RDD from the existing RDD or other RDDs and it can also be created from external data sources as well like HDFS, Amazon S3, HBase, etc. Now let me show you how to create RDDs. I'll open my terminal and first check whether my demons are running or not. Cool. Here I can see that Hadoop and Spark demons both are running. So now at the first, let's start the Spark shell. It will take a bit time to start the shell. Cool. Now the Spark shell has started and I can see the version of Spark as 2.1.1 and we have a Scala shell over here. Now I will tell you how to create RDDs in three different ways using Scala language. At the first, let's see how to create an RDD from parallelized collections. SC.parallelize is a method that I use to create a parallelized collection of RDDs. And this method is a Spark context parallelize method to create a parallelized collection. So I will give SC.parallelize and here I will parallelize 1 to 100 numbers in five different partitions. And I will apply collect as the action to start the process. So here in the result, you can see an array of 1 to 100 numbers. Okay. Now let me show you how the partitions appear in the web UI of Spark. So the web UI port for Spark is localhost 4040. So here you have just completed one task that is sc.parallelize collect, correct? Here you can see all the five stages that are succeeded because we have divided the task into five partitions. So let me show you the partitions. So this is a DAG visualization. That is the directed or graph visualization wherein you have applied only parallelize as a method. So you can see only one stage here. So here you can see the RDD that is being created and coming to even timeline. You can see the task that has been executed in five different stages and the different colors imply the scheduler delay task deserialization time shuffle read time shuffle write time executor computing time etc. Here you can see the summary metrics for the created RDD. Here you can see that the maximum time it took to execute the task in five partitions parallelly is just 45 milliseconds. You can also see the executor ID, the host ID, the status that is succeeded, duration, launch time, etc. So this is one way of creating an RDD from parallelized collections. Now let me show you how to create an RDD from the existing RDD. Okay. Here I'll create an array called A1 and assign numbers 1 to 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay. So I got the result here. That is, I have created an integer array of 1 to 10. And now I will parallelize this array 1. Sorry, I got an error. It is a C dot parallelize of a1 okay so i created an rdd called parallel collection cool now i will create a new rdd from the existing rdd that is val new rdd is equal to a1 dot map data present in an rdd i will create a new rdd from existing rdd so here i will take a1 as a reference 
and map the data and multiply that data into two. So what should be your output? If I map the data present in an RDD into two, so it would be like two, four, six, eight up to 20. Correct? So let's see how it works. Yes, we got the output. That is multiple of 1 to 10. That is 2, 4, 6, 8 up to 20. So this is one of the method of creating a new RDD from an old RDD. And I have one more method that is from external file sources. So what I will do here is I will give var test is equal to sc.txt file. Here I will give the path to HDFS file location and link the path. That is HDFS so localhost 9000 is the path. And I have a folder called example and in that I have a file called sample. Cool. So I got one more RDD created here. Now let me show you this file that I have already kept in HDFS directory. I will browse the file system and I will show you the slash example directory that I have created. So here you can see the example that I have created as a directory. And here I have sample as the input file that I have been given. So here you can see the same path location. So this is how I can create an RDD from external file sources. In this case, I have used HDFS as an external file source. So this is how we can create RDDs from three different ways that is parallelized collections from external RDDs and from an existing RDDs. So let's move further and see the various RDD operations. RDD supports two main operations, namely transformations and actions. As I've already said, RDDs are immutable. So once you create an RDD, you cannot change any content in the RDD. So you might be wondering how RDD applies those transformations, correct? When you run any transformations, it runs those transformations on old RDD and create a new RDD. This is basically done for optimization reasons. Transformations are the operations which are applied on an RDD to create a new RDD. Now, these transformations work on the principle of lazy evaluations. So what does it mean? It means that when we call some operation in RDD, it does not execute immediately. And Spark maintains the record of the operation that is being called. Since transformations are lazy in nature, so we can execute the operation anytime by calling an action on the data. Hence, in lazy evaluation, data is not loaded until it is necessary. Now, these actions analyze the RDD and produce result. Simple action can be count, which will count the rows in RDD and then produce a result. So I can say that transformation produce new RDD and action produce results. Before moving further with the discussion, let me tell you about the three different workloads that Spark caters. They are batch mode, interactive mode, and streaming mode. In case of batch mode, we run a batch job. You write a job and then schedule it. It works through a queue or a batch of separate jobs without manual intervention. Then in case of interactive mode, it is an interactive shell where you go and execute the commands one by one. So you will execute one command, check the result and then execute other command based on the output result and so on. It works similar to the SQL shell. So shell is the one which executes the driver program and in the shell mode, you can run it on the cluster mode. It is generally used for development work or it is used for ad hoc queries. Then comes the streaming mode where the program is continuously running. As in when the data comes, it takes the data and do some transformations and actions on the data and get some results. So these are the three different workloads that Spark caters. Now let's see a real time use case. Here I'm considering Yahoo as an example. So what are the problems of Yahoo? Yahoo properties are highly personalized to maximize relevance. The algorithms used to provide personalization that is the targeted advertisement and personalized content are highly sophisticated and the relevance model must be updated frequently because stories news feed and ads change in time and Yahoo has over 150 petabytes of data that is stored on 35,000 node Hadoop cluster which should be accessed efficiently to avoid latency caused by the data movement and to gain insights from the data in cost effective manner. So to overcome these problems, Yahoo looked to Spark to improve the performance of its iterative model training. Here, the machine learning algorithm for news personalization required 15,000 lines of C++ code. On the other hand, the machine learning algorithm has just 120 lines of Scala code. So that is the advantage of Spark. 
and this algorithm was ready for production use in just 30 minutes of training on 100 million data sets and sparks rich API is available in several programming languages and has resilient in-memory storage options and is compatible with Hadoop through yarn and the spark yarn project it uses Apache spark for personalizing its news web pages and for targeted advertising not only that it also uses machine learning algorithms that run on Apache spark to find out what kind of news user are interested to read and also for categorizing the news stories to find out what kind of users would be interested in reading each category of news and spark runs over Hadoop yarn to use existing data and clusters and the extensive API of spark and machine learning library is the development of machine learning algorithms and spark reduces the latency of model training via in memory RDD. So this is how spark has helped Yahoo to improve the performance and achieve the targets. So I hope you understood the concept of spark and its fundamentals. Now let me just give you an overview of the spark architecture Apache spark has a well defined layered architecture where all the components and layers are loosely coupled and integrated with various extensions and libraries. This architecture is based on two main abstractions first one resilient distributed data sets that is RDD and the next one directed a cyclic graph called DAG or DHE in order to understand this spark architecture you need to first know the components of the spark that is spark ecosystem and its fundamental data structure RDD. So let's start by understanding the spark ecosystem as you can see from the diagram the spark ecosystem is composed of various components like spark SQL spark streaming machine learning library GraphX spark R and the core API component talking about spark SQL it is used to leverage the power of declarative queries and optimize storage by executing SQL like queries on spark data which is present in RDDs and other external sources next spark streaming component allows developers to perform batch processing and streaming of the data in the same application coming to machine learning library it eases the development and deployment of scalable machine learning pipelines like summary statistics cluster analysis methods correlations dimensionality reduction techniques feature extractions and many more now graphics component lets the data scientists to work with graph and non graph sources to achieve flexibility and resilience in graph construction and transformation coming to spark R, it is an R package that provides a light weighted front end to use Apache spark it provides a distributed data frame implementation that supports operations like selection filtering aggregation but on large data sets it also supports distributed machine learning using machine learning library finally the spark core component it is the most vital component of spark ecosystem which is responsible for basic io functions scheduling and monitoring the entire spark ecosystem is built on the top of this core execution engine which has extensible APIs in different languages like Scala, Python, R, and Java. Now, let me tell you about the programming languages. At the first, Spark supports Scala. Scala is a functional programming language in which Spark is written, and Spark supports Scala as an interface. Then, Spark also supports Python interface. You can write program in Python and execute it over the Spark. Again, if you see the code in Scala and Python, both are very similar. Then coming to R, it is very famous for data analysis and machine learning. So Spark has also added the support for R and it also supports Java. So you can go ahead and write the Java code and execute it over the Spark. Again, Spark also provides you interactive shells for Scala, Python, and R, where you can go ahead and execute the commands one by one. So this is all about the Spark ecosystem. Next, let's discuss the fundamental data structure of Spark, that is RDD called as resilient distributed data sets. So in Spark anything you do is around RDD. You're reading the data in Spark then it is read into RDD again when you're transforming the data then you're performing transformations on an old RDD and creating a new one. Then at the last you will perform some actions on the data and store that data set present in an RDD to a persistent storage. Resilient distributed data set is an immutable distributed collection of objects. Your objects can be anything like string, lines, rows, objects, collections, etc. 
Now talking about the distributed environment each data set in RDD is divided into logical partitions which may be computed on different nodes of the cluster. Due to this you can perform transformations and actions on the complete data parallelly and you don't have to worry about the distribution because Spark takes care of that. Next as I said RDDs are immutable. So once you create an RDD you cannot change any content in the RDD. So you might be wondering how RDD applies those transformations correct. When you run any transformations it runs those transformations on old RDD and create a new RDD. This is basically done for optimization reasons. So let me tell you one thing here RDD can be cached and persisted. If you want to save an RDD for the future work you can cache it and it will improve the spark performance. RDD is a fault tolerant collection of elements that can be operated on in parallel. If a RDD is lost it will automatically be recomputed by using the original transformations. This is how Spark provides fault tolerance. There are two ways to create RDDs. First one by parallelizing an existing collection in your driver program, and the second one by referencing a data set in the external storage system, such as shared file system, HDFS, HBase, etc. Now, transformations are the operations that you perform on RDD, which will create a new RDD. For example, you can perform filter on an RDD and create a new RDD. Then there are actions which analyzes the RDD and produce result. Simple action can be count which will count the rows in RDD and produce a result. So I can say that transformation produce new RDD and actions produce results. So this is all about the fundamental data structure of Spark that is RDD. Now let's dive into the core topic of today's discussion that is Spark architecture. So this is the Spark architecture. In your master node you have the driver program which drives your application. So the code that you're writing behaves as a driver program or if you are using the interactive shell the shell acts as a driver program. Inside the driver program the first thing that you do is you create a spark context. Assume that the spark context is a gateway to all spark functionality. It is similar to your database connection. So any command you execute in your database goes through the database connection. Similarly anything you do on spark goes through the spark context. Now this spark context works with the cluster manager to manage various jobs. The driver program and the spark context takes care of executing the job across the cluster. A job is split into the tasks and then these tasks are distributed over the worker node. So anytime you create a RDD in the spark context that RDD can be distributed across various nodes and can be cached there. So RDD is set to be taken partitioned and distributed across various nodes. Now worker nodes are the slave nodes whose job is to basically execute the tasks. The task is then executed on the partition RDDs in the worker nodes and then returns the result back to the spark context. Spark context takes the job breaks the job into the task and distribute them on the worker nodes and these tasks works on partition RDDs perform whatever operations you wanted to perform and then collect the result and give it back to the main spark context. If you increase the number of workers then you can divide jobs in more partitions and execute them parallelly over multiple systems. This will be actually a lot more faster. Also if you increase the number of workers it will also increase your memory and you can cache the jobs so that it can be executed much more faster. So this is all about spark architecture. Now let me give you an infographic idea about the spark architecture. It follows master slave architecture. Here the client submits spark user application code. When an application code is submitted driver implicitly converts a user code that contains transformations and actions into a logically directed graph called DAG. At this stage it also performs optimizations such as pipelining transformations. Then it converts a logical graph called DHG into physical execution plan with many stages. After converting into physical execution plan, it creates a physical execution units called tasks under each stage. Then these tasks are bundled and sent to the cluster. Now driver talks to the cluster manager and negotiates the resources and cluster manager launches the needed executors. At this point driver will also send the task to the executors based on the placement. When executors start they register themselves with the drivers so that driver will have a complete view of the executors 
and executors now start executing the tasks that are assigned by the driver program. At any point of time when the application is running, driver program will monitor the set of executors that runs. And the driver node also schedules a future task based on data placement. So this is how the internal working takes place in Spark architecture. There are three different types of workloads that Spark can cater. First, batch mode. In case of batch mode, we run a batch job. Here, you write a job and then schedule it. It works through a queue or batch of separate jobs through manual intervention. Next, interactive mode. This is an interactive shell where you go and execute the commands one by one. So you will execute one command, check the result, and then execute the other command based on the output result and so on. It works similar to the SQL shell. So shell is the one which executes a driver program. So it is generally used for development work or it is also used for ad hoc queries. Then comes the streaming mode where the program is continuously running. As in when the data comes, it takes the data and do some transformations and actions on the data and then produce output results. So these are the three different types of workloads that Spark actually caters. Now let's move ahead and see a simple demo. Here, let's understand how to create a Spark application in Spark Shell using Scala. So let's understand how to create a Spark application in Spark Shell using Scala. Assume that we have a text file in the HDFS directory and we are counting the number of words in that text file. So let's see how to do it. So before I start running, let me first check whether all my daemons are running or not. So I'll type sudo jps. So all my Spark daemons and Hadoop daemons are running. That I have master worker as Spark daemons and name node resource manager, node manager, everything as Hadoop daemons. So the first thing that I do here is I run the Spark shell. So it takes bit time to start. In the meanwhile, let me tell you the web UI port for Spark shell is localhost 4040. So this is a web UI for Spark. Like if you click on jobs right now, we have not executed anything. So there is no details over here. So the, you have job stages. So once you execute the jobs, you will be having the records of the tasks that you have executed here. So here you can see the stages of various jobs and tasks executed. So now let's check whether our Spark shell has started or not. Yes, so you have your Spark version as 2.1.1 and you have a Scala shell over here. So before I start the code, let's check the content that is present in the input text file by running this command. So I'll write where test is equal to sc.text file because I have saved a text file over there and I'll give the HDFS path location. I've stored my text file in this location and sample is the name of the text file. So now let me give test.collect so that it collects the data and displays the data that is present in the text file. So in my text file, I have Hadoop, Research, Analyst, Data, Science, and Science. So this is my input data. So now let me map the functions and apply the transformations and actions. So I'll give var map is equal to sc.text file and I will specify my input path location. So this is my input path location and I'll apply the flat map transformation to split the data that is separated by space and then map the word count to be given as word comma one. Now this will be executed. Yes. Now let me apply the action for this to start the execution of the task. So let me tell you one thing here. Before applying an action, the Spark will not start the execution process. So here I have applied reduce by key as the action to start counting the number of words in the text file. So now we are done with applying transformations and actions as well. So now the next step is to specify the output location to store the output file. So I'll give as counts dot save as text file and then specify the location for my output file. I'll store it in the same location where I have my input file and I will specify my output file name as output 9. Cool. I forgot to give a double quotes and I will run this. So it's completed now. So now let's see the output. I will open my Hadoop Web UI by giving localhost 50070 and browse the file system to check the output. So as I have said, I have example as my directory that I have created and in that 
I have specified output 9 as my output. So I have the two part files being created. Let's check each of them one by one. So we have the data count as 1, analyst count as 1, and science count as 2. So this is the first part file. Now let me open the second part file for you. So this is the second part file where you have Hadoop count as 1 and the research count as 1. So now let me show you the text file that we have specified as the input. So as I have told you, Hadoop count is 1, research count is 1, analyst 1, data 1, science and science as 1 1. So you might be thinking data science is a 1 word. No. In the program code, we have asked to count the word that is separated by a space. So that is why we have science count as 2. I hope you got an idea about how word count works. Similarly, I will now parallelize 1 to 100 numbers and divide the task into 5 partitions to show you what is partitions of task. So I will write sc.parallelize 1 to 100 numbers and divide them into 5 partitions and apply collect action to collect the numbers and start the execution. So it displays you an array of 1 to 100 numbers. Now let me explain you the job stages partitions even timeline DAG representation and everything. So now let me go to the web UI of spark and click on jobs. So these are the tasks that you have submitted. So coming to word count example. So this is the DAG visualization. I hope you can see it clearly. First you collected the text file. Then you applied flat map transformation and mapped it to count the number of words and then applied reduce by key action and then save the output file as save as text file. So this is the entire tag visualization of the number of steps that we have covered in our program. So here it shows the completed stages that is two stages and it also shows the duration that is two seconds and if you click on the event timeline it just shows the executor that is added and in this case you cannot see any partitions because you have not split the jobs into various partitions. So this is how you can see the event timeline and the DAG visualization. Here you can also see the stage ID descriptions when you have submitted that. I have just submitted it now and in this it also shows the duration that it took to execute the task and the output bytes that it took the shuffle read shuffle write, and many more. Now to show you the partitions see in this you just applied SC dot parallelize right? So it is just showing one stage where you have applied the parallelized transformation. Here it shows the succeeded task as 5 by 5. That is you have divided the task into 5 stages and all the 5 stages has been executed successfully. Now here you can see the partitions of the 5 different stages that is executed in parallel. So depending on the colors it shows the scheduler delay, the shuffle read time, executor computing time, result serialization time and getting result time and many more. So you can see the duration that it took to execute the five tasks in parallel at the same time is maximum one milliseconds. So in memory spark has a much faster computation and you can see the IDs of all the five different tasks. All are success. You can see the locality level. You can see the executor and the host IP ID the launch time the duration it take everything. So you can also see that we have created RDT and parallelized it. Similarly here also for word count example you can see the RDT that has been created and also the actions that you have applied to execute the task. And you can see the duration that it took even here also it's just one milliseconds that it took to execute the entire word count example and you can see the IDs locality level executor ID. So in this case we have just executed the task in two stages. So it is just showing the two stages. So this is all about how web UI looks and what are the features and information that you can see in the web UI of spark after executing the program and the Scala shell. So in this program you can see that first we gave the path to the input location and check the data that is presented in the input file and then we applied flat map transformations and created RDD. And then applied action to start the execution of the task and save the output file in this location. So I hope you got a clear idea of how to execute a word count example and check for the various features in Spark Web UI like partitions, DAG visualizations, and everything. I hope you found the session interesting.
Apache Spark. This word can generate a spark in every Hadoop engineer's mind. It is a big data processing framework which is lightning fast in cluster computing and the core reason behind its outstanding performance is the resilient distributed data set or in short the RDD and today I'll focus on the topic called RDD using Spark. Before we get started, let's have a quick look on the agenda for today's session. We shall start with understanding the need for RDDs where we'll learn the reasons behind which the RDDs were required. Then we shall learn what are RDDs where we'll understand what exactly an RDD is and how do they work. Later, I'll walk you through the fascinating features of RDDs such as in-memory computation, partitioning, persistence, fault tolerance and many more. Once I finish the theory part, I'll get your hands on RDDs where we'll practically create and perform all possible operations on RDDs. And finally, I'll wind up this session with an interesting Pokemon use case which will help you understand RDDs in a much better way. Let's get started. Spark is one of the top mandatory skills required by each and every big data developer. It is used in multiple applications which need real-time processing such as Google's recommendation engine, credit card fraud detection and many more. To understand this in depth, we shall consider Amazon's recommendation engine. Assume that you are searching for a mobile phone in Amazon and you have certain specifications of your choice. Then the Amazon search engine understands your requirements and provides you the products which match the specifications of your choice. All this is made possible because of the most powerful tool existing in big data environment which is none other than Apache Spark and resilient distributed data set is considered to be the heart of Apache Spark. So with this let's begin our first question. Why do we need RDDs? Well, the current world is expanding the technology and artificial intelligence is the face for this evolution. The machine learning algorithms and the data needed to train these computers are huge. The logic behind all these algorithms are very complicated and mostly run in a distributed and iterative computation method. The machine learning algorithms could not use the older MapReduce programs because the traditional MapReduce programs needed a stable state HDFS. And we know that HDFS generates redundancy during intermediate computations, which resulted in a major latency in data processing. And in HDFS, gathering data for multiple processing units at a single instance was time consuming. Along with this, the major issue was the HDFS did not have random read and write ability. So using these older MapReduce programs for machine learning problems would be impractical. Then the Spark was introduced. Compared to MapReduce, Spark is an advanced big data processing framework. Resilient distributed data set, which is a fundamental and most crucial data structure of Spark, was the one which made it all possible. RDDs are effortless to create and the mind-blowing property which solved the problem was its in-memory data processing capability. RDD is not a distributed file system. Instead, it is a distributed collection of memory where the data needed is always stored and kept available in RAM. And because of this property, the elevation it gave to the memory accessing speed was unbelievable. The RDDs are fault tolerant and this property bought it a dignity of a whole new level. So our next question would be what are RDDs? The resilient distributed data sets or the RDDs are the primary underlying data structures of Spark. They are highly fault tolerant and they store data amongst multiple computers in a network. The data is written into multiple executable nodes so that in case of a calamity, if any executing node fails, then within a fraction of second, it gets back up from the next executable node with the same processing speeds of the current node. The fault tolerant property enables them to roll back their data to the original state by applying simple transformations onto the lost part in the lineage. RDDs do not need anything called hard disk or any other secondary storage. All that they need is the main memory, which is RAM. Now that we have understood the need for RDDs and what exactly an RDD is, so let us see the different sources from which the data can be ingested into an RDD. The data can be loaded from any source like HDFS, HBase, Hive, SQL, you name it, they got it. Hence, the collected data is dropped into an RDD. And guess what? The RDDs are free spirited. They can process any type of data. They won't care if the data is structured, unstructured or semi-structured. Now, let me walk you through the features of RDDs which give it an edge over the other alternatives. In-memory computation. 
The idea of in-memory computation brought the groundbreaking progress in cluster computing. It increased the processing speed when compared with the HDFS. Moving on to lazy evaluations, the phrase lazy explains it all. Spark logs all the transformations you apply onto it and will not throw any output onto the display until an action is provoked. Next is fault tolerance. RDDs are absolutely fault tolerant. Any lost partition of an RDD can be rolled back by applying simple transformations onto the lost part in the lineage. Speaking about immutability, the data once dropped into an RDD is immutable because the access provided by RDD is just read only. The only way to access or modify it is by applying a transformation onto an RDD, which is prior to the present one. Discussing about partitioning, the important reason for Spark's parallel processing is its partitioning. By default, Spark determines the number of parts into which your data is divided, but you can override this and decide the number of blocks you want to split your data. Let's see what persistence is. Spark's RDDs are totally reusable. The users can apply certain number of transformations onto an RDD and preserve the final RDD for future use. This avoids all the hectic process of applying all the transformations from scratch. And now, last but not the least, coarse-grained operations. The operations performed on RDDs using transformations like map, filter, flat map, etc. change the RDDs and update them. Hence, every operation applied onto an RDD is coarse-grained. These were the features of RDDs and moving on to the next stage, we shall understand the creation of RDDs. RDDs can be created using three methods. The first method is using parallelized collections. Next method is by using external storage like HDFS, HBase, Hive and many more. The third one is using an existing RDD which is prior to the present one. Now let us see, understand and create an RDD through each method. Now. Spark can be run on virtual machines like Spark VM or you can install a Linux operating system like Ubuntu and run it standalone. But we here at Edureka use the best in class Cloud Lab, which comprises of all the frameworks you need at a single stop cloud framework. No need of any hectic procedures of downloading any file or setting up environment variables and looking for a hardware specification, etc. All you need is a login ID and password to the all in one ready to use Cloud Lab where you can run and save all your programs. Let us fire up our Spark shell using the command spark2 shell. Now our Spark shell has been fired up. Let's create our new RDD. So here we are creating our new RDD with the first method, which is using the parallelized collections. Here we are creating a new RDD by the name parallelized collections RDD. We are starting a Spark context and we are parallelizing an array into the RDD which consists of the data of the days of a week, which is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Now let's create this. Our new RDD, Parallelized Collections RDD is successfully created. Now let's display the data which is present in our RDD. So this was the data which is present in our RDD. Now let's create a new RDD using our second method. The second method of creating an RDD was using an external storage such as HDFS, Hive, SQL, and many more. Here, I'm creating a new RDD by the name Spark file, where I'll be loading a text document into the RDD from an external storage, which is HDFS. And this is the location where my text file is located. So the new RDD Spark file is successfully created. Now, let's display the data which is present in our Spark file RDD. So the data which was present in our Spark file RDD is a collection of alphabets starting from A to Z. Now let's create a new RDD using the third method, which is using an existing RDD which is prior to the present one. In the third method, I'm creating a new RDD by the name words and I'm creating a Spark context and parallelizing a statement into the RDD words, which is Spark is a very powerful language. So this is a collection of words which I have passed into the new RDD words. Now let us apply a transformation onto the RDD and create a new RDD through that. So here I'm applying map transformation onto the previous RDD that is words and I'm storing the data into the new RDD which is word pairs. So here we are applying map transformation in order to display the first letter of each and every word which is stored in the RDD words. Now let's continue. The transformation has been applied successfully. 
Now let's display the contents which are present in our new RDD, which is word pair. So as explained, we have displayed the starting letter of each and every word as S is the starting letter of Spark, I is the starting letter of ETH, and so on, L is the starting letter of language. Now we have understood the creation of RDDs. Let us move on to the next stage where we'll understand the operations that are performed on RDDs. Transformations and actions are the two major operations that are performed on RDDs. Let us understand what are transformations. We apply transformations in order to access, filter, and modify the data which is present in an RDD. Now, transformations are further divided into two types, narrow transformations and wide transformations. Now, let us understand what are narrow transformations. We apply narrow transformations onto a single partition of parent RDD because the data required to process the RDD is available on a single partition of parent RDD. The examples for narrow transformation are map, filter, flat map, partition, and map partitions. Let us move on to the next type of transformations, which is white transformations. We apply white transformations onto the multiple partitions of parent RDD because the data required to process an RDD is available on multiple partitions of the parent RDD. The examples for white transformations are reduced by and union. Now, let us move on to the next part, which is actions. Actions, on the other hand, are considered to be the next part of operations which are used to display the final result. The examples for actions are collect, count, take, and first. Till now, we have discussed about the theory part on RDD. Let us start executing the operations that are performed on RDDs. In our practical part, we'll be dealing with an example of IPL matches data. So here, I have a CSV file which has the IPL match records and this CSV file is stored in my HDFS and I'm loading my matches.csv file into the new RDD which is CK file as a text file. So the matches.csv file has been successfully loaded as a text file into the new RDD which is CK file. Now, let us display the data which is present in our CK file using an action command. So collect is the action command which I'm using in order to display the data which is present in my CK file RDD. So here we have in total 636 rows of data which consists of IPL match records from the year 2008 to 2017. Now let us see the schema of our CSV file. I'm using the action command first in order to display the schema of our matches.csv file. So this command will display the starting line of the CSV file we have. So the schema of a CSV file is the ID of the match, season, city where the IPL match was conducted, date of the match, team one, team two, and so on. Now let's perform the further operations on a CSV file. Now moving on to the further operations, I'm about to split the second column of my CSV file, which consists of the information regarding the states which conducted the IPL matches. So I'm using this operation in order to display the states where the matches were conducted. So the transformation has been successfully applied and the data has been stored into the new RDD, which is states. Now let's display the data which is stored in our states RDD using the collection action command. So these were the states where the matches were being conducted. Now let's find out the city which conducted the maximum number of IPL matches. Here I'm creating a new RDD again, which is states count and I'm using map transformation and I'm counting each and every city and the number of matches conducted in that particular city. The transformation is successfully applied and the data has been stored into the S count RDD. Now let us create a new RDD by name state count M and apply reduce by key transformation and map transformation together and consider tuple one as the city name and tuple two as the number of matches which were considered in that particular city and apply sort by key transformation to find out the city which conducted maximum number of IPL matches. The transformations are successfully applied and the data is being stored into the state count M RDD. Now let's display the data which is present in state count M RDD. Here I'm using take action command in order to take the top 10 results which are stored in state count M RDD. So according to the results, we have Mumbai, which conducted the maximum number of IPL matches, which is 85 since the year 2008 to the year 2017. Now let us create a new RDD by name FIL RDD and use flat map in order to filter out the match data which were conducted in the city Hyderabad 
and store the same data into the file RDD. So the transformation has been successfully applied. Now let us display the data which is present in our FIL RDD, which consists of the matches which were conducted excluding the city Hyderabad. So this is the data which is present in our FIL RDD, which excludes the matches which were played in the city Hyderabad. Now let us create another RDD by name FIL and store the data of the matches which were conducted in the year 2017. We shall use filter transformation for this operation. The transformation has been applied successfully and the data has been stored into the FIL RDD. Now let us display the data which is present there. We shall use collect action command. And now we have the data of all the matches which were played, especially in the year 2017. Similarly, we can find out the matches which were played in the year 2016 and we can save the same data into the new RDD, which is FIL2. Similarly, we can find out the data of the matches which were conducted in the year 2016 and we can store the same data into our new RDD, which is FIL2. I have used filter transformation in order to filter out the data of the matches which were conducted in the year 2016 and I have saved the data into the new RDD, which is FIL2. Now, let us understand the union transformation. We shall apply the union transformation onto the FIL RDD and FIL2 RDD in order to combine both the data present in both the RDDs. Here I'm creating a new RDD by the name Union RDD and I'm applying Union Transformation on the two RDDs that we created before. The first one is FIL RDD, which consists of the data of the matches played in the year 2017. And the second one is FIL2, which consists the data of the matches which were played in the year 2016. Here, I'll be clubbing both the RDDs together and I'll be saving the data into the new RDD, which is Union RDD. Now, let us display the data which is present in our new RDD, which is Union RDD. I'm using collect action command in order to display the data. So here, we have the data of the matches which were played in the years 2016 and 2017. And now, let's continue with our operations and find out the player with maximum number of Man of the Match awards. For this operation, I'm applying map transformation and splitting out the column number 13, which consists of the data of the players who won the Man of the Match awards for that particular match. So the transformation has been successfully applied and the column number 13 has been successfully split and the data has been stored into the Man of the Match RDD. Now we are creating a new RDD by the name Man of the Match Count. We are applying map transformations onto our previous RDD and we are counting the number of awards won by each and every particular player. Now we shall create a new RDD by the name Man of the Match and we are applying Reduce by Key transformation onto the previous RDD which is Man of the Match count and again we are applying Map Transformation and considering Tuple 1 as the name of the player and Tuple 2 as the number of matches he played and won the Man of the Match awards. Let us use take action command in order to print the data which is stored in our new RTD, which is man of the match. So according to the result, we have AB de Villiers who won the maximum number of man of the matches, which is 15. So these were the few operations that were performed on RDDs. Now let us move on to our Pokemon use case so that we can understand RDDs in a much better way. So the steps to be performed in Pokemon use case are loading the Pokemon data.csv file from an external storage into an RDD, removing the schema from the Pokemon data.csv file, and finding out the total number of water type Pokemons, finding the total number of fire type Pokemons. I know it's getting interesting, so let me explain you each and every step practically. So here, I'm creating a new RDD by name Pokemon data RDD1, and I'm loading my CSV file from an external storage, that is my HDFS as a text file, so the Pokemon data.csv file has been successfully loaded into our new RDD. So let us display the data which is present in our Pokemon data RDD1. I'm using collect action command for this. So here we have 721 rows of data of all the types of Pokemons we have. So now let us display the schema of the data we have. I have used the action command first in order to display the first line of our CSV file which happens to be the schema of a CSV file. So we have index of the Pokemon, name of the Pokemon, its type, total points, HP, attack points, defense points, special attack, special defense, speed, generation, and we can also find if a particular Pokemon is legendary or not. 
Here I'm creating a new RTD which is no header and I'm using filter operation in order to remove the schema of our Pokemon data.csv file. The schema of Pokemon data.csv file is been removed because the Spark considers the schema as a data to be processed. So for this reason we remove the schema. Now let's display the data which is present in our no header RDD. I'm using action command collect in order to display the data which is present in no header RDD. So this is the data which is stored in a no header RDD without the schema. So now let us find out the number of partitions into which our no header RDD is been split into. So I am using partitions transformation in order to find out the number of partitions the data was split into. According to the result, the no header RDD is been split into two partitions. I am here creating a new RDD by name water RDD and I am using filter transformation in order to find out water type Pokemons in our Pokemon data.csv file. I am using action command collect in order to print the data which is present in water RDD. So these are the total number of water type Pokemons that we have in our Pokemon data.csv. Similarly, let's find out the fire type Pokemons. I am creating a new RDD by the name fire RDD and applying filter operation in order to find out the fire type Pokemons present in our CSV file. I am using collect action command in order to print the data which is present in fire RDD. So these are the fire type Pokemons which are present in our Pokemon data.csv file. Now let us count the total number of water type Pokemons which are present in our Pokemon data.csv file. I am using count action for this and we have 112 water type Pokemons present in our Pokemon data.csv file. Similarly, let's find out the total number of fire type Pokemons we have. I am using count action command for the same. So we have a total 52 number of fire type Pokemons in our Pokemon data.csv file. Let's continue with our further operations where we'll find out a highest defense strength of a Pokemon. I'm creating a new RDD by the name defense list and I'm applying map transformation and spreading out the column number six in order to extract the defense points of all the Pokemons present in our Pokemon data.csv file. So the data has been stored successfully into our new RDD which is defense list. Now I'm using max action command in order to print out the maximum defense strength out of all the Pokemons. So we have 230 points as the maximum defense strength amongst all the Pokemons. So in our further operations, let's find out the Pokemons which come under the category of having highest defense strength, which is 230 points. In order to find out the name of the Pokemon with highest defense strength, I'm creating a new RDD with the name defense with Pokemon name and I'm applying map transformation onto the previous RDD, which is no header and I'm splitting out column number six, which happens to be the defense strength in order to extract the data from that particular row, which has the defense strength as 230 points. Now I'm creating a new RDD again with the name maximum defense Pokemon and I'm applying group by key transformation in order to display the Pokemon which have the maximum defense points that is 230 points. So according to the result, we have Steelix, Steelix Mega, Shuckle, Agrigon and Agrigon Mega as the Pokemons with highest defense strength, which is 230 points. Now we shall find out the Pokemon which is having least defense strength. So before we find out the Pokemon with least defense strength, let us find out the least defense points which are present in the defense list. So in order to find out the Pokemon with least defense strength, I have created a new RDD by name minimum defense Pokemon and I have applied distinct and sort by transformations onto the defense list RDD in order to extract the least defense points present in the defense list and I have used take action command in order to display the data which is present in minimum defense Pokemon RDD. So according to the results, we have five points as the least defense strength of a particular Pokemon. Now let us find out the name of the Pokemon which comes under the category of having five points as defense strength. Now let us create a new RDD which is defense Pokemon name two and apply map transformation and split the column number six and store the data into our new RDD which is defense with Pokemon name 2. The transformation has been successfully applied and the data is now stored into the new RDD, which is defense with Pokemon name 2. The data has been successfully loaded now. Let us apply the further operations. Here I am creating another RDD with name minimum defense Pokemon and I'm applying group by key transformation 
in order to extract the data from the row which has the defense points as 5.0. The data has been successfully loaded now and let us display the data which is present in minimum defense Pokemon RDD. Now according to the results we have two number of Pokemons which come under the category of having five points as their defense strength. The Pokemons Chassini and Happiny are the two Pokemons which are having the least defense strength. The world of information technology and big data processing started to see multiple potentialities from Spark coming into action. One such pinnacle in Spark's technological advancements is the data frame. And today we shall understand the technicalities of data frames in Spark. A data frame in Spark is all about performance. It is a powerful, multifunctional, and an integrated data structure where the programmer can work with different libraries and perform numerous functionalities without breaking a sweat to understand APIs and libraries involved in the process. Without wasting any time, let us understand our topic for today's discussion. I'll line up the docket for understanding the data frames in Spark as below. We shall begin with what are data frames. Here, we will learn what exactly a data frame is, how does it look like, and what are its functionalities. Then, we shall see why do we need data frames. Here, we shall understand the requirements which led us to the invention of data frames. Later, I'll walk you through the important features of data frames. Then, we shall look into the sources from which the data frames in Spark get their data from. Once the theory part is finished, I'll get us involved into the practical part where the creation of a data frame happens to be our first step. Next, we shall work with an interesting example which is related to football. And finally, to understand the data frames in Spark in a much better way, we shall work with the most trending topic as our use case, which is none other than the Game of Thrones. So, let's get started. What is a data frame? In simple terms, a data frame can be considered as a distributed collection of data. The data is organized under named columns which provide us the operations to filter, group, process, and aggregate the available data. Data frames can also be used with Spark SQL and we can construct data frames from structured data files, RDDs, or from an external storage like HDFS, Hive, Cassandra, HBase, and many more. With this, we shall look into a more simplified example which will give us a basic description of a data frame. So we shall deal with an employee database where we have entities and their data types. So the name of the employee is our first entity and its respective data type is string data type. Similarly, employee ID has data type of string, employee phone number which is integer data type and employee address happens to be string data type and finally, the employee salary is float data type. All this data is stored into an external storage which may be HDFS, Hive or Cassandra using the data frame API with their respective schema which consists of the name of the entity along with its data type. Now that we have understood what exactly a data frame is, let us quickly move on to our next stage where we shall understand the requirement for a data frame. It provides us multiple programming language supportability. It has the capacity to work with multiple data sources. It can process both structured and unstructured data. And finally, it is well versed with slicing and dicing the data. So the first one is the supportability for multiple programming languages. The IT industries required a powerful and an integrated data structure which could support multiple programming languages and at the same time without the requirement of additional API. Data frame was the one stop solution which supported multiple languages along with a single API. The most popular languages that a data frame could support are R, Python, Scala, Java and many more. The next requirement was to support the multiple data sources. We all know that in a real time approach to data processing will never end up at a single data source. Data frame is one such data structure which has the capability to support and process data from a variety of data sources. Hadoop, Cassandra, JSON files, HBase, CSV files are the examples to name a few. The next requirement was to process structured and unstructured data. The big data environment was designed to store huge amount of data regardless of which type exactly it is. Now, Spark's data frame is designed in such a way that it can store a huge collection of both structured and unstructured data in a tabular format along with its schema. The next requirement was slicing and dicing data. Now, the humongous amount of data stored in Spark's data frame can be sliced and diced using the operations like filter, select, group by, order by, and many more. These operations are applied upon the data which are stored in form of rows and columns in a data frame. These were the few crucial requirements which led to the invention of data frames. 
Now let us get into the important features of data frames which bring it an edge over the other alternatives. Immutability, lazy evaluation, fault tolerance and distributed memory storage. Let us discuss about each and every feature in detail. So the first one is immutability. Similar to the resilient distributed data sets, the data frames in Spark are also immutable. The term immutable depicts that the data once stored into a data frame will not be altered. The only way to alter the data present in a data frame would be by applying simple transformation operations onto them. So the next feature is lazy evaluation. Lazy evaluation is the key to the remarkable performance offered by Spark. Similar to the RDDs, data frames in Spark will not throw any output onto the screen until and unless an action command is encountered. The next feature is fault tolerance. There is no way that the Spark's data frames can lose their data. They follow the principle of being fault tolerant to the unexpected calamities which tend to destroy the available data. The next feature is distributed storage. Spark's data frame distributes their data amongst multiple locations so that in case of a node failure, the next available node can take its place to continue the data processing. The next stage will be about the multiple data source that the Spark data frame can support. The Spark API can integrate itself with multiple programming languages such as Scala, Java, Python, R, MySQL and many more, making itself capable to handle a variety of data sources such as Hadoop, Hive, HBase, Cassandra, JSON files, CSV files, MySQL and many more. So this was the theory part and now let us move into the practical part where the creation of a data frame happens to be our first step. So before we begin the practical part, let us load the libraries which were required in order to process the data in data frames. So these were the few libraries which we required before we process the data using our data frames. Now that we have loaded all the libraries which we require to process the data using the data frames, let us begin with the creation of our data frame. So we shall create a new data frame with the name employee and load the data of the employees present in an organization. The details of the employees will consist the first name, the last name and their mail ID along with their salary. So the first data frame has been successfully created. Now let us design the schema for this data frame. So the schema for this data frame has been described as shown. The first name is of string data type and similarly the last name is of string data type along with the mail address and finally the salary is integer data type or you can give float data type also. So the schema has been successfully delivered. Now let us create the data frame using create data frame function. Here I'm creating a new data frame by starting a spark context and using the create data frame method and loading the data from employee and employee schema. The data frame is successfully created now. Let's print the data which is existing in the data frame EMPDF. I'm using show method here. So the data which is present in EMPDF has been successfully printed. Now let us move on to the next step. So the next step for our today's discussion is working with an example related to the FIFA data set. So the first step in our FIFA example would be loading the schema for the CSV file we are working with. So the schema has been successfully loaded now. Now let us load the CSV file from our external storage which is HDFS into our data frame which is FIFA DF. The CSV file has been successfully loaded into our new data frame which is FIFA DF. Now let us print the schema of our data frame using the print schema command. So the schema has been successfully displayed here and we have the following credentials of each and every player in our CSV file. Now let's move on to our further operations on our data frame. We shall count the total number of records of the players we have in our CSV file using count command. So we have a total of 18,207 players in our CSV file. Now let us find out the details of the columns on which we are working with. So these were the columns which we are working with which consists the ID of the player, name, age, nationality, potential and many more. Now let us use the column value which has the value of each and every player for a particular team and let us use describe command in order to see the highest value and the least value provided to a player. So we have a count of a total number of 18,207 players and the minimum worth given to a player is zero and the maximum is given as nine million pounds. Now let us use the select command in order to extract the column name and the nationality to find out the name of each and every player along with his nationality. So here we have 
we can display the top 20 rows of each and every player which we have in our CSV file along with his nationality. Similarly, let us find out the players playing for a particular club. So here we have the top 20 players playing for their respective clubs along with their names. For example, Messi playing for Barcelona and Ronaldo for Juventus and etc. Now let's move on to the next stages. Now let us find out the players who are found to be most active in a particular national team or a particular club with age less than 30 years. We shall use filter transformation to apply this operation. So here we have the details of the players whose age is less than 30 years and their club and nationality along with their jersey numbers. So with this we have finished our FIFA example. Now to understand the data frames in a much better way. Let us move on into our use case which is about the most hot topic the Game of Thrones. Similar to our previous example. Let us design the schema of our CSV file first. So this is the schema for our CSV file which consists the data about the Game of Thrones. So this is the schema for our first CSV file. Now let us create the schema for our next CSV file. I have named the schema for our next CSV file as schema 2 and I've defined the data types for each and every entity. The schema has been successfully designed for the second CSV file also. Now let us load our CSV files from our external storage which is our HDFS. So the location of the first CSV file character deaths.csv is our HDFS which is defined as above and the schema has been provided as schema and the header true option is also been provided. We are using spark read function for this and we are loading this data into our new data frame which is Game of Thrones data frame. Similarly, let's load the other CSV file which is battles.csv into another data frame which is Game of Thrones battles data frame. The CSV file has been successfully loaded. Now let us continue with the further operations. Now let us print the schema of our Game of Thrones data frame using print schema command. So here we have the schema which consists of the name alliances death rate book of death and many more. Similarly, let's print the schema of Game of Thrones battles data frame. So this is a schema for our new data frame which is Game of Thrones battle data frame. Now let us continue with the further operations. Now let us display the data frame which we have created using the following command. The data frame has been successfully printed and this is the data which we have in our data frame. Now let's continue with the further operations. We know that there are a multiple number of houses present in the story of Game of Thrones. Now let us find out each and every individual house present in the story. Let us use the following command in order to display each and every house present in the Game of Thrones story. So we have the following houses in the Game of Thrones story. Now let's continue with the further operations. The battles in the Game of Thrones were fought for ages. Let us classify the wars waged with their occurrence according to the years. We shall use select and filter transformation and we shall access the columns of the details of the battle and the year in which they were fought. Let us first find out the battles which were fought in the year 298. The following code consists of filter transformation which will provide the details for which we are looking. So according to the result these were the battles which were fought in the year 298 and we have the details of the attacker kings and the defender kings and the outcome of the attacker along with their commanders and the location where the war was fought. Now let us find out the wars waged in the year 299. So these were the details of the wars which were fought in the year 299 and similarly let us also find out the wars which were waged in the year 300. So these were the wars which were fought in the year 300. Now let's move on to the next operations in our use case. Now let us find out the tactics used in the wars waged and also find out the total number of wars waged by using each type of those tactics. The following code must help us. Here we are using select and group by operations in order to find out each and every type of tactics used in the war. So they have used ambush, seize, raising and pitch type of tactics in wars and most of the times they have used pitch battle type of tactics in wars. Now let us continue with the further operations. The ambush type of battles are the deadliest. Now let us find out the kings who fought the battles using these kind of tactics and also let us find out the outcome of the battles fought. Here the following code will help us extract the data which we need. Here we are using select and where commands and we are selecting the columns year, attacker king, defender king, attacker outcome, battle type, attacker commander, defender commander. Now let us print the details. 
So these were the battles fought using the ambush tactics and these were the attacker kings and the defender kings along with their respective commanders and the wars waged in a particular year. Now let's move on to the next operation. Now let us focus on the houses and extract the deadliest house amongst the rest. The following code will help us to find out the deadliest house and the number of battles they waged. So here we have the details of each and every house and the battles they waged. According to the results, we have Stark and the Lannister houses to be the deadliest among the others. Now let's continue with the rest of the operations. Now let us find out the deadliest king among the others. We shall use the following command in order to find the deadliest king amongst the other kings who fought in the major number of wars. So according to the results, we have Joffrey as the deadliest king who fought a total number of 14 battles. Now let us continue with the further operations. Now let us find out the houses which defended most number of wars waged against them. So the following code must help us find out the details. So according to the results, we have Lannister house to be defending the most number of wars waged against them. Now let us find out the defender king who defended most number of battles which were waged against him. So according to the result, Rob Stark is the king who defended most number of battles which were waged against him. Now let's continue with the further operations. Since Lannister House is my personal favorite, let me find out the details of the characters in Lannister House. This code will describe their name and gender, one for male and zero for female, along with their respective population. So let me find out the male characters in the Lannister House first. So here we have used select and where commands in order to find out the details of the characters present in Lannister House and the data is been stored into DF1 data frame. Let us print the data which is present in our DF1 data frame using show command. So these are the details of the characters present in Lannister House which are male. Now similarly let us find out the female characters present in Lannister House. So these are the characters present in Lannister House who are females. So we have a total number of 69 male characters and 12 number of female characters in the Lannister house. Now let us continue with the next operations. At the end of the day, every episode of Game of Thrones had a noble character. Let us now find out all the noble characters amongst all the houses that we have in our Game of Thrones CSV file. The following code must help us find out the details. So the details of all the characters from all the houses who are considered to be noble are been saved into the new data frame which is DF3. Now let us print the details from the DF3 data frame. So these are the top 20 members from all the houses who are considered to be noble along with their genders. Now let us count the total number of noble characters from the entire Game of Thrones stories. So there are a total of 430 number of noble characters existing in the whole Game of Thrones story. Nonetheless, we have also faced a few commoners whose role in the Game of Thrones is found to be exceptional. We shall now find out the details of all those commoners who were highly dedicated to their roles in each episode. The data of all the commoners is been successfully loaded into the new data frame which is DF4. Now let us print the data which is present in the DF4 using the show command. So these are the top 20 characters identified as commoners amongst all the Game of Thrones stories. Now let us find out the count of total number of common characters. So there are a total of 487 common characters amongst all the stories of Game of Thrones. Let us continue with the further operations now. There were a few roles who were considered to be important and equally noble. Hence they were carried out until the last book. So let us filter out those characters and find out the details of each one of them. The data of all the characters who are considered to be noble and carried out until the last book are being stored into the new data frame which is TF4. Now let us print the data which is existing in the data frame 4. So according to the results, we have two candidates who are considered to be the noble and their character has been carried out until the last book. Amongst all the battles, I found the battles of the last books to be generating more adrenaline in the readers. Let us find out the details of those battles using the following code. So the following code will help us to find out the wars which were fought in the last years of the Game of Thrones. So these are the details of the wars which were fought in the last years of the Game of Thrones and the details of the kings and the details of their commanders and the location where the war was fought. Welcome to this interesting session of Sparks SQL tutorial from Edureka. So in today's session, we are going to learn about how we will be working with Spark SQL. Now, what all you can expect from this course, from this particular session? 
So you can expect that we will be first learning why Spark SQL, what are the libraries which are present in Spark SQL, what are the important features of Spark SQL. We will also be doing some hands-on example and in the end we will see some interesting use case of stock market analysis. Now why Spark SQL? Is it like um, why we are learning it? Why it is really important for us to know about this uh, Spark SQL site? Is it like really hot in market? If yes, then why? We want all those answers from this. So if you are coming from Hadoop background, you must have heard a lot about Apache Hive. Now what happens in Apache Hive? So like in Apache Hive, SQL developers can write their queries in a SQL way and it will be getting converted to your MapReduce and giving you the output. Now we all know that MapReduce is slower in nature and since MapReduce is going to be slower in nature then definitely your overall Hive query is going to be slower in nature. So that was one challenge. So if you have let's say less than 200 GB of data or if you have a smaller set of data this was actually a big challenge that in Hive your performance was not that great. It also do not have any resuming capability. If you're stuck, you cannot start it. Also, Hive cannot even drop your encrypted databases. That was also one of the challenge when you deal with the security side. Now, what Spark SQL have done is, Spark SQL have solved almost all of the problem. So in the last sessions, we have already learned about the Spark way, right? How Spark is faster from MapReduce and all. We have already learned that in our previous few sessions. Now, so in this session, we are going to kind of take a leverage of all that. So definitely, in this case, since Apache Spark is faster because of the in-memory computation, what is in-memory computation? We have already seen it. So in-memory computations is like whenever we are computing anything in memory directly. So because of in-memory computation capability, because Apache Spark was faster, so definitely your Spark SQL is also going to become fast. No. So if I talk about the advantages of Spark SQL over Hive, definitely number one, it is going to be faster in comparison to your Hive. So a Hive query which is let's say uh, taking around 10 minutes, in Spark SQL you can finish that same query in less than one minute. Don't you think it's an awesome capability of Spark SQL? Definitely yes. Right. Now second thing is when if let's say you're writing something in Hive, now you can take an example of let's say a company who is let's say developing Hive queries from last 10 years. Now they were doing it, they were all happy that they were able to process big data, that they were worried about the performance that Hive is not able to give them a that level of processing speed what they are looking for. Now this was a let's say a challenge for that particular company. Now there is a challenge, right? The challenge is they came to know now about Spark SQL. Fine, let's say they came to know about it, but uh, they came to know that we can execute everything in Spark SQL and it is going to be faster as well. Fine, but don't you think that if these companies working from let's say past 10 years in Hive, they must have already written a lot of code in Hive. Now if you ask them to migrate to Spark SQL, is, will it be an easy task? No, right? Definitely it is not going to be an easy task. Why? Because Hive syntax and Spark SQL syntax, though they both tackle the SQL way of writing the things, but at the same time, it is always a very, it, it carries a big difference. So there will be a good difference whenever we talk about the syntax between them. So it will take a very good amount of time for that company to change all of the query mode to the Spark SQL way. Now Spark SQL came up with a smart solution. What they said is, even if you're writing the query with Hive, you can execute that Hive query directly through Spark SQL. Don't you think it's a kind of very important and an awesome facility, right? Because even now, if you're a good Hive developer, you need not worry about that how you will be now migrating to Spark SQL. You can still keep on writing to Hive query and can your query will automatically be getting converted to Spark SQL. Uh, similarly, in Apache Spark, as we have learned in the past sessions, especially through Spark streaming, that Spark streaming is going to make you real-time processing, right? You can also perform your real-time processing using Apache Spark. Now, this sort of facility 
is you can take leverage even in your Spark SQL. So let's say you can do a real-time processing and at the same time you can also perform your SQL query. Now with Hive that was a problem. You cannot do that because when we talk about Hive, now in Hive it's all about, Hadoop is all about batch processing. Batch processing where you keep historical data and then later you process it. So it definitely Hive also follows the same approach. In this case also, Hive is going to just only follow the batch processing one. But when it comes to Apache Spark, it will also be taking care of the real-time processing. So how all these things happens? So your Spark SQL always uses your Metastore services of your Hive to query the data stored and managed by Hive. So in when you were learning about Hive, so we have learned at that time, that in Hive, everything what we do is always stored in the Metastore. So that Metastore was the crucial point, right? Because using that Metastore only, you were able to do everything up. So like when you're doing, let's say, your uh, any sort of query, or when you're creating a table, everything was getting stored in that same Metastore. Now what happens, Spark SQL also use the same Metastore. Now it's whatever Metastore you have created with respect to Hive, same Metastore you can also use it for your Spark SQL. And that is something which is really awesome about this Spark SQL, that you need not create a new Metastore, you need not worry about a new storage space and all. Everything what you have done with respect to your Hive, a same Metastore you can use it. Now you can ask me then how it is faster if they are using same Metastore. Remember the processing part. Why Hive was slower? Because of its processing way. Because it is converting everything to the map produce and thus it was making the processing very very slow. But here in this case since the processing is going to be in memory computation, so in Spark SQL case it is always going to be the faster. Now definitely it just because of the meta store side we are only able to fetch the data and all but at the same time for any other thing of the processing related stuff it is always going to be at the when we talk about the processing stage it is going to be in memory thus it's going to be faster. So let's talk about some success stories of Spark SQL. Let's see some use cases. Twitter sentiment analysis. If you go through our, if you, once, if you remember our Spark streaming session, we have done a Twitter sentiment analysis, right? So there you have seen that we have first initially got the data from Twitter and that too we have got it with the help of Spark streaming. And later what we did, later we just analyzed everything with the help of Spark SQL. So you can see an advantage of Spark SQL. So in Twitter sentiment analysis, where let's say you want to find out about the uh, Donald Trump, Right? You are fetching the data, every tweet related to the Donald Trump and then kind of doing analysis and checking that whether it's a positive tweet, negative tweet, neutral tweet, very negative tweet, very positive tweet. Okay, so we have already seen the same example there in that particular session. So in this session as you are noticing what we are doing, we just want to kind of show that once you are streaming the data in the real time, you can also do a processing using Spark SQL. Thus you are doing all the processing at the real time. Similarly in the stock market analysis, you can use Spark SQL. A lot of queries you can adopt there. In the banking fraud case transactions and all you can use that. So let's say your credit card currently is getting swiped in India and in next 10 minutes if your credit card is getting swiped in let's say in US, definitely that is not possible, right? So let's say you are doing all that processing real time, you are detecting everything with respect to Spark streaming. Then you are let's say applying your Spark SQL to verify that whether uh, it's a user trend or not, right? So all those things you want to match up with Spark SQL, so you can do that. Similarly, in the medical domain, you can use that. Let's talk about some Spark SQL features. So there will be some features related to it. Now, you can use what happens when the SQL got combined with the Spark, we started calling it as Spark SQL. Now, when definitely we are talking about SQL, we are talking about either a structured data or a semi-structured data. Now, SQL queries cannot deal with the unstructured data. So that is definitely one of the things you need to keep in mind. Now, your Spark SQL also support various data formats. You can get the data from Parquet. You must have heard about Parquet that it is a columnar based storage and it is kind of very much a compressed format of the data what you have, but it's not human readable. Similarly, you must have heard about JSON, Avro, where we keep the value as a key value pair, Hive, Cassandra, right? These are NoSQL DBs. So you can get all the data from these sources. Now you can also convert your SQL queries to your uh, RDD way, so you can you can you will be able to perform all the transformation step. So that is one thing you can do. Now, if we talk about performance and scalability, definitely on this red color graph, if you notice, this is related to your Hadoop. You can notice that red color graph is 
much more in comparison to blue color and blue color denotes my performance with respect to Spark SQL. So you can notice that Spark SQL is performing much better in comparison to your Hadoop. So we are on this Y axis, we are taking the running time. On the X axis, we were considering the number of iteration. When we talk about Spark SQL features, now a few more features we have, for example, you can create a connection with simple your JDBC driver or ODBC driver, right? These are simple drivers being present. Now you can uh, create your connection with your Spark SQL using all these drivers. You can also create a user defined function. Means, let's say if any function is not available to you. In that case, you can create your own function. So let's say if a function is available, use that. If it is not available, you can create a UDF, means user defined function, and you can directly execute that user defined function and get your desired result. So this is one example where we have shown that you can convert, let's say if you don't have an uppercase API present in Spark SQL, how you can create a simple UDF for it and can execute it. So if you notice here what we are doing, let's say this is my data. So if you notice in this case, this is data set is my data part, right? So this is I'm generating as a sequence. I'm creating it as a data frame. See this 2DF part here. Now after that, we are creating an upper UDF here. And notice we are converting any value which is coming to my uppercase, right? We are using this two uppercase API to convert it. We are importing this function and then what we did. Now when we came here, we are telling that, okay, this is my UDF. So UDF is upper, why? Because we have created here also as upper. So we are telling that this is my UDF in the first step. And then when we are using it, let's say with our data sets, what we are doing? So data sets we are passing here that, okay, whatever we are doing, convert it to my upper upper UDF, right? So convert it to my uppercase. So see, we are telling you we have created our upper UDF. That is what we are passing inside this text value. So now it is just getting converted and giving you all the output in your uppercase. Way. So you can notice that this this is your uh, last value and this is your uppercase value, right? So this got converted to my uppercase in this particular way. Now, if you notice here also, same step. So we are, how to we can register all of our UDF. This is what being shown here. So now this is how you can do that, spark.udf.register. So using this API, you can just register your data frames. Now, similarly, if you want to get the output after that, you can get it uh, using this following way. So you can use this show API to get the output for this. Spark SQL architecture, let's see that. So what is Spark SQL architecture? Now Spark SQL architecture, if we talk about, so what happens, so let's say getting the data with using your various formats, right? So let's say you can get it from your CSV, you can get it from your JSON format, you can also get it from your JDBC format. Now there will be a data source API, so using data source API, you can fetch the data. After fetching the data, you will be converting to a data frame way. So what is data frame? So in the last one, we have learned that, that when we were creating everything is already what we were doing. So let's say this was my uh, cluster, right? So let's say this is machine, this is another machine, this is another machine, right? So let's say these are all my clusters. So what we were doing in this case, now when we were creating all these things as our cluster, what was happening here? We were passing all of our values here, right? So let's say we were keeping all the data, let's say block B1 was there. So we were passing all the values and were creating it in the form of, in the memory, and we were calling that as RDD. Now, when we were working in SQL, we have to store the data, which is a tabular data. Right? So let's say there is a table which is let's say having column details, let's say name, age, let's say here I have some value, here I have some value, here I have some value, here I have some value. Right? So let's say I have some value of this table format. Now if I have to keep this data into my cluster, what you need to do? So you will be keeping first of all into the memory. So you will be having let's say name, age, this column details first of all here. And after that you will be having some details of this data set. So let's say this much data you have. Some part, the similar kind of table with some other values will be here also. But here also you are going to have column details. You will be having name, age, some more data here. Now, if you notice, this is sounding similar to RDD, but this is not exactly like RDD, right? Because here we are not only keeping just the data, but we are also storing something like a column in storage, right? We are also keeping the column in all of our data nodes, or we can call it as a worker node, right? So we are also keeping the column details along with the row details. So this thing is called as data frames.
Okay, so that is called your data frame. So that is what we are going to do. So we are going to convert it to the data frame API. Then using the data frame DSLs or by using Spark SQL or HQL, uh, you will be processing the results and giving the output. We will learn about all these things in detail. So let's see this Spark SQL libraries. Now there are multiple APIs available to us. Like we have data source API, we have data frame API, we have interpreter and optimizer and SQL service. We will explore all this in detail now. So let's talk about data source API. If we talk about data source API, what happens here? In data source API, it is used to read and store the structured and unstructured data into your Spark SQL. So as you can notice, in Spark SQL, we can fetch the data using multiple sources, right? You can get it from Hive, Pick, Cassandra, CSV, Apache Base, DBase, Oracle DB, so many formats are available, right? So this API is going to help you to get all the data, to read all the data, store it wherever you want to use it. Now after that, your data frame API is going to help you to convert that into a named column and row. Remember I just explained you that uh, how you store the data and that because here you're not keeping it like a RDD. You're also keeping the named column as well as row details. That is the difference coming up here. So that is what it is converting in this case. So you are using data frame API to convert it into your named column and rows, right? So that is what you will be doing. So add, it also follows the same properties like your RDDs, like your RDDs were lazily evaluated and all, same properties will also follow up here, okay? Now, interpreter and optimizer. In interpreter and optimizer step, what we are going to do. So let's say if we have this data frame API, so we are going to first create this named column. Then after that, we will be now creating an RDD. We will be applying our transformation step. We will be doing our action step, right, to output the value. So all those things where it is happens, it is happening in the interpreter and optimizer step. So this is all happening in the interpreter and optimizer step. So this is what all the features you have. Now, let's talk about SQL service. Now in SQL service, what happens? It is going to again help you. So it is just doing all the transformation action in the last step. After that, using Spark SQL service, you will be getting your Spark SQL outputs. So now in this case, whatever processing you have done, right, in terms of transformations and all of that. So you can say that your Spark uh, SQL service is an entry point for working along the structured data in your Apache Spark, okay? So it is going to kind of help you to fetch the results from your optimized data or maybe whatever you have interpreted before. So that is what it's doing. So this kind of completes this whole uh, diagram. Now, let's see that how we can perform our queries using Spark SQL. Now, if we talk about Spark SQL queries, so first of all, we can go to Spark Shell itself and can execute everything. You can also execute your program using Spark, uh, your Eclipse also directly. From there also, you can do that. So if you are, let's say, log in with your Spark Shell session, so what you can do, so let's say you have first, you need to import this because in 2.x, you must have heard that there is something called a Spark session, which came up. So that is what we are doing. So in our last sessions, we have already learned about all these things up. Now, Spark session is something what we are importing. After that, we are creating a session Spark using a builder function. Look at this. So this builder API, you, we are using this builder API, then we are using the app name, we are providing our configuration, and then we are telling that we are going to create our values here, right? So we are, that's why we are giving get or create. Then we are importing all these things, right? Once we import it, after that we can say that, okay, we will want to read this JSON file, so this employee.json we want to read up here, and in the end we want to output this value, right? So this DF becomes my data flip containing the value of my employee.json. So this JSON value will get converted to my data frame bit. Now in the end, we are just outputting the result. Now if you notice here what we are doing, so here we are first of all importing our Spark session. Same story, we are just executing it. Then we are building our things. We are telling that we are going to create that. Again, we are importing it. Then we are reading uh, our JSON file by using read.json API. We are reading our employee.json, okay, which is present in this particular directory, and we are outputting. So can you can see that JSON format will be the key value format. But when I'm doing this df.show, it is just showing up all my values here. Now let's see how we can create our data set. Now when we talk about data set, you can notice what we're doing. Now we have understood all this, so let's see the, how we can create the data set. Now first of all, 
in data set what we do so in data set we can create the class you can see we are creating a case class employee right now in case class what we are doing we are then just creating a sequence inputting the value andrew age like name and the age column then we are displaying our output all this data set right now we are creating a primitive data set also to demonstrate mapping of this data frames to your data sets right so you can notice that we are using 2ds instead of 2df we are using 2ds in this case now you may ask me what's the difference with respect to data frame right so with respect to data frame in data frame what we were doing we were create again the data frame and data set both exactly looks same it will also be having the name column and rows and everything up it is introduced lately in 1.6 versions and later and what is it provides it it provides some encoder mechanism using which you can get when you are let's say reading the weight data back let's say you are deserializing and not doing that step right it is going to be faster so the performance wise data set is better that's the reason it is introduced later nowadays our people are moving from data frame to data set sites okay so now we are just outputting in the end see the same thing in the output part so we are creating employee class then we are putting the value inside it creating a data set we are looking at the values right so these are the steps we have just seen understood that now how we can read our file so we want to read the file so we will use read.json as employee employee was what remember case class which we have created last time this was the class we have created here, case class employee. So we are telling that we are creating like this. Then we are just outputting this value. We just using show. You can see this way. We can see this output also. Now, let's see how we can add the schema to RDD. Now, in order to add the schema to RDD, what we are going to do? So, in this case also, you can look at we are importing all the values. Right? We are importing all the libraries, whatever are required. Then after that, we are using this Spark context text file reading the data or splitting it with respect to comma then mapping the attributes to your employer case class what we have done and putting converting this values to integer so in then we are converting to 2df right after that we are going to create a temporary view or table so let's create this temporary view employee then we are going to use spark.sql and passing up our sql query can you notice that we are now passing the value and we are assessing this employee right we are assessing this employee here now what is this employee? This employee was our temporary view which we have created. Because the challenge in Spark SQL is whenever you want to execute any SQL query, you cannot say select a strict from a data frame. You cannot do that. This is not even supported. So you cannot do select a strict from your data frame. So instead of that, what we need to do is we need to create a temporary table or a temporary view. So you can notice here we are using this create or replace temp view. Why replace? Because if it is already existing, override on top of it. So now we are creating a temporary table which will be exactly similar to my this data frame. Now you can just directly execute all the query on your temporary view or temporary table. So you can notice here instead of using employee DF, which was our data frame I'm using here temporary view okay then in the end we're just mapping the names and all right and we are outputting the values that's it same thing this is just an execution part of it right so we are just showing all the steps here you can see in the end we are outputting all this value now how we can add this schema to RDD let's see this transformation step now in this case you can notice that we can map this youngster right so we are converting this map name into the string for the transformation part right so we are checking all this value that okay this is uh, the string type name we are just showing up this value right now what we are you doing we are using this map encoder from the implicit class which is available to us to map the name and age part Okay, so this is what we are going to do because remember in the employee case class we have the name and the age column that we want to map now. Now in this case we are mapping the names to the ages. So you can notice that we are doing for ages of our younger DF data frame that what we have created earlier and the result is an array. So the result what you are going to get will be an array with the name mapped to your respective ages. You can see this output here. So you can see that this is getting mapped, right? So we are getting seeing this output like name is John, age is 28. That is what we are talking about. So here in this case, you can notice that it was representing like this. In this case, the output is coming out in this particular format. Now, let's talk about how we can add the schema, how we can read the file, we can add our schema and all. So we will be first of all importing the type class into your Spark shell. So this is what we are done by using import statement. 
Then we are going to import the row class into this partial. So row will be used in mapping RDD schema, right? So you can notice we are importing this also. Then we are creating an RDD called as employee RDD. So in case, this case, you can notice that as employee RDD we are creating, and we are creating this with the help of this text file. So once we have created this, we are going to define our schema. So this is the schema approach. Okay. So in this case, we are going to define it like name, then space, then age. Okay. Because they, these were the two I have in my data also. In this employee.txt, if you look at, these are the two data which we have, name and age. Now what we can do? Once we have done that, then we can split it with respect to space. We can say that our mapping value and we are passing it all this value inside our struct field. Okay, so we are defining our now fields RDD. That is what we are doing here. See this uh, fields RDD, which is going to now output after mapping the employee RDD. Okay, so that is what we are doing. So we want to just uh, do this into my schema string. Then in the end, we will be obtaining this field. If you notice this field, what we have created here, we are obtaining this into a schema. So we are passing this into a struct type and it is getting converted to be your schema. Way. So that is what we will do. You can see all this execution, same steps we are just executing in this terminal. Now, let's see how we are going to transform the results. Now, whatever we have done, right? So now we have already created an RDD called row RDD. So let's create that row RDD we are going to create. And uh, we want to transform the employee RDD using the map function into row RDD. So let's do that. Okay, so in this case, what we are doing? So look at this employee RDD. We are splitting it with respect to comma. And after that, we are telling, see, remember we have name and then age like this. So that's what we're telling. We're telling that attribute zero, comma, attributes one. And why we're trimming it? Just in order to ensure if there is no spaces and all which are there. So those things we don't want to unnecessarily keep up. So that's the reason we are defining this trim statement. Now, after that, after we, once we are done with this, we are going to define a data frame employee df and we are going to store that RDD schema into it. So now if you notice this row RDD which we have defined here and schema which we have defined in the last case, right? Now if you go back and notice here, schema we have created here, right? With respect to my fields. So that schema and this value what we have just created here, row RDD, we are going to pass it and say that we are going to create a data frame. So this will help us in creating the data frame. Now we can create our temporary view on the base of employee DF. Let's create an employee uh, temporary view. And then what we can do, we can execute any SQL queries on top of it. So as you can see spark.sql, we can create all the SQL queries and can directly execute that. Now what we can do, if we want to output the values, we can quickly do that. Now we want to, let's say, display the name. So we can say, okay, attribute zero contains the name. We can use this show command. So this is how we will be performing the operation in the schema way. Now, so this is the same output way. Means we are just executing this whole thing up. You can notice here also, we are just saying attribute zero dot show. It is representing all me my output. Now, let's talk about JSON data. Now, when we talk about JSON data, let's talk about how we can load our files and work on this. So in this case, we will be first, let's say, importing our libraries. Once we are done with that, now after that, we can just say that read.json. We are just bringing up our employee.json here. See, this is the execution of this part. Now, similarly, we can also write back in the parquet or we can also read the value from parquet. You can notice this if we want to write, let's say, this uh, value employee df data frame to my parquet way. So I can say write dot write dot parquet. So this will be created, employee.parquet will be created, and here all the values will be converted to employee.parquet. Only thing is the data, if you go and see in this particular directory, this will be a directory which will be getting created. So in this data, you will notice that you will not be able to read the data. So in that case, because it's not human readable. So that's the reason you will not be able to do that. So let's say you want to read it now. So you can again bring it back by using read.parquet. You are reading this employee parquet which you have just created. Then you are creating a temporary view or temporary table. And then by using spark.sql, you can execute on your temporary table. Now in this way, you can read your parquet file data. And in then we are just displaying the result. See the similar output of this, okay? This is how we can execute all these things up. Now once we have done all this, let's see how we can create our data frames. So let's create this file path. So let's say we have created this file employee.json. After that, we can create a data frame from our JSON path, right? So we are creating this by using read.json. Then we can print the schema. What does this do? This is going to print the schema of my employee data frame. 
okay so we are going to use this print schema to print up all the values then we can create a temporary view of this data frame so we are create doing that see create or replace temp view we are creating that which we have seen it last time also now after that we can execute our sql query so let's say we are executing our sql query from employee where age is between 18 and 30 right so this kind of sql query let's say we want to do we can get that and in the end we can see the output also let's see this execution so you can see that all the employees whose age are let's say between 18 and 30 that is showing up in the output now let's see this RDD operation way. Now what you can do? So we are going to create this RDD other employee RDD. Now which is going to store the content of employee George and New Delhi Delhi. So see this part. So here we are creating this by using make RDD and we have just this is going to store the content containing George from New Delhi. Right? You can see this. So New Delhi is my city name. State is Delhi. So that is what we are passing inside it. Now what we are doing? We are assigning the content of this other employee RDD into my other employee. So we are using this park.read.json and we are reading up the value. And in the end, we are using this show API. You can notice this output coming up. Now let's see with the hive table. So with the hive table, if you want to read that, so let's do it with the case class and spark sessions. So first of all, we are going to import our row class and we are going to use spark session into the spark session. So let's do that. So we are importing this row, this spark session and all. After that, we are going to create a class record containing this key, which is of integer data type and a value, which is of string type. Then we are going to set our location of the warehouse location, okay, to the Spark warehouse. So that is what we are doing. Now we are going to build a Spark session Spark to demonstrate the Hive example in Spark SQL. Look at this now. So we are creating Spark session dot builder. Again, we are passing the uh, any app name to it. We are passing the configuration to it. And then we are saying that we want to enable the Hive support. Now, once we have done that, we are importing this uh, Spark SQL libraries and all. And then you can notice that we can use SQL. So we can create now a table SRC. So you can see create table if not exist SRC with column to store the data as a key comma value pair. So that is what we are doing here. Now you can see all this execution of the same step. Now let's see the SQL operation happening here. Now in this case, what we can do, we can now load the data from this example, uh, which is present now. So you see this, this kvm.txt file, which is available to us. And we want to store it into the table SRC, which we have just created. And now if you want to just view the, all this output, we can say SQL, select a stack from SRC, and it is going to show up all the values. You can see this output, okay? So this is the way you can show up the values. Now similarly, we can perform the count operation. Okay, so we can say select count strict from SRC to select the number of keys in the SRC tables. And now, now select all the records, right? So we can say that key select key comma value. So you can see that we can perform all of our hive operations here on this, right? Similarly, we can create a data set string DS from Spark DF. So you can see this also by using SQL DF what we already have. We can just say map and then provide the case class and can map this key comma value pair. And then in the end, we can show up all this value. See this execution of this. In the end, you can notice this output, which we wanted. Now let's see the result part. Now we can create our data frame here, right? So we can create our data frame records DF and store all the results which contains the value between 1 to 100. So we are storing all the values between 1 to 100 here. Then we are creating our temporary view, okay, for the records. That's what we are doing. So for records DF, we are creating a temporary view so that we can have our all of our SQL queries. Now we can execute all the values. So you can also notice we are doing join operation here. Right? So we can display the content of join between the records and this uh, SRC table. We can do a join on this part. So we can also perform all the join operations and get the output. Now let's see our use case for it. If we talk about use case, we are going to analyze our stock market with the help of Spark SQL. So let's understand the problem statement first. So now in our problem statement, so what we want to do, so we want to, so definitely everybody must be aware of this stock market. Like in stock market, you can, a lot of activities happen. You want to know, analyze it in order to make some profit out of it and all those stuff, right? So now let's say a company have collected a lot of data for different 10 companies and they want to do some computation. Let's say they want to compute the average closing price. They want to list the companies with the highest closing prices. They want to compute the average closing price per month. They want to list the number of big price rises and fall and compute some statistical correlation. So these things we are going to do with the help of our Spark SQL statement. So this is our requirement. We want to process the huge data. 
we want to handle the input from the multiple sources we want to process the data in real time and it should be easy to use it should not be very complicated so all this requirement will be handled by my spark sql right so that's the reason we are going to use the spark uh, sql so as i just said that we are going to use 10 companies so we are going to kind of use these 10 companies and on those 10 companies we are going to see that we are going to perform our analysis on top of it so we will be using the stock data from yahoo finance for all these following stocks so for NN, AA, Bix, Access, so all these companies we have on, on which we are going to perform. So this is how my data will look like, which will be having date, opening, high rate, low rate, closing, volume, adjusted, close, all this data will be present here. Now, so let's see how we can implement a stock analysis using Spark SQL. So what we have to do for that, so this is how my data flow diagram will sound like. So we are going to initially have the huge amount of real-time stock data that we are going to process it with Spark SQL, so going to convert it into a named column way. Then we are going to create an RDD for functional programming, so let's do that. Then we are going to use our Spark SQL, which will calculate the average closing price per year, calculating the company with highest closing per year. Then by Spark SQL queries, we will be getting our outputs, okay? So that is what we are going to do. So all the queries what we are getting generated, so it's not only this, we are also going to compute few other queries what we have, so all those queries we are going to execute here. Now this is how the flow will look like. So we are going to initially have this data what I have just shown you up. Now what you are going to do, you are going to create a data frame. You are going to then create a join close RDD. We will see what we are going to do here. Then we are going to calculate the average closing price per year. We are going to hit our Spark SQL query and get the result in the table. So this is how my execution will look like. So what we are going to do in this case, first of all, we are going to initialize the Spark SQL in the Spark Shell. We are going to import all the required libraries. Then we are going to start our Spark session after importing all the required library. We are going to create our case class, whatever is required here in the case class you can notice here. Then we are going to define our parse stock schema. So because we have already learned how to create a schema, so we are going to create this parse stock schema by creating this way. But then we are going to define our parse RDD. So in parse RDD if you notice, so here we are creating this parse RDD, right? So we are going to create all of that by using this RDD first. We are going to remove the header files also from it. Then we are going to read our CSV file into stocks AA on DF data frame. So we are going to read this sc.txt file. You can see we are reading this file and we are going to convert it into a data frame. So we are parsing it as an RDD. Once we are done, then if we want to print the output, we can do it with the help of show API. Once we are done with this, now we want to, let's say, display the average of adjacent closing price for NN for every month. So we can do all of that also by using select query, right? So we can say uh, this data frame dot select and pass whatever parameters are required to get the average now. So you can notice here inside this, we are creating the alias of the things as well. So for this DT, we are creating alias here, right? So we are creating the alias for it, you know? now and then we are showing the output also. So here what we are going to do, now we will be checking that the closing price for Microsoft, so let's say they are going up by 2 or with greater than 2 or wherever it is going by greater than 2 and 1, we want to get the output and display the result. So you can notice that wherever it is going to be greater than 2, we are getting the value. So we are hitting the SQL query to do that, so we are hitting the SQL query now on this, you can notice the SQL query which we are hitting on the stocks MSFT, right? This is the, we have data frame we have created. Now on this we are doing that and we are putting our query that where my condition this to be true, means where my closing price and my opening price because let's say at the closing price uh, the stock price was let's say 100 US dollars and at the time in the morning when it opened with the let's say 98 US dollar so wherever it is going to be having a difference of 2 or greater than 2 that only output we want to get so that is what we are doing here now once we are done then after that what we are going to do now we are going to use the join operation so what we are going to do, so we will be joining the NN and XFB stocks in order to compare the closing price because we want to compare the prices, so we will be doing that. So first of all, we are going to create a union of all these stocks and then display this joint close. So look at this, what we are going to do, we are going to use the Spark SQL and if you notice this closely, what we are doing in this case, so now in the Spark SQL, we are hitting this query SQL and all those stuff, then we are saying from this and here we are using this join operation, right? See this join operation. So this we are joining it on 
and then in the end we are outputting it so here you can see you can do a comparison of all this close price for all these stocks you can also include now for more companies right now we have just shown you an example with two companies but you can do it for more companies as well now in this case if you notice what we're doing we're writing this in the parquet file format and saving into this particular location so we are creating this joint stock dot parquet so we are storing it as a parquet file format and here if you want to read it we can read that and show the output but whatever file you have saved it as a parquet file definitely you will not be able to read that up because that file is going to be the parquet way and parquet way are the files which you can never read you will not be able to read them up now you will be seeing this average closing price per year i'm going to show you all these things running also so i'm just right now explaining you how things will be run, uh, doing up here so i will be showing you all these things in execution as well now in this case if you notice what we are doing Again, we are creating our data frame here. Again, we are executing our query. Whatever table we have, we are executing on top of it. So in this case, because we want to find the average closing per year. So what we are doing in this case, so we are going to create a new table containing the average closing price of, let's say, Annan, Abax, and Fast. And then we are going to display all this new table. So we are, in the end, we are going to register this table also as a temporary table so that we can execute our SQL queries on top of it. So in this case, you can notice that we are creating this new table. And in this new table, we are putting our SQL query, right? That SQL query is going to contains the average closing price. So the SQL query is finding out the uh, average closing price of Annan and all these companies. Then whatever we have, now we are going to apply our transformation step. Now transformation of this new table which we have created with the year and the corresponding three company data what we have created into the company or table. So if you can notice that we are creating this company or table. And here, first of all, we are going to create a transform table company or and going to display the output. So you can notice that we are hitting the SQL query and in the end we are printing this output. Similarly, if you want to, let's say, compute the best of average close, we can do that. So in this case, again, the same way. Now, if once you have learned the basic stuff, you can notice that everything is following a similar approach. Now, in this case, also, we want to find out, let's say, the best of the average closing. So we are creating this best company here. Now, it should contain the best average closing price of Annan, Abex, and Fast. So we can just get this greatest and all that, right? So we're creating that. Then after that, we are going to display this output and we will be again registering it as a temporary table. Now, once we have done that, then we can hit our queries now. So we want to check, let's say, best performing company per year. So what we have to do for that? So we are creating a final table in which we are going to compute all the things. We are going to perform the join and all. So all those SQL query we are going to perform here in order to compute that which company is uh, doing the best. And then we are going to display the output. So this is what the output is being showing up here. We are again storing as a temporary view. And here again, the same story of correlation, what we're going to do here. So now we will be using our statistics libraries to find the correlation between Annan and Abex companies closing price. So that is what we are going to do now. So correlation in finance and the investment industries is a statistics that measures the degree to which two securities move in relation to each other. So the closer the correlation is to be one, this is going to be a better one. So it is always like, how two variables are correlated with each other. Let's say your age is highly correlated to your salary, what you're earning, right? When you are young, you usually earn less. And when you are more age, definitely you will be earning more because you will be more mature. Similar way, I can say that your salary is also dependent on your education qualification and also on the premium institute from where you have done your education. Let's say if you are from IIT or IM, definitely your salary will be higher from any other campuses, right? Means it's a probability with what I'm telling you. So let's say if I have to correlate now in this case, the education and the salary part, I can easily create a correlation, right? So that is what the correlation goes. So we are going to do all that with respect to our stock analysis now. Now what we are doing in this case, so again you can notice we are creating this series one where we are hitting the select query. Now we are mapping all this uh, and in close price, we are converting to RDD. Similar way for series two also we are doing that, right? So this is we are doing for ABEX. So earlier we have done it for and in close. And then in the end we are using the statistics.core to create a correlation between them. So you can notice, this is how we can execute everything. Now let's go to our VM and see everything in our execution. A uh, question from Atul. So this VM, how we will be getting? You will be getting all this VM from Edureka. So you need not worry about all that part. 
that how I will be getting all this PM, you know. So uh, once you enroll for the courses and also you will be getting all this PM from the Eureka side. So even if I'm working on Mac operating system, my VM will work, yes every operating system it will be supported. So no trouble, you can just use any sort of VM and all means uh, any operating system to do that. So what Eureka do is they just don't want you to be troubled in uh, any sort of stuff here. So what they do is they kind of ensure that uh, whatever is required for your practicals, they take care of it. That's the reason they have created their own VM which is also going to be a lower size in comparison to Cloudera Hortonworks VM. And this is going to definitely be more helpful for you. So all these things will be provided to you. Question from Nitin, so all this project I am going to learn from the sessions, yes, so once you enroll for, so right now whatever we have seen definitely we have just got an upper level of uh, view of this, how the session looks like for Apache Spark, but when we actually teach all these things in the course, it's usually are much more in the detailed format. So in detail format, we kind of keep on showing you each step in detail that how the things are working, even including the project. So you will be also learning with the help of project on each different topic. So that is the way we kind of go for it. Now if I am stuck in any other project, then who will be helping me? So there will be a support team 24 by 7. If you are stuck at any moment, you need to just give a call Ankit and a call or an email, there is a support ticket and immediately the technical team will be helping you across. So the support team is 24 by 7, they, they are all technical people and they will be assisting you across on all that. Even the trainers will be assisting you for any of the technical query. Uh, great, awesome. Thank you. Now, so if you notice, this is my data. We have we were executing all the things on this data. Now what we want to do, if you notice, this is the same code which I have just shown you earlier also. Now let us just execute this code. So in order to execute this, what we can do, we can connect to my Spark shell. So let's get connected to Spark shell. So once we'll be connected to Spark shell, we will go step by step. So first we will be importing our package. This takes some time, let it uh, just get connected. Once this is connected, now you can notice that I'm just importing all the uh, all the important libraries. We have already learned about that. After that, you will be initializing your Spark session. So let's do that. Again, the same steps what we have done before. Once we will be done, we will be creating a stock class. We could have also directly executed from Eclipse also. This is just I want to show you step by step whatever we have learned. So now you can see for company one and then if you want to do some computation, we want to even see the values and all, right? So that's what we are doing here. So we are just getting the files, creating an RDD and all. So let's execute this. Similarly for your ABEX, similarly for your FAST, for all this. So I'm just copying all these things together because there are a lot of companies for which we have to do all this step. So let's bring it for all the 10 companies which we are going to create. So as you can see this print schema is giving you the output, right? Now similarly I can execute for the rest of the uh, things as well. So this is just giving you the similar way all the outputs will be shown up here, right? Company 4, company 5, all these companies you can see this in execution. After that we will be creating our temporary view so that we can execute our SQL queries. So let's do it for company 10 also. Then after that we can just create our all our temporary table for it. Once we are done, now we can do our queries, right? Let's say we can display the average of adjusting closing price for and for each month. So we can hit this query. So all these queries will happen on your temporary view. Because we cannot anyway do all these queries on our uh, data frames or not. So you can see this, this is getting executed. Showing you the output also. Now, because we have done dot show, that's the reason you are getting this output. Similarly, if we want to, let's say, list the closing price for MSFT, which went up more than $2, right? So that query also we can execute now. We have already understood this query in detail. We are just seeing this execution part now, so that you can appreciate whatever you have learned. See, this is the output showing up to you. Now, after that, 
how you can join all the stack closing price, right? Similar way how we can save the joint view in the parquet flat table. You want to read that back. You want to create a new table, right? So let's execute all these three queries together because we have already seen this. Look at this. So this, in this case, we are doing the join class. We are seeing this output. Then we want to save it in the parquet files. So we are saving it. Then we want to again read it back. Then we are creating our new table, right? Where we were doing that join and all. So that is what we are doing in this case. Then we want to see this output. Then we are again storing as a temp table and all. Now once we are done with this step also, then what? So we have done it till step six. Now we want to perform, let's say, a transformation on new table corresponding to the three companies so that we can compare. We want to create the best company containing the best average closing price for all these three companies. We want to find the companies with the best closing price average per year. So let's do all that as well. So you can see best company of the year, right? Now here also the same stuff we are doing. So we are registering our timetable. Okay, so there's a mistake here. So uh, if you notice here, it is one, but here we are doing a show of uh, all, right? So there's a mistake here. I'm just correcting it. So here also it should be one. I'm just updating in the sheet itself so that it will start working now. So here I've just made it one. So now after that, it will start working. Okay, wherever it is going to be all, I have to make it one. So that is the change which I need to do here also and you will notice it will start working. So here also I need to make it one. So all those places wherever it was, so just uh, kind of a good point to make. So wherever uh, you are working on this, you need to always ensure that all these values what you are putting up here, okay, so I could have also done it like this, one second. In fact, in this place, I need not do all this step, one second. Let me explain you also why. No, in this place it's good. So see, from here this error started occurring. Why? Because my data frame what I have created here was one. Let's execute it. Now you will notice this will start working. See, this is working now. Now after that I am creating a temp table. That temp table what we are creating is let's say company or Okay. So this is the temp table which we have created now. You can see this company or Now in this case if I am keeping this company all itself, it is going to work. Because here anyway I am going to use the whatever temporary table we have created, right? So now let's execute. So you can see now it started working, right? Now, further to that, now we want to create a correlation between them, so we can do that. See, this is going to give me the correlation between the two column names, you know? so that's we can see here. So this is the correlation. The more it is closer to one, means the better it is. It means definitely it is near to 1, it is 0 0.9 which is a bigger value. So definitely it is going to be much, uh, they, they both are highly correlated, means definitely they are impacting each other's stock price. So this is all about the project part. Welcome to this interesting session of Spark Streaming from Eureka. What is spark streaming? Is it like really important? Uh, definitely yes. Is it really hot? Definitely yes. That's the reason we are learning this technology. And this is one of the very hot thing in the market. When I say hot thing means in terms of job market I'm talking about. So let's see what will be our agenda for today. So we are going to discuss about spark ecosystem where we are going to see that, okay, what is spark? how Spark Streaming fits in our Spark ecosystem, why Spark Streaming. We are going to have an overview of Spark Streaming, uh, kind of getting into the basics of that. We will learn about DStream. We will learn also about DStream transformations. We will be learning about caching and persistence, accumulators, broadcast variables, checkpoints. These are like advanced concepts of Spark Streaming. And then in the end, we will walk through a use case of Twitter sentiment analysis. Now, what is streaming? Let's understand that. So let me start by an example to you. So let's say if there's a bank and in bank, 
definitely i'm pretty sure all of you must have used credit card debit card all those cards what banks provide now let's say you have done a transaction from india uh, just now and within an hour another your card is getting swiped in us is it even possible for your card to reach in an hour to us definitely no now how that bank will realize that it is a fraud transaction because bank cannot let that transaction happen they need to stop it at the time of when it is getting swiped either they can uh, block it give a call to you ask you whether it's, it is a genuine transaction or not do something of that sort now do you think they will put some manual person behind the scene that will be looking at all the transaction and he will block it manually no so they require something of the sort where the data will be getting streamed and at the real time they should be able to catch with the help of some pattern they will do some processing and they will get some pattern out of it which if it is not sounding like a genuine transaction they will immediately either block it or give you a call maybe send you an otp to confirm whether it's a genuine transaction or not they will not wait till the next day to kind of complete that transaction otherwise if fraud happen nobody is going to trust that bank right so that is the how we work on streaming now uh, someone have mentioned that without stream processing of data is not even possible in fact we can see that there is no even big data which is possible we cannot even talk about internet of things right and this uh, this is a very famous statement from dana sandu uh, from sql stream lot of companies like youtube netflix facebook twitter i twins uh, pandora all these companies are using spark streaming now what is this we have just seen with an example to kind of got an idea about streaming part now as i said with the time growing with the internet growing these streaming technologies are becoming popular day by day it's a technique to transfer the data so that it can be processed as a steady and continuous stream means immediately as and when the data is coming you are continuously processing it as well in fact this real time streaming is what is driving today this big data and also internet of things now there will be a lot of things like fundamental unit of streaming will be a stream we will also be transforming our stream we will be doing it uh, in fact the companies are using it with their business intelligence we will see more details in further of the slides but before that we will be talking about spark ecosystem when we talk about spark ecosystem there are multiple libraries which are present in it first one is spark sql now in spark sql is like where you can a sql developer can write the query in a sql way and it is going to get convert into a spark way and then going to give you output kind of analogous to hive but it is going to be faster in comparison to hive when we talk about spark streaming that is what we are going to learn it is going to enable all the analytical and interactive applications for your live streaming data ml lib ml lib is mostly for machine learning and in fact the interesting part about ml lib is that it is completely replacing maho in fact it are almost replaced maho all the core contributors of maho have moved in towards the uh, towards the ml lib side because of the faster response performance is really good in ml lib graphics graphics okay let me give you example everybody must have used google map right now what you do in google map you search for the path you put your source you put your destination now when you just search for the path it search multiple paths and then provide you an optimal path right now how it providing the optimal path these things can be done with the help of graphics so wherever you can create a kind of a graphical structure we will say that we can use graphics spark r now this is a kind of a package uh, provided for r so r is a open source which is mostly used by analysts and now spark community want in fact all the analysts kind of to move towards the spark framework 
and that's the reason they have recently start supporting Spark R, where all the analysts can now execute the query using Spark environment, thus getting better performance, and they can also work on big data. That's that's all about the ecosystem part. Below this, we are going to have a core engine. Core engine is the one which defines all the basics of Apache Spark. All the RDD related stuff and all is going to be defined in your Spark core engine. Moving further, now, so as we have just discussed this part, we are going to now discuss Spark streaming engine, which is going to enable analytical and interactive app for live streaming data. Now, why Spark streaming? If I talk about why Spark streaming, definitely we have just got an answer. Definitely it's very important. That's the reason we are learning it. But this is so powerful that it is used now for by, by a lot of companies to perform their marketing. They kind of are getting an idea that what a customer is looking for. In fact, we are going to learn a use case of similar to that where we are going to use Spark streaming. Now, where we are going to use a Twitter sentimental analysis which can be used for your crisis management. Maybe uh, you want to check how your products want to behave service adjusting, target marketing by all the companies around the world, this is getting used in this way. And that's the reason Spark Streaming is gaining the popularity. And because of its performance as well, it is beating all other platforms at the moment. Now, moving further, let's see Spark Streaming features. When we talk about Spark Streaming features, uh, it's very easy to scale. You can scale to even multiple nodes, which can even run till hundreds of nodes. Speed is going to be very quick, means in a very short time you can stream as well as process your data. Fault tolerant, even uh, it makes sure that even you are not losing your data. Integration with your batch time and real time processing is possible. And it can also be used for your business analytics, which is used to track behavior of your customer. So as you can see, this is so powerful, right? In each slide, we are kind of getting to know so many interesting things about this past thing. Now, let's quickly have an overview so that we can get some basics of past thing. Now, let's understand how it works. So as we have just discussed, it is for real-time streaming data. It is useful addition in your Spark Core API. So we have already seen at the base level we have that Spark Core in our ecosystem. On top of that, we have Spark Streaming. In fact, Spark Streaming is kind of adding a lot of uh, advantage to Spark Community because a lot of people are only joining Spark Community to kind of use this Spark Streaming. It's so powerful that everyone wants to come and want to use it because all the other frameworks which we already have which are existing are not as good in terms of performance and all and, and it's the easiness of using Spark Streaming is also great. If you compare your program with let's say Flume or with Storm which is used for real time processing, you will notice that it is much easier in terms of uh, from a developer point of view as well. That's the reason a lot of people are showing interest in this domain. Now, it will also enable a high throughput and fault tolerant so that uh, to, you, to stream your data, to process all the things up and the fundamental unit for Spark Streaming is going to be DStream. What is DStream? Let me explain it. So DStream is basically a series of RDBs to process the real-time data. What we generally do is, if you look at this right-hand side, you, when you get the data, it is a continuous data. You divide it into batches of input data. We are going to call it as micro batch. And then we are going to get batches of process data. Though it is real time, but still how come it is batch? Because definitely you are doing processing on some part of the data, right? Even if it is coming at real time, and that is what we are going to call it as micro batch. Moving further, now let's see a few more details on it. Now, from where you can get all your data, what can be your data sources here? So if we talk about data sources here, 
Now we can stream the data from multiple sources like Parquet, Apka, Kafka, uh, even you have static sources like Edbase, MongoDB, which are your NoSQL DBs, Elasticsearch, PostgreSQL, Parquet file format. You can get all the data from here. Now after that you can also now do processing with the help of machine learning. You can do the processing with the help of your Spark SQL and then give the output. So this is a very strong thing that you are bringing the data using Spark Streaming but processing you can do by using some other frameworks as well. right? Like machine learning you can apply on the data what you are getting at a real time. You can also apply your Spark SQL on the data which you are getting at the real time. Moving further, uh, so this is a similar thing. Now in Spark Streaming, you you can just get the data from multiple sources like from Kafka, Flume, STFS, Kinesis, Twitter, bringing it to the Spark Streaming, doing the processing and storing it back to your HDFS. Maybe you can bring it to your DB. You can also publish to your UI dashboard like Tableau, AngularJS. A lot of uh, UI dashboards are there in which you can publish your output. Now. How it works? Let us just break down into more fine grown contents. Now we are going to get our input data stream. We are going to put it inside of our Spark Streaming. Going to get the batches of input data. Once it executes through a Spark Engine, we are going to get batches of process data. We have just seen the same diagram before, so the same explanation for it. Now again, breaking it down into more granular part, we are getting a D stream. D stream was what? Small, small RDDs of data, multiple set of RDDs. So we are getting a D stream. So let's say we are getting an RDD at the rate of time one because now we are getting real stream data, right? So let's say in today, right now I got one second. Maybe now I got one second. In one second I got more data. Now I got more data in the next lot, right? So that is what we are talking about. So we are creating data we are getting from time zero to time one. We let's say that we have an RDD at the rate of time one. Similarly, it is just proceeding with the time. The RDD is getting proceeded here. Now, in the next thing, we are extracting the words from an input stream. So, if you can notice what we are doing here, from here, let's say we started applying doing our operations as well. We started doing our any sort of processing. So, as in when we get the data in this time frame, we started doing some process. It can be a flat map operation, it can be any sort of operation you are doing. It can be even a machine learning operation or whatever you are doing. And then you are generating the words in that time frame. So this is how we are, uh, we are seeing that how granularly we can kind of see all these parts at a very high level this work. We again went into detail, then again we went into more detail and finally we have seen that how we can even process the data along the time when we are streaming our data as well. Now one important point is just like Spark context is a main entry point for any Spark application. Similarly, to work on streaming or uh, Spark streaming, you require a streaming context. What is that? When you are passing your input data stream, you when you are working on the Spark engine, when you are working on the Spark streaming engine, you have to use your streaming context here. It's using streaming context only, you are going to get the batches of your input data. Now, so streaming context is going to consume a stream of data in Apache Spark, it is registers and input D stream to produce a receiver object. Now, it is the main entry point as we discussed that like Spark context is the main entry point for the Spark application. Similarly, your streaming context is an entry point for your Spark streaming. Now, does that mean now Spark context is not an entry point? No. When you create Spark Streaming, it is dependent on your Spark Streaming only. So when you create this streaming context, it is going to be dependent on your Spark uh, context only because you will be not be able to create streaming context without Spark context. So that's the reason it is definitely required. Spark also provides a number of default implementations of sources like you can get the data from Twitter, Akka Actor, zero MQ which are accessible from the context. So it is supporting so many things right now. If you notice this what we are doing in streaming context this is just to give you an idea about how we can initialize our streaming context. 
So we will be importing these two libraries. After that, can you see? I'm passing Spark context, SC, right? So I'm passing it every second. We are collecting the data. Means collect the data for every one second. You can increase this number if you want. And then this is your SSC. Means in every one second, whatever going to happen, I'm going to process it. This is what we are doing in this case. Let's go to the DStream topic now. Now in DStream, it is the full form is discretized stream. It's a basic abstraction provided by your Spark Streaming Framework. It's a continuous stream of data and it is going to be received from your source and from processed streaming context is related to your uh, Spark Streaming part. Spark context is belonging to your Spark Core. If you remember the ecosystem Rahul, in the ecosystem we have that Spark context, right? Now streaming context is built with the help of Spark context. And in fact, using streaming context only, you will be able to perform your Spark streaming. Just like without Spark context, you were not able to execute anything in Spark application. Your Spark application will not be able to do anything. Similarly, without streaming context, your streaming application will not be able to do anything. It's just that streaming context is built on top of Spark context. Okay? So, now. It's a continuous stream of data. I can talk about these three. It is received from source or from a process uh, data stream generated by the transformation of input stream. If you look at this part, internally a D stream can be represented by a continuous series of RDDs. This is important here. Now, what we are doing is every second remember last time we have just seen an example of like every second whatever gonna happen we are going to do processing so in that every second whatever data you are collecting and you're performing your operation so the data what you're getting here is will be your d stream means it's a content you can say that all this thing will be your d stream part it's a representation by a continuous series of RDD. Can you see so many RDDs getting caught? Because let's say right now in one second what data I got collected, I executed it. I In the second second this data is happening here. Okay, okay, sorry for that. Now, in the second time also uh, the it is happening here. Third second also it is happening here. Uh, no problem now, I'm, I'm not uh, going to draw it now. Fine. So in the third second auto, if I did something, I'm processing it here, right? So if you see the, this diagram itself, so it is every second, whatever data is getting collected, we are doing the processing on top of it. And the whole continuous series of RDD, what we are seeing here, will be called as D string. Okay, so this is what your D string, moving further. Now, we are going to understand the operation on D string. So let's say, uh, you are doing this operation on this DStream that you are getting the data from 0 to 1. Again, you are applying some operation on that. Then whatever output you get, you are going to call it as words DStream. Means this is the thing what you are doing. You are doing a platform operation. That's the reason we are calling it as a word DStream. Now, similarly, whatever thing you are doing, so you are going to get accordingly an output DStream for it as well. So this is what is happening in this particular example. Now, flat map. Flat map is a API. It is uh, very similar to map. It's kind of flatten up your value. Okay. So let me explain you with an example. What is flat map? So let's say if I say that, uh, hi, this is Eduleka. Welcome. Okay. Let's say this is written. Now, I want to apply a flat map. So let's say this is a form of RDD also. Now, on this RDD, let's say I apply flat map. So let's say RDD, this is the RDD, flat map, flat map, sorry, capital F, flat map here. And then let's say you want to define something for it. So let's say you say that, okay, uh, you are defining your variables here. Okay, so let's say a, a dot, now, after that, you are defining your uh, split. Split. So you are splitting with respect to this. Now, in this case, what is going to happen? Now, I'm not showing you the exact thing here, just to give explain you flat map, just to kind of uh, give you an idea of how it works. 
it is going to flatten up this pipe with respect to the split what we have mentioned here. Means what? It is going to now create each element as one word. So it is going to create like this. Hi as one word, as one element. This as one word or one element. Is as another word or one element. Adureka as one word or another element. Welcome as one word or another element. So this is how your flattener works. Kind of flatten up your whole pipe. So this is what we are doing in our stream as well. Clear our word? So this is how this will work. Now, so we have just understood this part. Now let's understand input the stream and receivers. Okay, what are these things? Let's understand this part. Okay, so what are the input the stream possible? There can be basic source, advanced source. In basic source, we can have file systems, sockets, connections. In advanced source, we can have Kappa, Plume, Kinesis. Okay, so your input these things are the these things representing the stream of input data received from streaming sources. This is again the same thing. Okay, so this is there are two types of streams which we just discussed. One is your basic and second is your advanced. Let's move further. Now, what we are going to see here. So if you notice, let's say here there are some events occurring. It is going to your receiver and then in the D stream now RDDs are getting created and we are performing some steps on it. So the receiver sends the data into the D stream where each batch is going to contain the RDD. So this is what your D stream is doing, receiver is doing here. Now. Moving further, transformations on the D stream. Let's understand that. What are the transformations available? There are uh, multiple transformations which are possible. The most popular, let's talk about that. We have map, flat map, filter, reduce, group by. So there are multiple transformations available here. Now it is like you are getting your input data. Now you will be applying any of these operations means any transformation step is going to happen and then a new D stream is going to be created. Okay, so that is what's going to happen. So let's explore it one by one. So let's start with map. If I start with map, what happens with map? It is going to create batches of data. Okay, so let's say it is going to create a map value of it like this. So let's say X is map to B, Y is giving the output C, Z is giving the output A, right? So in this similar format, this is going to get mapped. So it is going to whatever you are performing, it is just going to create batches of input data which you can execute it. So it returns a new D stream by passing each element of the source D stream through a function which you have defined. Let's discuss this flat map. Flat map we have just discussed. It is going to flatten up the things. So in this case also, if you notice, we are just kind of flattening up. It is very similar to map but each input item can be mapped to zero or more output in uh, items here, okay? And it is going to return a new D stream by passing each source element through a function for this part. So we have just seen an example of flat map anyway. So that same example, you can remember that, that will be more easy for you to kind of see the difference between with map itself. Now, moving further, filter. As the name states, you can now filter out the values. So let's say you have a huge data, you are kind of, you want to filter out some values, you just want to kind of work with some filtered data, maybe you want to remove some part of it, maybe you are trying to put some logic on it, does this line contain this, right, or does this line contain that, so in that case it is filtering only with that particular criteria. So this is what we do here. So definitely most of the times your output is going to be smaller in comparison to your input. Reduce. Reduce is uh, it's just like it's going to do kind of aggregation on the work. Let's say in the end you want to sum up all the data what you have. That is going to be done with the help of reduce. Now after that group by. Group by is like it's going to combine all the common values. That is what group by is going to do. So as you can see in this example, all the things which are starting with C got grouped by, all the things named starting with J got grouped by, all the names starting with T got grouped by. Now, so again, what is this stream window? 
Now, to give you an example of this window, everybody must be knowing Twitter, right? So now what happens in Twitter? Let me go to my paint. So in, uh, in this example, let's understand how this windowing operation works. So let's say in initial first second, in initial first second, 10 seconds, let's say the tweets are happening in this way. Let's say hash A, hash A, hash A. Now which is the trending Twitter? Definitely A, right? A is my trending Twitter. Maybe in the next 10 seconds, in the next 10 seconds, now again hash A, hash B, hash B is operating. Which is the trending tweet? B is happening here. Now, let's say in another 10 seconds, now this time, let's say hash B, hash B, sorry, hash B, hash B, hash B is happening. Now, which is trending? B is operating. But now, I want to find out which is the trending one in last 30 seconds. Hash B, right? Because if I combine, I can do it easily. Now, this is your windowing operation example. Means, you are not only looking at your current window, but you are also looking at your previous window. When I say current window, I am talking about, let's say, 10 seconds of slot. In this 10 second slot, let's say you are doing this operation on hash B, hash B, hash B, hash B. So, this is your current window. Now, you are not only computing with respect to your current window, but you are also considering your previous window. Now, let's say in this case, if I ask you, can you give me the output of which is trending in last 17 seconds, will you be able to answer? No. Why? Because you don't have partial information for 7 seconds. You have information for your 10, 20, 30, means multiple of 10, but not intermediate one. So, keep this in mind, okay? So you will be able to perform windowing operation only with respect to your window size. It's not like you can create any partial value and can do the window operation. Now, let's get back to the slides. Now, it's a similar thing. So now it is shown here that we are not only considering the current window, but we are also considering the previous window. Now, let's understand the output operators uh, operations of the display. When we talk about output operations, so output operations are going to allow the DStream data to be pushed out to your external system. If you notice here, means whenever whatever processing you have done with respect to whatever data you are doing here, now your output you can store in multiple places. You can store it in the file system, you can keep in your database, you can keep even in your external systems. So you can keep in multiple places so that is what being reflected here. Now, so if I talk about output operation, these are the ones which are supported. We can print out the value. We can use save as text file. When we use save as text file, it saves it into your LCFS. If you want, you can also use it to save it in your local file system. You can save it uh, as an object file also. You can save it as a Hadoop file or you can also apply for each RDD function. Now, what are for each RDD function. Let's see this example. So uh, generally we explain all these parts in detail once we teach you uh, in Advocate sessions. But just to give you an idea, now this is a very powerful primitive that is going to allow your data to be sent out to your external systems. So using this, you can send it across to your uh, out to your external system. We have just seen our external system that it can be a file system, it can be anything. So using this you will be able to transfer it, you can. You will be able to send it out to your external systems. Now, let's understand the caching and persistence. Now, when we talk about caching and persistence, so DStream is also allowing the developers to cache or to persist the stream's data in memory. Means you can keep your data in memory, you can cache your data in memory for longer time. Even after your action is complete, it is not going to delete it. So you can just use this as many times as you want. So you can simply use your persist method to do that. So for your input streams which are receiving your data over the network, maybe using Kafka, Loom, Socket, the default persistence level is set to the replicate the data to two nodes for the fault tolerance. Like it is also going to be replicating the data into two parts. So you can see the same thing in this diagram. 
Let's understand this accumulators, broadcast variables and checkpoints. Now these are mostly for your performance part. So this is going to help you to kind of perform, uh, to help you in the performance part or not. So it is accumulators is nothing but a variable that are only added through an associative and commutative operation. Usually uh, if you are coming from Hadoop background, if you have done let's say any MapReduce programming, you must have seen something about counters. Right? That there we used to have a counters which kind of helps us to debug the program as well and you can perform some analysis in the console itself. Now this is similar thing you can do with the accumulators as well. So you can implement your counters with this part. You can also sum up the things with this part. Now you can, uh, if you want to track through UI, you can also do that. As you can see in this uh, UI itself, you can see all your accumulators as well. Now, similarly, we have broadcast variables. Now, broadcast variables allow the programmer to keep a read-only variable cached on all the machines which are available. Now, it is going to be kind of caching it on all the machines. Now, they can be used to give every node a copy of a large input data set in an efficient manner. So you can just uh, use that. A Spark will also attempt to distribute the distributed broadcast variable using efficient broadcast algorithm to reduce the communication cost. So as you can see here, we are passing this broadcast value, it is going to spark context and then it is broadcasting to these places, right? So this is what, how it is working in this application. Uh, generally when we teach in these classes and also since these are advanced concepts, we kind of, uh, kind of try to explain you with the practicals and all. Right now we just want to give you an idea about what are these things. So when you go with the practicals of all these things, like right, how accumulators see how this is happening, how it is getting broadcasted, things become more and more clear at that time. Right now, I just want that everybody at least get a high level overview of things. Now, moving further, so what is checkpoints? So uh, checkpoints are similar to your checkpoints in the gaming. Uh, now, now they can, uh, they make it run 24 by seven, make it resilient to the failure, unrelated to the application logic. So if you can see this diagram, we are just creating the checkpoint. So as in the metadata checkpoint you can see, it is the saving of the information which is defining the streaming computation. If we talk about data from checkpoints, it is saving of the generated RDD to the reliable storage. So this is, this both are generating the checkpoint. Now. Now moving forward, we are going to move towards our project where we are going to perform our Twitter sentiment analysis. Let's discuss a very important use case of Twitter sentimental analysis. This is going to be very interesting because uh, we will just do a real time analysis on uh, Twitter sentiment analysis and there can be a lot of possibility of this sentiment analysis, but we will be taking something from the Twitter and it's going to be very interesting. So generally when we do all this in, uh, in our course, it is more detailed because right now in the webinar definitely going in deep is not very much possible. But uh, during the training of Edureka, you learn all these things within the class. Awesome, right? That's, that's something which, which we learn it, uh, during the session itself. Now, uh, if we talk about some use cases of Twitter, uh, as I said, there can be multiple use cases which are possible because there are a lot of emotions behind whatever the campaign you are doing, right? So, so much of social media right now in these days are very active as well, right? You must be noticing that even politicians have started using Twitter and that uh, that all their tweets are being shown in the news channel and instead they become a hot trending tweet. People start talking about positive, negative when any politician do something, right? And if we talk about anything else, even if we talk about let's say any sports, FIFA World Cup is going on, then you will notice always Twitter will be filled up with a lot of tweets, right? So how we can take use of it, how we can do some analysis on top of it. That's what we are going to learn in this. So there can be multiple sort of sentiment analysis, like it can be done for your crisis management, service adjusting, target marketing. We can keep on talking about when a new movie is released. Now even the movie makers kind of go and try to predict, okay, how this movie is going to perform. So they can easily make out even beforehand, okay, this movie is going to go in this kind of range of profit or not. 
So interesting, right? Earlier days it was not even possible. Even in the political campaign, in fact, you must have heard that in US when the president election was happening, they, they have used, uh, in fact, a lot of social media, uh, all this analysis and all. And they, that have, in fact, played a major role in winning uh, that election. Similarly, how, uh, whether investors want to predict whether they should invest in a particular company or not, whether they want to check that whether uh, uh, like we should target which customers for advertisement because we cannot target everyone. Problem with targeting everyone is that if we try to target everyone, it will be very costly. So we want to kind of uh, set a target. Okay, these may be my set of people whom I should send this advertisement to be more effective and well as well as it is going to be cost effective as well. If you want to review the products and services also, in that case, we can also do this. Now, let's see some use cases. Like uh, in terms of use case, I will show you a practical how it runs. So first of all, we will be importing all the required Spark packages because we are going to not perform a total sentiment analysis. So we will be requiring some packages for that. So we will be doing that as a first step. Then we need to set all our authentication. Without authentication, we cannot do anything else. Now, here the challenge is we cannot directly put your username and password, right? Don't you think it will get hacked if I put your username and password, right? So Twitter came up with something very uh, smart thing. What they did is, they came up with uh, something called as authentication tokens. So you have to go to dev.twitter.com, log in from there, and you will find kind of uh, all these authentication tokens available to you. Four will be there, you need to take them and put it here. Then, uh, as we have learned the DSTEAM transformation, you will be doing all that computation here. So you will be uh, having your DSTEAM uh, transformation. Then you will be generating your tweet data and going to save it in this particular directory. Once you are done with this, then you are going to extract your sentiment. Once you extract it, and you are done. Let me just show you quickly how it works in our fear. Now, one more interesting thing for, about Edurator would be that you will be getting all this uh, configuration machines. So you need not worry about from where I will be getting all this. Is it like very difficult to install? When I was going in this open source location, it was not working for me. In my operating system, it was not working. So many things we have generally seen people uh, face issues. To resolve everything up, we, we kind of provide all this PM. Question from Rahul, this PM has pre-spark? Yes, that's what. It has everything pre-installed, whichever will be required for your training. So that's the best part what we also provide. So in this case, your Eclipse will already be there. You need to just go to your Eclipse location. Let me show you how you can also go there if you want. Uh, so you, as you can see, when Eclipse is there, you just need to go inside it and double click on it and start. You need not go and kind of install Eclipse or not. Even the Spark will already be installed for you. Let us go in our project. So this is our project, which is in front of you. And this is our project, which we are going to work on. Now, you can see that we have first imported all the libraries, then we have set our authentication system, and then we have moved and kind of extracted the these team transformation, extracted the tweets, right, and then saved the output finally, right? So these are the things which we have done in this program also. Now, let's execute it. To run this program, it's very simple. Go to run as, and from run as, click on scale application. You will notice in the end, it is, uh, Rahul is saying that's great, good to see that. So uh, it is executing the program, let this execute. And we are doing it actually for Trump. So usually for Trump anyway, the tweets are going to be negative, right? <laughs> so let's see that. <laughs> because anything you do for Trump is going to be negative. Trump is anyway the hot topic for us. Let me make it a little bigger also. You will notice a lot of negative tweets coming up for him. Yes, now I'm just stopping it so that I can show you some tweet. Yes, it's filtering the tweet for Trump. So we have actually, while writing, writing the program itself, we have given it one location Trump. Using that, we were kind of uh, asking for a tweet of Trump. Now, here we are doing analysis. And it is also going to tell us whether it's a positive tweet, negative tweet. As you can see, see the negative tweet is coming up, right? Because Trump, for Trump, anyone will not tweet positive, right? So that's something which is there. So that's the reason you're finding this as a negative tweet. So similarly, if there will be any other tweet which will be getting a static. So right now, if I keep on moving ahead, we will see multiple negative tweets which will come up. 
So that's how this program runs. Okay. So this is how uh, uh, our program will be executing. We can just extract it. Even the output results will be getting stored at a location. As you can see in this, if I go to my location here, this is my actual project where it is running. So you can just come to this location. Here are all your output. Okay, all your output is getting stored there. So you can just take a look as well. Yes. So it's everything is done by using fast stream only. Okay, that's what we have seen, right, Rahul? That we were seeing it uh, with respect to these stream transformations and all. So we have done all that with the help of fast stream only. So that is one of the awesome part about this that you can uh, do such a powerful things with respect to your uh, with with respect to your this part. Now let's analyze our results. Uh, so as we have just seen that it is showing up whether it's a positive tweet, negative tweets, and all. So this is where your output is getting stored. I've just shown you up. The output will appear like this. Okay, this is just like your output tweets presented. But it will also tell whether it's a neutral one, positive one, negative one. Everything we we have done it with the help of Spark Streaming only. Now we have done it for uh, Trump. As I just explained you, right? We have put in our program itself, Trump. Like. So we have put everything up here, and based on that only we are getting all this output. Now we can apply all the sentiment analysis, and like this, like we have learned. So I hope you have found all this, uh, this especially this use case, very much useful for you to kind of getting it that. Yes, it is getting done by hashtag. Right now we have put uh, Trump here, but if you want, you can keep on putting the hashtag as well because that's how we are doing it. You can keep on changing your tags. Maybe you can kind of put for, let's say, for FIFA World Cup is going on, a cricket uh, match will be going on. You can just put the tweets according to that. Just tweak the, in that place instead of Trump. You can put uh, any player name or maybe a, a team name, and you will see all that trendy tweet coming accordingly. Okay, so that's how you can play with this. Now, uh, this is there are multiple examples with it which we can play. Uh, and this use case can be even evolved for multiple other type of use cases. You can just keep on transforming it according to your own use cases. So that's it about Spark Streaming, which I wanted to discuss. So I hope uh, you must have found it useful. So in classification, generally what happens? Just to give you an example, uh, you must have noticed the spam email box. I hope everybody must be having uh, have seen that spark in uh, your spam email box in your Gmail. Now, when any new email comes up, how Google decide whether it's a spam email or a non-spam email? That is done as an example of classification, clustering. Let's say uh, you might have seen this Google News. Right? When you type something, it group all the news together. That is called your clustering. Regression. Regression is also one of the very important part. It is not here. Regression is, let's say you have house and you want to sell that house and you have no idea what is the optimal price you should keep for your house. Now this regression will help you to achieve that. Collaborative filtering. You might have seen when you go to your uh, Amazon web page that they show you a recommendation, right? You can buy this because you are buying this, right? This is done with the help of collaborative filtering. Before I move to the project, I want to show you some practical part. How we will be executing Spark things. So let me take you to the VM machine, which will be provided by Adureka. So all these machines are also provided by Adureka. So you need not worry about from where I will be getting the software, what I will be doing with my role there. Everything is taken care by Adureka. Now, once you will be coming to this, you will see a machine like this. Let me close this. So what will happen? You will see a blank machine like this. Let me show you that. So this is how your machine will look like. Now, what? You are going to do in order to start working, you will be opening this terminal by clicking on this black option. Now, after that, what you can do is you can now uh, go to your Spark. Now, how I can work with Spark? In order to execute any program in Spark by using Scalar program, you will be entering it as Spark hyphen shell. If you type Spark hyphen shell, it will take you to the Upon where you can write your Spark program, but by using Scala programming language. You can notice this. 
Now can you see this part? It is also giving me 1.5.2 version. So that is the version of your Spark. Now you can see here, you can also see this part. Spark context available as a thing. When you get connected to your Spark shell, you can just see, uh, this will be by default available to you. Let this get connected. It takes some time. Now, we got connected. So we got connected to this Scala Pro. Now, if I want to come out of it, I will just type exit. It will just let me come out of this prompt. Now, secondly, I can also write my programs with my Python. So what I can do, if I want to do programming in Spark, but with my Python programming language, I will be connecting with PySpark. So I just need to type PySpark in order to get connected with your Python. Okay, I'm not getting connected now because I'm not going to require Python. I will be explaining everything with Scalar right now. But if you want to get connected, you can type PySpark. So let's again get connected to my Spark hyphen shell. Now, meanwhile this is getting connected, let us create a small file. So let us create a file. So currently if you notice, I don't have any file. Okay, I already have a.txt. So let's say I say cat a.txt. So I have some data, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is my data which is with me. Now what I am going to do, let me push this file, undo. So let me first check if, if it is already available in my uh, system as well, means HDFS system, Hadoop DFS hyphen cat a.txt, just to quickly check if it is already available. Okay, so there is no such file. So let me first put this file to my system, so put a.txt. So this will put it in the default location of SDFS. Now if I want to read it, I can see this file. So again I'm assuming that you're aware of this SDFS command. So you can see now this 1234 file is coming from a Hadoop file system. Now what I want to do, I want to use this file in my, uh, in my system of Spark. Now how I can do that? So let me come here. So in Scala, in Scala, we do not have integer float and all. Like in Java, you used to define like this, right? Integer a is equal to 10, like this you used to define. But in Scala, we do not use this data type. In fact, what we do is, we call it as var. So if I use var, a is equal to 10, it will automatically identify that it is an integer value. Notice, it will tell me that A is of my integer type. Now if I want to update this value to 20, I can do that. Now, let's say if I want to update this to A, B, C like this. This will throw an error. Why? Because A is already defined as integer and you are trying to assign some A, B, C string type. So that is the reason you got this error. Similarly, there is one more thing called as val. Val b is equal to 10. Let's say if I do, it works exactly similar to val, but have one difference. Now, in this case, if I do b is equal to 20, you will see an error. And why this error? Because when you define something as val, it is a constant. It is not going to be variable anymore. It will be a constant and that is the reason if you define something as val, it will be not updatable. You will you should not be able to update that value. So this is how in Scala you will be doing your program. So that for variable part, for val, for your constant part. Now, so you will be doing like this. Now let's use it for the example what we have learned. Now let's say if I want to create an RDD, so val number is equal to sc.txt file. Remember this API? We have learned this API already, sc.txt file. Now let me give this file a.txt. If I give this file a.txt, it will be creating an RDD. See this part. It is telling that I created an RDD of string type. 
Now, if I want to read this data, I will call number dot collect. This will print me the value what was available. Can you see? Now, this line what you are seeing here is going to be from your memory. This is your from memory. It is reading up, and that is the reason it is showing up in this particular manner. So this is how you will be performing your step. Now, second thing, I told you that Spark can work on standalone systems as well, right? So right now, what was happening was that we have executed this part in our SDFS. Now, if I want to execute this on our local file system, can I do that? Yes, it can still do that. What you need to do for that? So it's in that case, the difference will come here. Now, what the file you are giving here would be, instead of giving like that, you will be denoting this file keyword before that. And after that, you need to give your local path. For example, what is this path? Slash home slash Edureka. This is a local path, not SDFS path. So you will be writing slash home slash Edureka a dot txt. Now, if you give this, this will be loading the file into memory, but not from your HDFS. Instead, what this did is this loaded it from your this loaded it from your local disk. So that is the difference here. So as you can see, in the second case, I am not even using my HDFS, which means what? Now, can you tell me why this error? This is interesting. Why this error? Input path does not exist because I have given a typo here. Okay. Now, if you notice why I did not get this error here, why I did not get this error here, this file do not exist, but still I did not got any error because of lazy evaluation. Lazy evaluation kind of made sure that even if you have given the wrong path, it created an empty RDD, but it has not executed anything. So all the output or the error mistake you are able to receive when you hit that action of collect. Now in order to uh, correct this value, I need to correct this Edureka and this time if I execute it, it will work. Okay, you can see this output, one, two, three, four, five. So this time it works fine. So now you should be more clear about the lazy evaluation as well. So even if you are giving the wrong file name, doesn't matter. Suppose I want to use Spark in production unit, but not on top of Hadoop. Is it possible? Yes, you can do that. You can do that, sorry. But usually that's not what you do. But yes, if you want, you can do that. There are a lot of things which you can do. You can also uh, deploy it on your Amazon clusters as well. Lot of things you can do there. How will it provide the distribute? In that case, we'll be using some other distribution system. So in that case, you are not using this part. You can deploy it. It will be just definitely you will not be able to kind of go across and distribute in the cluster, you will not be able to liberate that redundancy, but you can use even Amazon S3 and all for that. Okay? So that is how you will be using this. Now you got it. Great. So this is how you will be performing your practicals. As I said, how you will, will be working on this path, I will be explaining you as I told you. So this is how things work. Now, let us see an interesting use case. So for that, let us go back to our PPT. This is going to be very interesting. So let's see this use case. Look at this use case. This is very interesting. Okay. Now this use case is for earthquake detection using SPA. So in Japan, you might have already seen that there are so many earthquakes uh, coming. You might have heard about it. I uh, definitely you might have not seen it, but you must have heard about it. That there are so many uh, earthquakes which happens in Japan. Now. How to solve that problem with the patches? So I'm just going to give you a glimpse of what kind of problems we solve in the sessions. Definitely, we are not going to walk through in detail of this, but you will get an idea how powerful path is. Okay, just to give you a little bit of brief here, but all these projects you learn at the time of sessions. Now, so let's see this part. How we will be using this? Day. So as everybody must be knowing what is earthquake, right? So earthquake is. Uh, like a shaking of your surface of the earth, your home start shaking up, all those events start happening. In fact, uh, if you're from India, you might have seen recently there was an earthquake incident which came from Nepal, right? Even uh, recently, two days back also, there was an uh, uh, earthquake incident, right? So these earthquakes keeps on coming. Now, 
very important part is let's say if the earthquake is a major earthquake like hurricane or maybe tsunami maybe forest fires maybe a volcano now it's very important for them to kind of estimate that earthquake is going to come they should be able to kind of predict it beforehand it should not happen that at the last moment they got to know that okay the earthquake is coming earthquake came earthquake came no it should not happen like that it, they should be able to estimate all these things beforehand they should be able to predict beforehand so this is the system that japan is using already so this is a real time kind of use case what i am presenting so japan is already using this fast framework in order to solve this earthquake problem so we are going to see that how they are using it okay now let's say uh, what happens in uh, japan earthquake model so whenever there is a earthquake coming for example at 2:46 pm on march uh, 2011 now japan earthquake uh, early warning was detected now the thing was as soon as it detected immediately they start sending the alert to schools to the lift to the factories every station through tv stations they have immediately kind of told everyone so that all the students who are there in school they got the time to go under the desk in bullet trains which were running they stop otherwise the if immediately the earth will start shaking now the bullet trains are already running at the very high speed they want to ensure that there should be no sort of casualty because of that so all the bullet trains stop all the elevators the lift which were running they stop otherwise some incident can happen in 60 seconds 60 seconds before this number they were able to inform almost everyone they have sent the message they have a broadcast on tv all those things they have done immediately to all the people so that they can send at least this message whoever can receive it and that have saved millions of lives so how they were able to achieve that they have done all this with the help of apache spark that is the most important thing so how they because you can see that every thing what they are doing there they are doing it on the real time system right if they cannot just collect that data and then later they process it they did everything at the real time system so they collected the data immediately process it and as soon as they detected that earthquake they immediately informed it in fact this happened in 2011 now they they are using it very frequently because Jap japan is one of the area which is very frequently uh, kind of affected by all this so as i said the main thing is we should be able to process the data in real time that's the major thing you should be able to handle the data from multiple sources because data may be coming from multiple sources uh, maybe different different sources they might be suggesting some other other uh, event which because of which we are predicting that Uh, okay this uh, earthquake can happen it should be very easy to use because if it is very complicated then in that case for a user to use it it will be very become complicated so he may not be able to solve the problem now even in the end how to send the alert message is important right so all those things are taken care by us pa now there are two kinds of layer in your uh, earthquake the number one layer is a primary wave and second is secondary wave there are two kinds of waves in a earthquake primary wave is like when the earthquake is just about to start it start with the epicenter and it's when the earthquake is going to start secondary wave is more severe wave which start after primary wave now what happens in secondary wave is once that start it can do maximum damage because primary wave you can say the initial wave but the secondary will be on top of that so there will be some details with respect to that i'm not going in detail of that but yeah there will be some details with respect to that now what we are going to do using sparks we will be creating our roc so let's go and see that in our machine how we will be calculating our roc which using which we will be solving this problem later and we will be calculating this roc with the help of apache spark let's again come back to this machine now in order to work on that let's first exit from this console once you exit from this console now what you are going to do i have already created this project and kept it here because uh, we just want to give you an overview of this let me go to my download section 
there is a project called as Earth 2. So this is your project. Initially, what all things you will be having? You will not be having all the things initial part. So what will happen? So let's say if I go to my downloads, from here I have Earth 2 project. Okay. Now initially, I will not be having this target directory, project directory, bin directory. We will be using our SBP framework. If you do not know SBP, this is a scalar build tool which takes care of all your dependencies. So it takes care of all your dependencies and all. So uh, it is very similar to Maven. If you already know Maven, you uh, this SBP is very similar. But at the same time, I prefer SBT because SBT is more easier to write in comparison to your Maven. So you will be writing this build.sbt. So this file you will have to write here, build.sbt. Now in this file you will be giving the name of your project, your what's the version of SBT using, version of scalar what you are using, what are the dependencies you have, with what versions dependencies you have, like for Spark Core, I'm using 1.5.2 version of Spark. So you are telling that whatever in my program I am writing, if I require anything related to Spark Core, go and get it from this website of .org, download it, install it. If I require any dependency for Spark streaming program, for this particular version 1.5.2, go to this website or this link and execute it. Similar thing for MLLib as well. So you're just telling that. Now, once you have done this, you will be creating a folder structure. Your folder structure would be you need to create a SRC folder. After that, you will be creating a main folder. From main folder, you will be creating again a folder called as scalar. Now, inside that, you will be keeping your program. So now here, you will be writing your program. So you are writing, can you see this streaming uh, scalar, network on scalar, art dot scalar. So let's keep it as a black box for now. So we will be writing the code to achieve this problem statement. Now what we are going to do, let's come out of this. Go to your main project folder and from here you will be writing SBT package. It will start downloading with respect to your SBT. It will check your program. Whatever dependency you require for Spark Core, Spark Streaming, Spark MLF, it will download and install it. It will just download and install it. So we are not going to execute it because I've already done it before and it also takes some time. So, so that's the reason I'm not doing it. Now, once you have built this packet, you will find all this directory, target directory, project directory. These got created later only. Now what is going to happen? Once you have created this, you will go to your Eclipse. So your Eclipse you will open. So let me open my Eclipse. So this is how your Eclipse looks like. Now I already have this program in front of me, but let me tell you how you will be bringing this program here. You will be going to your import option. With import, you will be selecting your existing project into workspace. Next, once you do that, you need to select your main project. For example, you need to select this R2 project what you have created and click on OK. Once you do that, there will be a project directory coming here. This R2 will come here. Now, what you need to do, go to your src slash main and all, ignore all this program. I require only this earth.scalar because this is where I've written my main function code. Now, after that, once you reach to this, you need to go to your run as scalar application and your spark code will start executing. Now, this will return me ROC and all. Okay, let's see this output. Now, if I see this, this will show me once it's finished executing. See this output. Area under ROC is this. So this is all computed with the help of Spark program. Similarly, there are other programs also which will help you to screen the data and all. So I'm not walking over all that. Now, let's come back to my PPT and see that what is the next step what we will be doing. So you can see this, there will be an Excel sheet getting created. Now I'm keeping my ROC here. Now after you have created your ROC, you will be generating a graph. Now in Japan, there is one important thing. 
Japan is already of affected area of your earthquake. And now the trouble here is that whatever, it's not like even for a minor earthquake, I should start sending the alert, right? I don't want to do all that for the minor, uh, minor affection. In fact, the buildings and the infrastructure what is created in Japan is in such a way, if any earthquake below six magnitude comes there, there uh, the homes are designed in a way that there will be no damage. There will be no damage there. So this is the major thing when you work with uh, your Japan framework. Now in Japan, so that means with six, they are not even worried, but above six, they are worried. Now for that, there will be a graph generation, what you can do, you can do it with Park as well. Once you generate this graph, you will be seeing that anything which is going above six, if anything which is going above six, we should immediately start the alert. Now ignore all this programming side because that is what we have just created and shown you this execution part. Now if you have to visualize the same result, this is what is happening. This is showing my ROC, but if my earthquake is going to be greater than six, then only raise the alert. Then only send the alert to all the people, otherwise stay calm. That is what the project, what we generally show in our Spark programming side. Now it is not the only project, we also kind of create multiple other projects as well. For example, I kind of create a model just like how Walmart do it, how Walmart may be creating uh, whatever sales is happening with respect to that they are using Apache Spark and at the end they are kind of making you visualize the output of doing whatever analytics they are doing. So that is all done with Spark, so all those things we walk you through when we do the course session. All the things you learn here and feel that all these projects are easy. Right now, since you do not know the topic, you are not able to get 100% of the project. But at that time, once you know each and every topic separately, you will have a clear picture of how Spark is handling all these use cases. Graphs are very attractive when it comes to modeling real world data because they are intuitive, flexible, and the theory supporting them has been maturing for centuries. Welcome everyone in today's session on Spark Graphics. So without any further delay, let's look at the agenda first. We'll start by understanding the basics of graph theory and different types of graph. Then we'll look at the features of graphics. Further, we'll understand what is property graph and look at various graph operations. Moving ahead, we'll look at different graph processing algorithms. At last, we'll look at a demo where we will try to analyze Ford's co-bike data using PageRank algorithm. Let's move to the first topic. So we'll start with basics of graph. So graphs are basically made up of two sets called vertices and edges. The vertices are drawn from some underlying type and the set can be finite or infinite. Now each element of the edge set is a pair consisting of two elements from the vertices set. So your vertex is V1, then your vertex is V3, then your vertex is V2 and V4. And your edges are V1, V3, then next is V1, V2, then you have V2, V3, and then you have V2, V4. So basically we represent vertices set as closed in curly braces, all the name of vertices, so we have V1, we have V2, we have V3 and then we have V4 and we'll close the curly braces and to represent the edge set, we use curly braces again and then in curly braces, we specify those two vertex which are joined by the edge. So for this edge, we will use a V1, V3 and then for this edge, we'll use V1, V2 and then for this edge, Again, we'll use V2, V4. And then at last for this edge, we'll use V2, V3. And at last, I'll close the curly braces. So this is your vertices set and this is your edge set. Now, one more important thing that is if a edge set is containing U, V or you can say that our edge set is containing V1, V3. So V1 is basically adjacent to V3. Similarly, your V1 is adjacent to V2, then V2 is adjacent to V4 and looking at this edge, we can say V2 is adjacent to V3. Now let's quickly move ahead and we'll look at different types of graph. 
so first we have undirected graphs so basically in an undirected graph we use straight lines to represent the edges now the order of the vertices in the edge set does not matter in undirected graph so the undirected graph usually are drawn using straight lines between the vertices now it is almost similar to the graph which we have seen in the last slide similarly we can again represent the vertices set as 5 comma 6 comma 7 comma 8 and the edge set as 5 comma 6 then 5 comma 7 now talking about directed graphs so basically in a directed graph the order of vertices in the edge set matters so we use arrow to represent the edges as you can see in the image as which was not the case with the undirected graph where we were using the straight lines so in directed graph we use arrow to denote the edges and the important thing is the edge set should be similar it will contain the source vertex that is 5 in this case and the destination vertex which is 6 in this case and this is never similar to 6 comma 5 you cannot represent this edge as 6 comma 5 because the direction always matters in the directed graph Similarly, you can say that 5 is adjacent to 6, but you cannot say that 6 is adjacent to 5. So for this graph, the vertices set would be similar as 5 comma 6 comma 7 comma 8, which was a similar in undirected graph. But in directed graph, your edge set should be your first of all, this one will be 5 comma 6. Then your second edge, which is this one, would be 5 comma 7. And at last your this set would be 7 comma 8. But in case of undirected graph, you can write this edge as 8 comma 7 or in case of undirected graph, you can write this one as 7 comma 5. But this is not the case with your directed graph. You have to follow the source vertex and the destination vertex to represent the edge. So I hope you guys are clear with the undirected and directed graph. Now let's talk about vertex label graph. Now in a vertex labeled graph each vertex is labeled with some data in addition to the data that identifies the vertex. So basically we say this 6 or this 5 as the vertex ID. So there will be data that would be added to this vertex. So let's say this vertex would be 6 comma and then we are adding the color. So it would be purple. Next this vertex would be 8 comma and the color would be green. Next we will say this as 7 comma red and then this one is as 5 comma blue. Now the 6 or this 5 or 7 or 8 these are vertex ID and the additional data which is attached is the color like blue, purple, green or red. But only the identifying data is present in the pair of edges or you can say only the ID of the vertex is present in the edge set. So here the edge set is again similar to your directed graph that is your source ID this which is 5 and then destination ID which is 6 in this case then for this case it's similar as 5 comma 7 then in for this case it's similar as 7 comma 8. So we are not specifying this additional data which is attached to the vertices that is the color we only specify the identifiers of the vertex that is the number but your vertex set would be something like this vertex would be 5 comma blue then your next vertex will become 6 comma purple then your next vertex will become 8 comma green and at last your last vertex will be written as 7 comma red so basically when you are specifying the vertices set in the vertex label graph you attach the additional information in the vertices set but while representing the edge set it is represented similarly as directed graph where you have to just specify the source vertex identifier and then you have to specify the destination vertex identifier now i hope that you guys are clear with undirected directed and vertex labeled graph so let's quickly move forward next we have cyclic graph so a cyclic graph is a directed graph with at least one cycle and the cycle is the path along with the directed edges from a vertex to itself. So once you see over here, you can see that from this vertex 5, 
it's moving to vertex 7 then it's moving to vertex 8 then with arrow it's moving to vertex 6 and then again it's moving to vertex 5 so there should be at least one cycle in a cyclic graph there might be a new component let's say vertex 9 which is attached over here again so it would be a cyclic graph because it has one complete cycle over here and the important thing to notice is that the arrows should make the cycle like from 5 to 7 and then from 7 to 8 and then 8 to 6 and 6 to 5 and let's say that there is an arrow from 5 to 6 and then there is an arrow from 6 to 8 so we have flipped the arrows so in that situation this is not a cyclic graph because the arrows are not completing the cycle so once you move from 5 to 7 and then from 7 to 8 you cannot move from 8 to 6 and similarly once you move from 5 to 6 and then 6 to 8 you cannot move from 8 to 7 so in that situation it's not a cyclic graph so let's clear all this thing so we'll represent this cycle as 5 then using double arrows we'll go to 7 and then we'll move to 8 and then we'll move to 6 and at last we'll come back to 5 now we have edge label graph so basically a edge label graph is a graph where the edges are associated with labels so one can basically indicate this by making the edge set as be a set of triplets so for example let's say this edge in this edge label graph will be denoted as the source which is 6 then the destination which is 7 and then the label of the edge which is blue so this edge would be defined something like 6 comma 7 comma blue and then for this edge similarly the source vertex that is 7 the destination vertex which is 8 then the label of the edge which is white next similarly for this edge it's 5 comma 7 and then blue comma red and at last for this edge it's 5 comma 6 and then it would be yellow comma green which is the label of the edge so all these four edges will become the edge set for this graph and the vertices set is almost similar that is 5 comma 6 comma 7 comma 8 now to generalize this i would say x comma y so x here is the source vertex then y here is the destination vertex and then a here is the label of the edge then edge label graph are usually drawn with the labels written adjacent to the arcs specifying the edges as you can see we have mentioned blue white and all those label adjacent to the edges so i hope you guys are clear with the edge label graph which is nothing but labels attached to each and every edge now let's talk about weighted graph so a weighted graph is an edge label graph basically where the labels can be operated on by usually arithmetic operators or comparison operators like less than or greater than symbol usually these are integers or floats and the idea is that some edges may be more expensive and this cost is represented by the edge labels or weights now in short weighted graphs are a special kind of edge label graphs where your edge is attached to a weight generally which is a integer or a float so that we can perform some addition or subtraction or different kind of arithmetic operations or it can be some kind of conditional operations like less than or greater than so we'll again represent this edge as 5 comma 6 and then the weight as 3 and similarly we'll represent this edge as 6 comma 7 and the weight is again 6 so similarly we'll represent these two edges as well so i hope that you guys are clear with the weighted graphs now let's quickly move ahead and look at this directed acyclic graph so this is a directed acyclic graph which is basically without cycles so as we just discussed in cyclic graphs here you can see that it is not completing the graph from the directions or you can say the direction of the edges right we can move from 5 to 7 then 7 to 8 but we cannot move from 8 to 6 and similarly we can move from 5 to 6 then 6 to 8 but we cannot move from 8 to 7 so this is not forming a cycle and these kind of graphs are known as directed acyclic graph now they appear as special cases in cs application all the time and the vertices set and the edge set are represented similarly as we have seen earlier now talking about the disconnected graph 
So vertices in a graph do not need to be connected to other vertices. It is basically legal for a graph to have disconnected components or even lone vertices without a single connection. So basically this disconnected graph which has four vertices but no edges. Now let me tell you something important that is what are sources and sinks. So let's say we have one arrow from five to six and one arrow from five to seven. Now vertices with only in arrows are called sink. So the seven and six are known as sinks and the vertices with only out arrows are called sources. So as you can see in the image this five only have out arrows to six and seven. So these are called sources. Now we'll talk about this in a while guys once we are going through the page rank algorithm. So I hope that you guys know what are vertices what are edges how vertices and edges represents the graph then what are different kinds of graph. Let's move to the next topic. So next let's know what is spark graphics. So talking about graphics graphics is a new component in spark for graphs and graph parallel computation. Now at a high level graphic extends the spark RDD by introducing a new graph abstraction that is a directed multigraph that is properties attached to each vertex and edge. Now to support graph computation graphx basically exposes a set of fundamental operators like finding subgraph or joining vertices or aggregating messages as well as it also exposes an optimized variant of the Pregel API. In addition graphx also provides you a collection of graph algorithms and builders to simplify your spark analytics task. So basically your graphx is extending your spark RDD. Then your graphx is providing an abstraction that is a directed multigraph with properties attached to each vertex and edge. So we'll look at this property graph in a while. Then again graphx gives you some fundamental operators and then it also provides you some graph algorithms and builders which makes your analytics easier. Now to get started you first need to import spark and graphx into your project. So as you can see we are importing first spark and then we are importing spark graphx to get those graphx functionalities and at last we are importing spark rdd to use those rdd functionalities in our program. But let me tell you that if you are not using spark shell then you will need a spark context in your program. So I hope that you guys are clear with the features of graphx and the libraries which you need to import in order to use graphx. So let us quickly move ahead and look at the property graph. Now property graph is something as the name suggests property graph have properties attached to each vertex and edge. So the property graph is a directed multigraph with user defined objects attached to each vertex and edge. Now you might be wondering what is a directed multigraph. So a directed multigraph is a directed graph with potentially multiple parallel edges sharing the same source and same destination vertex. So as you can see in the image that from San Francisco to Los Angeles we have two edges and similarly from Los Angeles to Chicago there are two edges. So basically in a directed multigraph the first thing is the directed graph. So it should have a direction attached to the edges. And then talking about multigraph so between source vertex and a destination vertex there could be two edges. So the ability to support parallel edges basically simplifies the modeling scenarios where there can be multiple relationships between the same vertices. For an example let's say these are two persons so they can be friends as well as they can be co-workers right. So these kind of scenarios can be easily modeled using directed multigraph. Now each vertex is keyed by a unique 64 bit long identifier which is basically the vertex ID and it helps in indexing. So each of your vertex contains a vertex ID which is a unique 64 bit long identifier and similarly edges have corresponding source and destination vertex identifiers. So this edge would have this vertex identifier as well as this vertex identifier or you can say a source vertex ID and the destination vertex ID. So as we discussed this property graph is basically parameterized over the vertex and edge types and these are the types of object associated with each vertex and edge.
so your graph x basically optimizes the representation of vertex and edge types and it reduces the in-memory footprint by storing the primitive data types in a specialized array now in some cases it might be desirable to have vertices with different property types in the same graph now this can be accomplished through inheritance so for an example to model a user and product in a bipartite graph or you can see that we have user property and we have product property okay so let me first tell you what is a bipartite graph so a bipartite graph is also called a bigraph which is a set of graph vertices decomposed into two disjoint sets such that no two graph vertices within the same set are adjacent so as you can see over here we have user property and then we have product property but no two user property can be adjacent or you can say there should be no edges that is joining any of the two user property or there should be no edge that should be joining product property so in this scenario we use inheritance so as you can see here we have class vertex property now basically what we are doing we are creating another class with user property and here we have name which is again a string and we are extending or you can say we are inheriting the vertex property class now again in the case of product property we have name that is name of the product which is again string and then we have price of the product which is double and we are again extending this vertex property graph and at last we are creating a graph with this vertex property and then string so this is how we can basically model user and product as a bipartite graph so we have created user property as well as we have created this product property and we are extending this vertex property class now talking about this property graph it's similar to your rdd so like your rdd property graph are immutable distributed and fault tolerant so changes to the values or structure of the graph are basically accomplished by producing a new graph with the desired changes and the substantial part of the original graph which can be your structure of the graph or attributes or indices these are basically reused in the new graph reducing the cost of inherent functional data structure so basically your property graph once you are trying to change values or structure so it creates a new graph with a changed structure or changed values and your substantial part of original graph are reused multiple times to improve the performance and it can be your structure of the graph which is getting reused or it can be your attributes or indices of the graph which is getting reused so this is how your property graph provides efficiency now the graph is partitioned across the executors using a range of vertex partitioning rules which are basically loosely defined and similar to rdd each partition of the graph can be recreated on different machines in the event of failure so this is how your property graph provides fault tolerance so as we already discussed logically the property graph corresponds to a pair of typed collections encoding the properties for each vertex and edge and as a consequence the graph class contains members to access the vertices and the edges so as you can see we have graph class then you can see we have vertices and we have edges now this vertex rdd vd is extending your rdd which is your rdd and then your vertex id and then your vertex property similarly your edge rdd is extending your rdd with your edge property so the classes that is vertex rdd and edge rdd extends and are optimized version of your rdd which includes vertex id and vertex property and your rdd which includes your edge property and both this vertex rdd and edge rdd provides additional functionality built on top of graph computation and leverages internal optimizations as well so this is the reason we use this vertex rdd or edge rdd because it already extends your rdd containing your vertex id and vertex property or your edge property it also provides you additional functionalities built on top of graph computation and again it gives you some internal optimizations as well now let me clear this and let's take an example of property graph 
where the vertex property might contain the username and occupation so as you can see in this table that we have id of the vertex and then we have property attached to each vertex that is the username as well as the occupation of the user or you can see the profession of the user and we can annotate the edges with the string describing the relationship between the users so so as you can see first is thomas who is a professor then second is frank who is also a professor then as you can see third is jenny she's a student and fourth is bob who is a doctor now thomas is a colleague of frank then you can see that thomas is a academic advisor of jenny again frank is also a academic advisor of jenny and then the doctor is the health advisor of jenny so the resulting graph would have a signature of something like this so i'll explain this in a while so there are numerous ways to construct a property graph from raw files or rdds or even synthetic generators and we'll discuss it in graph builders but the very probable and most general method is to use graph object so let's take a look at the code first so first over here we are assuming that spa context has already been constructed then we are giving the scs spa context next we are creating an rdd for the vertices so as you can see for users we have specified rdd and then vertex id and then these are two strings so first one would be your username and the second one would be your profession then we are using sc parallelize and we are creating an array where we are specifying all the vertices so one l that is this one and we are giving the name as thomas and the profession is professor similarly for 2l frank professor then 3l jenny she is student then 4l bob doctor so here we have created the vertex next we are creating an rdd for edges so first we are giving the value as relationship then we are creating an rdd with edge string and then we are using sc parallelize to create the edge and in the array we are specifying the source vertex then we are specifying the destination vertex and then we are giving the relation that is colleague similarly for next edge the source is one then the destination is one and then the profession is academic advisor and then it goes so on so in this line we are defining a default user in case there is a relationship between missing users now we have given the name as default user and the profession is missing next we are trying to build the initial graph so for that we are using this graph object so we have specified users that is your vertices then we are specifying the relations that is your edges and then we are giving the default user which is basically for any missing user so now as you can see over here we are using edge case class and edges have a source id and a destination id which is basically corresponding to your source and destination vertex and in addition to the edge class we have an attribute member which stores the edge property which is the relation over here that is colleague or it is academic advisor or it is health advisor and so on so i hope that you guys are clear about creating a property graph how to specify the vertices how to specify edges and then how to create a graph now we can deconstruct a graph into respective vertex and edge views by using a graph.vertices and graph.edges members so as you can see we are using graph.vertices over here and graph.edges over here now what we are trying to do so first over here the graph which we have created earlier so we have graph.vertices.filter now using this case class we have this vertex id we have the name and then we have the position and we are specifying the position as doctor so first we are trying to filter the profession of the user as doctor and then we are trying to count it next we are specifying graph.edges.filter and we are basically trying to filter the edges where the source id is greater than your destination id and then we are trying to count those edges we are using a scala case expression as you can see to deconstruct the tuple or you can say to deconstruct the result on the other hand graph.edges returns a edge rdd which is containing edge string object so we could also have used the case class type constructor as you can see here so again over here we are using graph.edge.filter and over here we have given case 
edge and then we are specifying the property that is source destination and then property of the edge which is attached and then we are filtering it and then we are trying to count it so this is how using edge class either you can see with edges or you can see with vertices this is how you can go ahead and deconstruct them right because your graph dot vertices or your edge dot vertices returns a vertex rdd or a edge rdd so to deconstruct them we basically use this case class so i hope you guys are clear about transforming property graph and how to use this case class to deconstruct the vertex rdd or edge rdd so now let's quickly move ahead now in addition to the vertex and edge views of the property graph graphx also exposes a triplet view now you might be wondering what is a triplet view so the triplet view logically joins the vertex and edge properties yielding an rdd edge triplet with vertex property and your edge property so as you can see it gives an rdd with edge triplet and then it has vertex property as well as edge property associated with it and it contains an instance of edge triplet class now i'm taking an example of a join so in this join we are trying to select source id destination id source attribute then this is your edge attribute and then at last you have destination attribute so basically your edges has alias e then your vertices has alias as source and again your vertices has alias as destination so we are trying to select source id destination id then source attribute and destination attribute and we are also selecting the edge attribute and we are performing left join the edge source id should be equal to source id and the edge destination id should be equal to destination id and now your edge triplet class basically extends your edge class by adding your source attribute and destination attribute members which contains the source and destination properties and we can use the triplet view of a graph to render a collection of strings describing relationship between users so this is vertex 1 which is again denoting your user 1 that is thomas and who is a professor then this is vertex 3 which is denoting your jenny and she is a student and this is your edge which is defining the relationship between them so this is a edge triplet which is denoting the both vertex as well as the edge which denote the relation between them so now looking at this code first we have already created the graph then we are taking this graph we are finding the triplets and then we are mapping each triplet we are trying to find out the triplet dot source attribute in which we are picking up the username then over here we are trying to pick up the triplet attribute which is nothing but the edge attribute which is your academic advisor then we are trying to pick up the triplet destination attribute it will again pick up the username of destination attribute which is the username of this vertex 3 so for an example in this situation it will print thomas is the academic advisor of jenny so then we are trying to take this facts we are collecting the facts using this for each we are printing each of the triplet that is present in this graph so i hope that you guys are clear with the concepts of triplet So now let's quickly take a look at graph builders. So as I already told you that GraphX provides several ways of building a graph from a collection of vertices and edges. Either it can be stored in RDD or it can be stored on disks. So in this graph object, first we have this apply method. So basically, this apply method allows creating a graph from RDD of vertices and edges, and duplicate vertices are picked up arbitrarily. and the vertices which are found in the edge rdd and are not present in the vertices rdd are assigned the default attribute so in this apply method first we are providing the vertex rdd then we are providing the edge rdd and then we are providing the default vertex attribute so it will create the vertex which we have specified then it will create the edges which are specified and if there is a vertex which is being referred by the edge but it is not present in this vertex rdd so what it does it creates that vertex and assigns them the value of this default vertex attribute next we have from edges so graph dot from edges allows creating a graph only from the rdd of edges which automatically creates any vertices mentioned in the edges and assigns them the default value 
so what happens over here you provide the edge rdd and all the vertices that are present in the edge rdd are automatically created and a default value is assigned to each of those vertices so graph dot from edges tuples basically allows creating a graph from only the rdd of edge tuples and it assigns the edges as value one and again the vertices which are specified by the edges are automatically created and the default value which we are specifying over here will be allocated to them so basically your from edge tuple supports deduplicating of edges which means you can remove the duplicate edges but for that you have to provide a partition strategy in the unique edges parameter as it is necessary to co-locate the identical edges on the same partition duplicate edges can be removed so moving ahead none of the graph builders repartitions the graph edges by default instead edges are left in their default partitions so as you can see we have a graph loader object which is basically used to load the graph from the file system so graph.group edges requires the graph to be repartitioned because it assumes that identical edges will be co-located on the same partition and so you must call graph.partition by before calling group edges so so now you can see the edge list file method over here which provides a way to load a graph from the list of edges which is present on the disk and it parses the adjacency list that is your source vertex id and the destination vertex id pairs and it creates a graph so now for an example let's say we have two and one which is one edge then you have four one which is another edge and then you have one two which is another edge so it will load these edges and then it will create the graph so it will create two then it will create four and then it will create one and for two one it will create the edge and then four one it will create the edge and at last it will create an edge for one and two so it will create a graph something like this it creates a graph from specified edges where automatically vertices are created which are mentioned by the edges and all the vertex and edge attribute are set by default one and as well as one will be associated with all the vertices so it would be four comma one then again for this it would be one comma one and similarly it would be two comma one for this vertex now let's go back to the code so then we have this canonical orientation so this argument allows reorienting edges in the positive direction that is from the lower source id to the higher destination id now which is basically required by your connected components algorithm we'll talk about this algorithm in a while guys but before this this basically helps in reorienting your edges which means your source vertex should always be less than your destination vertex so in that situation it might reorient this edge so it will reorient this edge and basically it will reverse the direction of the edge similarly over here so with the vertex which is coming from 2 to 1 will be reoriented and will be again reversed now then talking about the minimum edge partition this minimum edge partition basically specifies the minimum number of edge partitions to generate but there might be more edge partitions than specified so let's say the hdfs file has more blocks so obviously more partitions will be created but this will give you the minimum edge partitions that should be created so i hope that you guys are clear with this graph loader how this graph loader works how we can go ahead and provide the edge list file and how it will create the graph from this edge list file and then this canonical orientation where we are again going and reorienting the graph and then we have minimum edge partition which is giving the minimum number of edge partitions that should be created so now i guess you guys are clear with the graph builder so how to go ahead and use this graph object and how to create graph using apply from edges and from edge tuples method and then i guess you might be clear with the graph loader object and where you can go ahead and create a graph from edge list now let's move ahead and talk about vertex and edge rdd so as i already told you that graphx exposes rdd views of the vertices and edges stored within the graph and however because graphx again maintains the vertices and edges in optimized data structure 
and these data structure provide additional functionalities as well now let us see some of the additional functionalities which are provided by them so let's first talk about vertex rdd so i already told you that vertex rdd is basically extending this rdd with vertex id and the vertex property and it adds an additional constraint that each vertex id occurs only once now moreover a vertex rdd a represents a set of vertices each with an attribute of type a now internally what happens this is achieved by storing the vertex attribute in an reusable hash map data structure so uh, suppose this is our hash map data structure so suppose if two vertex rdd are derived from the same base vertex rdd uh, suppose uh, these are two vertex rdd which are basically derived from this vertex rdd so they can be joined in constant time without hash evaluations so you don't have to go ahead and evaluate the properties of both the vertices you can easily go ahead and you can join them without the evaluations and this is one of the way in which this vertex rdd provides you the optimization now to leverage this indexed data structure the vertex rdd exposes multiple additional functionalities so it gives you all these functions as you can see here it gives you filter map values then minus difference left join inner join and aggregate using index functions so let us first discuss about these functions so basically a filter function filters the vertex set but preserves the internal index so based on some condition it filters the vertices that are present then in map values it is basically used to transform the values without changing the ids and which again uh, preserves your internal index so it does not change the id of the vertices and it helps in transforming those values now talking about the minus method it shows only vertices unique in the set based on their vertex ids so what happens if you are providing two set of vertices first contains v1 v2 and v3 and second one contains v3 so it will return v1 and v2 because they are unique in both the sets and it is basically done with the help of vertex id so next we have diff function so it basically removes the vertices from this set that appears in another set then we have left join and inner join so join operators basically take advantage of the internal indexing to accelerate join so you can go ahead and you can perform left join or you can perform inner join next you have aggregate using index so basically this aggregate using index is nothing but reduced by key but it uses index on this rdd to accelerate the reduce by key function or you can say reduce by key operation so again filter is actually implemented using bit set and thereby reusing the index and preserving the ability to do fast joins with other vertex rdd now similarly the map values operator as well do not allow the map function to change the vertex id and this again helps in reusing the same hash map data structure now both of your left join as well as your inner join is able to identify that whether the two vertex rdd which are joining are derived from the same hash map or not and for this they basically use linear scan they again don't have to go ahead and search for costly point lookups so this is the benefit of using vertex rdd so to summarize your vertex rdd uses hash map data structure which is again reusable they try to preserve your indexes so that it would be easier to create a new vertex rdd or derive a new vertex rdd from them then again while performing some joining operations it is pretty much easy to go ahead perform a linear scan and then you can go ahead and join those two vertex rdd so it actually helps in optimizing your performance now moving ahead let's talk about edge rdd now again as you can see your edge rdd is extending your rdd with property edge now it organizes the edge in block partition using one of the various partitioning strategies uh, which is again defined in your partition strategies attribute or you can say partition strategy parameter within each partition each attribute and adjacency structure 
are stored separately, which enables the maximum reuse when changing the attribute values. So basically what it does while storing your edge attributes and your uh, source vertex and destination vertex they are stored separately so that changing the values of the attributes either of the source vertex or destination vertex or edge attribute so that it can be reused as many times as we need by changing the attribute values itself. So that once the uh, vertex ID is changed of an edge it could be easily changed and the earlier part can be reused. Now as you can see we have three additional functions over here that is map values reverse and inner join. So in edge RDD basically map values is to transform the edge attributes while preserving the structure. It is helpful in transforming so you can use map values and map the values of your edge RDD. Then you can go ahead and use this reverse function which reverse the edge reusing both attribute and structure. So the source becomes destination or destination becomes source. Now talking about this inner join so it basically joins two edge RDDs partitioned using the same partitioning strategy. Now as we already discussed that same partition strategy is required because again to co-locate you need to use same partition strategy and your identical vertex should reside in same partition to perform join operation over them. Now let me quickly give you an idea about optimization performed in this graphics. So GraphX basically adopts a vertex cut approach to distribute graph partitioning. So suppose you have five vertex and then they are connected. Let's not worry about the arrows right now or let's not worry about the direction right now. So either it can be divided from the edges which is one approach or again it can be divided from the vertex. So in that situation it would be divided something like this. So rather than splitting graphs along edges, graphics partitions the graph along vertices, which can again reduce the communication and storage overhead. So logically, what happens that your edges are assigned to machines and allowing your vertices to span multiple machines. So your vertices is basically divided into multiple machines and your edges is assigned to a single machine, right? Then the exact method of assigning edges depends on the partition strategy. So uh, the partition strategy is the one which basically decides how to assign the edges to different machines or you can say different partitions. So user can choose between different strategies by partitioning the graph with the help of this graph dot partition by operator. Now uh, as we discussed that this graph dot partition by operator repartitions and then it divides or reallocates the uh, edges and basically we try to put the identical edges uh, on a single partition so that different operations like join can be performed on them. So once the edges have been partitioned the main challenge is efficiently joining the vertex attributes with the edges right now because real world graphs typically have more edges than vertices. So we move vertex attributes to the edges. And because not all the partitions will contain edges adjacent to all vertices, we internally maintain a routing table. So the routing table is the one who will broadcast the vertices and then will implement the join required for the operations. So I hope that you guys are clear how vertex RDD and edge RDD works and then how the optimizations take place and how vertex cut optimizes the operations in graphics. Now let's talk about graph operators. So just as RDD have basic operations like map, filter, reduce by key, property graph also have collection of basic operators that take user defined functions and produce new graphs with transform properties and structure. Now the core operators that have optimized implementation are basically defined in graph class and convenient operators that are expressed as a composition of the core operators are basically defined in your graph ops class. But in Scala, it implicits the operators in graph ops class. They are automatically available as a member of graph class. So you can use them using the graph class as well. Now, as you can see, we have a list of operators like property operator. Then you have structural operator. Then you have join operator and then you have something called neighborhood operator. So let's talk about them one by one. 
Now talking about property operators like RDD has map operator. The property graph contains map vertices map edges and map triplets operators, right? Now each of this operator basically yields a new graph with the vertex or edge property modified by the user defined map function based on the user defined map function. It basically transforms or modifies the vertices if it's map vertices or it transform or modify the edges if it is map edges method or map edges operator and so on for map triplets as well. Now the important thing to note is that in each case the graph structure is unaffected and this is a key feature of these operators basically which allows the resulting graph to reuse the structural indices of the original graph each and every time you apply a transformation. So it creates a new graph and the original graph is unaffected so that it can be used so you can say it can be reused in creating new graphs right so uh, your structural indices can be used from the original graph now talking about this map vertices let me use the highlighter so first we have map vertices so it maps the vertices or you can say transform the vertices so you provide vertex id and then vertex property and you apply some of the transformation function using which so it will give you a graph with new vertex property as you can see now same is the case with map edges so again you provide uh, the edges then you transform the edges so initially it was ed and then you transform it to ed2 and then the graph which is given or uh, you can say the graph which is returned is the the graph with a changed edge attribute so you can see here the attribute is ed2 same is the case with map triplets so using map triplets you can use the edge triplet where you can go ahead and target the vertex properties or you can say vertex attributes or to be more specific source vertex attribute as well as destination vertex attribute and the edge attribute and then you can apply transformation over those source attributes or destination attributes or the edge attributes so you can change them and then it will again return a graph with the transformed values. Now I guess uh, you guys are clear with the property operator. So let's move to the next operator that is structural operator. So currently GraphX supports only a simple set of commonly used structural operators and we expect more to be added in future. Now you can see in structural operator we have reverse operator then we have subgraph operator then we have mask operator and then we have group edges operator. So let's talk about them one by one. So first reverse operator. So as the name suggests it returns a new graph with all the edge directions reversed. So basically it will change your source vertex into destination vertex and then it will change your destination vertex into source vertex. So it will reverse the direction of your edges and the reverse operation does not modify vertex or edge properties or change the number of edges. It can be implemented efficiently without data movement or duplication. So next we have subgraph operator. So basically subgraph operator takes the vertex and edge predicates or you can say vertex or edge condition and returns the graph containing only the vertex that satisfy those vertex predicates and then it returns the edges that satisfy the edge predicates. So basically you will give a condition about edges and vertices and those predicates which are fulfilled or those vertex which are fulfilling the predicates will be only returned and again same is the case with your edges and then your graph will be connected. Now the subgraph operator can be used in number of situations to restrict the graph to the vertices and edges of interest and eliminate the rest of the components right. So as you can see this is the edge predicate this is the vertex predicate then we are providing the edge triplet with the uh, vertex and edge attributes and uh, we are waiting for the boolean value then same is the case with vertex. We are providing the vertex properties over here or you can say vertex attribute over here and then again it will yield a graph which is a subgraph of the original graph which will fulfill those predicates. Now the next operator is mask operator. So mask operator construct a subgraph by returning a graph that contains the vertices and edges that are also found in the input graph. Basically you can uh, treat this mask operator as a comparison between two graphs. So uh, suppose uh, we are comparing uh, graph 1 and graph 2 and it will return the subgraph which is common in both the graphs. Again this can be used in conjunction with the subgraph operator basically to restrict a graph based on properties in another related graph right. So I guess you guys are clear with the mask operator. So over here we're providing a graph and then we are providing the input graph as well and then it will return a graph which is basically a subset of both of these graph. Now talking about group edges. 
so the group edges operator merges the parallel edges in the multigraph right so what it does it the duplicate edges between pair of vertices are merged or you can say are can be aggregated or perform some action and in many numerical application parallel edges can be added and their weights can be combined into a single edge right which will again reduce the size of the graph so for an example you have two vertex uh, v1 and v2 and there are two edges with weight 10 and 15 so actually what you can do you can merge those two edges if they have same direction and you can represent the weight with 25 so this will actually reduce the size of the graph now uh, looking at the next operator which is join operator so in many cases it is necessary to join data from external collection with graphs right for example uh, we might have an extra user property uh, that we want to merge with the existing graph or we might want to pull vertex property from one graph to another right so these are some of the situations where you go ahead and use this join operators so now as you can see over here the first operator is join vertices so the join vertices operator joins the vertices with the input rdd and returns a new graph with the vertex properties obtained after applying the user defined map function now the vertices without a matching value in the rdd basically retains their original value now talking about outer join vertices so it behaves similar to join vertices except that the user defined map function is applied to all the vertices and can change the vertex property type so suppose that you have a old graph which has a vertex attribute as old price and then you created a new graph from it and then it has the vertex attribute as new price so you can go ahead and join two of these graphs and you can perform an aggregation of both the old and new prices in the new graph so in this kind of situation join vertices are used now moving ahead let's talk about neighborhood aggregation now key step in many graph analytics is aggregating the information about the neighborhood of each vertex for an example we might want to know the number of followers each user has or the average age of the follower of each user now many iterative graph algorithms like page rank shortest path then connected components repeatedly aggregate the properties of neighboring vertices now it has four operators in neighborhood aggregation so the first one is your aggregate messages so the core aggregation operation in graphics is aggregate messages now this operator applies a user defined send message function as you can see over here to each of the edge triplet in the graph and then it uses merge message function to aggregate those messages at the destination vertex now the user defined send message function takes an edge context as you can see and which exposes the source and destination attributes along with the edge attribute and functions like send to source or send to destination is used to send messages to source and destination attributes now you can think of send message as the map function in map reduce and the user defined merge function which actually takes the two messages which are present on the same vertex or you can see the same destination vertex and it again combines or aggregate those messages and produces a single message now you can think of the merge message as reduce function in the map reduce now the aggregate messages operator returns a vertex rdd basically it contains the aggregated messages at each of the destination vertex and vertices that did not receive a message are not included in the returned vertex rdd so only those vertex are returned which actually have received the message and then those messages have been merged if any vertex which haven't received the message will not be included in the returned rdd or you can say a return vertex rdd now in addition as you can see we have a triplet fields so aggregate messages takes an optional triplet fields which indicates what data is accessed in the edge content so the possible options for the triplet fields are defined in triplet fields the default value of triplet fields is triplet fields dot all as you can see over here this basically indicates that user defined send message function may access any of the fields in the edge content so this triplet field argument can be used to notify graphics that only these part of the edge content will be needed which basically allows graphics to select the optimized joining strategy so i hope that you guys are clear with the aggregate messages let's quickly move ahead and look at the second operator so the second operator is map reduce triplet transition 
Now in earlier versions of Graphx, neighborhood aggregation was accomplished using the map reduce triplets operator. This map reduce triplet operator is used in older versions of Graphx. This operator takes the user defined map function which is applied to each triplet and can yield messages which are aggregating using the user defined reduce functions. This one is the user defined map function and this one is your user defined reduce function. So it basically uh, applies the map function to all the triplets and then they aggregate those messages using this user defined reduce function. Now the newer version of this map reduce triplet operator is the aggregate messages. Now moving ahead, let's talk about computing degree information operator. So one of the common aggregation task is computing the degree of each vertex. That is the number of edges adjacent to each vertex. Now in the context of directed graph, it is often necessary to know the in degree out degree then the total degree of vertex these kind of things are pretty much important and the graph ops class contain a collection of operators to compute the degrees of each vertex so as you can see we have maximum input degree then maximum output degree then maximum degrees maximum in degree will tell us the number of maximum incoming edges then max out degree will tell us maximum number of output edges and this max degree will actually tell tell us the number of input as well as output edges now moving ahead to next operator that is collecting neighbors in some cases it may be easier to express the computation by collecting neighboring vertices and their attribute at each vertex now this can be easily accomplished using the collect neighbors id and the collect neighbors operator so basically your collect neighbor id takes the edge direction as the parameter and it returns a vertex rdd that contains the array of vertex id that is neighboring to the particular vertex now similarly the collection neighbors again takes the edge directions as the input and it will return you the array with the vertex id and the vertex attribute both now let me quickly open my vm and let us go through the spark directory first let me first open my terminal so first i'll start the hadoop demons so for that i'll go to hadoop home directory then inside has been well start or dot asset script file so let me check if the hadoop demons are running or not so as you can see that name node data node secondary name node the node manager and resource manager all the demons of hadoop are up now i'll navigate to spark home let me first start the spark demons Now as the spark demons are running, I'll first minimize this and let me take you to the spark home. And this is my spark directory. So I'll go inside. Now let me first show you the data which is by default present with your spark. So we'll open this in a new tab. So you can see we have two files in this graphics data directory. Meanwhile, let me take you to the example codes. So this is example and inside source main scalar. You can find the graphics directory and inside this graphics directory you have some of the sample codes which are present over here. So I'll take you to this aggregate messages example dot scalar. Now meanwhile, let me open the data as well. So you'll be able to understand. Now this is followers.txt file. So basically you can imagine these are the edges which are representing the vertex. So this is vertex 2 and this is vertex 1. Then this is vertex 4 and this is vertex 1. And similarly so on. These are representing those vertex. And if you can remember I have already told you that inside graph loader class there is a function called edge list file which takes the edges from a file and then it constructs the graph based on that. Now second you have this user.txt. So these are basically the edges with the vertex ID. So vertex ID for this vertex is one then for this is two and so on. And then this is the data which is attached or you can say the attribute of the edges. So these are the vertex ID which is one, two, three respectively. And this is the data which is associated with your each vertex. So uh, this is username and this might be the name of your user and so on. 
now you can also see that in some of the cases the name of the user is missing so as in this case the name of the user is missing these are the vertices or you can say the vertex id and vertex attributes now let me take you through this aggregate messages example so as you can see we are giving the name of the package as org apache spark examples dot graphics then we are importing graphics in that we are importing graph class as well as this vertex rdd next we are using this graph generator i'll tell you why we are using this graph generator and then we are using the spark session over here so this is an example where we are using the aggregate messages operator to compute the average age of the more senior followers of each user okay so this is the object of aggregate messages example now this is the main function where we are first initializing the spark session then the name of the application so you have to provide the name of the application and this is get or create method now next you are initializing the spark context as sc now coming to the code so we are specifying a graph then this graph is containing double and end now i just told you that we are importing graph generator so this graph generator is to generate a random graph for simplicity so you would have multiple number of edges and vertices then you are using this log normal graph you are passing the spark context and you are specifying the number of vertices as 100 so it will generate 100 vertices for you then what you are doing you are specifying the map vertices and you are trying to map id to double so what this would do this will basically map your id to double then in next you are trying to calculate the older followers where you have given it as vertex rdd and the input is int and double so your vertex rdd has int as your vertex id and your data is double which is associated with each of the vertex or you can say the vertex attribute so you have this graph which is basically generated randomly and then you are performing aggregate messages so this is the aggregate messages operator now if you can remember we first have the send messages right so inside this triplet we are specifying a function that if the source attribute of the triplet is more than the destination attribute of the triplet so basically it will return if the followers age is greater than the age of person whom he is following this tells the followers age is greater than the age of whom he is following so in that situation it will send message to the destination with vertex containing counter that is 1 and the age of the uh, source attribute that is the age of the follower so first so you can see the age of the destination is less than the age of source attribute so it will tell you if the follower is older than the user or not so in that situation we'll send one to the destination and we'll send the age of the source or you can say the age of the follower then second i have told you that we have merge messages so here we are adding the counter and the age in this reduce function so now what we are doing we are dividing the total age of the number of older followers to get an average age of older followers so this is the reason why we have passed the attribute of source vertex first we we are specifying this variable that is average age of older followers and then we are specifying the vertex rdd so this will be double and then this older followers that is the graph which we are picking up from here and then we are trying to map the value so in the vertex we have id and we have value so in this situation we are using this case class about count and total age so what we are doing we are taking this total age and we are dividing it by count which we have gathered from this send message and then we have aggregated using this reduce function we are again taking the total age of the older followers and then we are trying to divide it by count to get the average age and at last we are trying to display the result and then we are stopping this spark so let me quickly open the terminal so i'll go to examples so inside the examples i took you through the source directory where the code is present inside scala and then inside there is a spark directory where you will find the code but to execute the example you need to go to the jars directory now this is the scala example jar which you need to execute but before this let me take you to the sdfs so the url is localhost colon 50070 and we'll go to utilities 
then we'll go to browse the file system so as you can see i have created a user directory in which i have specified the username that is edureka and inside edureka i have placed my data directory where we have this graphics and inside the graphics we have both the file that is followers.txt and users.txt so in this program we are not referring to these files but in coming examples we will be referring to these files so i would request you to first move it to this hdfs directory so that spark can refer the files in data graphics now let me quickly minimize this and the command to execute is spark hyphen submit and then i'll pass this charge parameter and i'll provide this spark example jar so this is the jar then i'll specify the class name so to get the class name i'll go to the code i'll first take the package name from here and then i'll take the class name which is aggregate messages example so this is my class and as i told you i have to provide the name of the application so let me keep it as example and i'll hit enter so now you can see the result so this is the followers and this is the average age of followers so it is 34 then we have 52 which is the count of follower and the average age is 76.8 that is it has 96 senior followers and then the average age of the followers is 99.0 then it has four senior followers and the average age is 51 then this vertex has 16 senior followers with the average age of 57.55 and so on you can see the result over here so i hope now you guys are clear with aggregate messages how to use aggregate messages how to specify the send message then how to write the merge message so let's quickly go back to the presentation now let us quickly move ahead and look at some of the graph algorithms so the first one is page rank so page rank measures the importance of each vertex in a graph assuming that an edge from u to v represents an recommendation or support of v's importance by u for an example let's say if a twitter user is followed by many others user will obviously ranked high graphics comes with the static and dynamic implementation of page rank as methods on page rank object and static page rank runs a fixed number of iterations which can be specified by you while the dynamic page rank runs until the ranks converge what we mean by that is it stop changing by more than a specified tolerance so it runs until it have optimized the page rank of each of the vertices now graph ops class allows calling these algorithms directly as methods on graph class now let's quickly go back to the vm so this is the page rank example let me open this file so first we are specifying this graphics package then we are importing the graph loader so as you can remember inside this graph loader class we have that edge list file operator which will basically create the graph using the edges and we have those edges in our followers.txt file now coming back to page rank example now we're importing the spark sql spark session now this is page rank example object and inside which we have created a main class and we have similarly created the spark session then builder then we are specifying the app name which is to be provided then we have get our create method so this is where we are initializing the spark context as you can remember i told you that using this edge list file method we are basically creating the graph from the followers.txt file now we are running the page rank over here so in rank it will give you all the page rank of the vertices that is inside this graph which we have just loaded using graph loader class so if you are passing an integer as an argument to the page rank it will run that number iterations otherwise if you are passing a double value it will run until the convergence so we are running page rank on this graph and we have passed the vertices now after this we are trying to load the users.txt file and then we are trying to split the line by comma then the field 0 to long and we are storing the field 1 so basically field 0 
in your user txt is your vertex id or you can say the id of the user and field one is your username so we are trying to load these two fields now we are trying to rank by username so we are taking the users and we are joining the ranks so this is where we are using the join operation so ranks by username we are trying to attach those username or put those username with the page rank value so we are taking the users then we are joining the ranks which is again we are getting from this page rank and then we are mapping the id username and rank So it will take some time run some iterations over the graph and we'll try to converge it So after converging you can see the user and the rank so the maximum rank is with Barack Obama which is 1.45 Then with Lady Gaga, it's 1.39 and then with Odyssey and so on. Let's go back to the slide so now after page rank let's quickly move ahead to connected components the connected components algorithm labels each connected component of the graph with the id of its lowest numbered vertex so let's quickly go back to the vm now let's go inside the graphics directory and now we'll open this connect components example so again it's the same we're importing graph loader and spark session now this is the connect components example object next this is the main function and inside the main function we are again specifying all those spark session then app name then we have spark context so it's similar so again using this graph loader class and using this edge list file we are loading the followers.txt file now in this graph we are using this connected components algorithm and then we are trying to find the connected components now at last we are trying to again load this user file that is users.txt and we are trying to join the connected components with the username so over here it is also the same thing which we have discussed in page rank which is taking the field 0 and field 1 of your user.txt file and at last we are joining this users and at last we are trying to join this users to connect component that is from here now we are printing the cc by username collect so let us quickly go ahead and execute this example as well so let me first copy this object name let's name this as example 2 So as you can see Justin Bieber has one connected component then uh, you can see this has three connected component then this has one connected component then Barack Obama has one connected component and so on so this basically gives you an idea about the connected components now let's quickly move back to the slide we'll discuss about the third algorithm that is triangle counting so basically a vertex is a part of a triangle when it has two adjacent vertices with an edge between them so it will form a triangle right and then that vertex is a part of a triangle now graphx implements a triangle counting algorithm in the triangle count object now that determines the number of triangles passing through each vertex providing a measure of clustering so we can compute the triangle count of the social network data set from the page rank section one more thing to note is that triangle count requires the edges to be in a canonical orientation that is your source id should always be less than your destination id and the graph to be partitioned using graph dot partition by method now let's quickly go back so let me open the graphics directory again and we'll see the triangle counting example so again it's the same and the object is triangle counting example then the main function is same as well now we are again using this graph loader class and we are loading the followers.txt which contains the edges as you can see here we are using this partition by argument and we are passing the random vertex cut which is the partition strategy so this is how you can go ahead and you can implement a partition strategy 
we are loading the edges in canonical order and partitioning the graph for triangle count now we are trying to find out the triangle count for each vertex so we have this tri count variable and then we are using this triangle count algorithm and then we are specifying the vertices so it will execute triangle count over this graph which we have just loaded from followers.txt file and again we are basically joining usernames so first we are taking the usernames so again here we are performing the join between users and try counts so try counts is from here and then we are again printing the value from here so again this is the same let us quickly go ahead and execute this triangle counting example so let me copy this i'll go back to the terminal i'll name it as example 3 and change the class name and i'll hit enter So now you can see the triangle associated with Justin Bieber is 0, then Barack Obama is 1, with Odorsky it's 1, and with Jerisic it's 1. So for better understanding, I would recommend you to go ahead and take this followers.txt and you can create a graph by yourself and then you can attach these usernames with them and then you will get an idea about why it is giving the number as 1 or 0. So again the graph which is connecting 1, 2 and 4 is disconnect and it is not completing any triangles. So the value of these three are 0. And next your second graph which is uh, connecting your vertex 3, 6 and 7 is completing one triangle. So, so that's the reason why these three vertices have values 1. Now let me quickly go back. So now I hope that you guys are clear with all the concepts of graph operators then graph algorithms. So now is the right time and let us look at a Spark GraphX demo where we'll go ahead and we'll try to analyze the Ford score bike data. So let me quickly go back to my VM. So let me first show you the website where you can go ahead and download the Ford score bike data. So over here you can go to download the Ford bikes trip history data. So you can go ahead and download this 2017 Ford's trip data. So I have already downloaded it. So to avoid the typos I have already written all the commands. So first let me go ahead and start the spark shell. So I'm inside the spark shell. Now let me first import GraphX and Spark RDD. So I have successfully imported GraphX and Spark RDD. Now let me create a Spark SQL context as well. So I have successfully created this Spark SQL context. So this is basically for running SQL queries over the data frames. Now let me go ahead and import the data. So I am loading the data in data frame. So the format of file is CSV then an option the header is already added. So that's why it's true. Then it will automatically infer the schema and then in the load parameter I have specified the path of the file. So I'll quickly hit enter. So the data is loaded in the data frame to check I'll use df.count. So it will give me the count. So you can see it has 5,19,700 rows. Now let me quickly go back and I'll print this schema. So this is the schema, the duration in second, then we have the start time, end time, then you have start station ID, then you have start station name, then you have start station latitude, longitude, then end station ID, end station name, then end station latitude, end station longitude, then your bike ID, user type, then the birth year of the member and the gender of the member. Now I'm trying to create a data frame that is just stations. So it will only create the station ID and station name, which I'll be using as vertex. 
so here i am trying to create a data frame with the name of just stations where i am just selecting the start station id and i am casting it as float and then i am selecting the start station name and then i am using the distinct function to only keep the unique values so i'll quickly go ahead and hit enter so again let me go ahead and use this just stations and i'll print the schema so you can see there is station id and then there is start station name it contains the unique values of stations in this just station data frame so now again i am taking this stations where i am selecting the start station id and end station id then i am using rdd distinct which will again give me the unique values then i am using this flat map where i am specifying the iterables where we are taking the x0 that is your start station id and i am taking x1 which, which is your end station id and then again i am applying this distinct function that it will keep only the unique values and then at last we have to df function which will convert it to data frame so let me quickly go ahead and execute this so i'm printing this schema so as you can see it has one column that is value and it has data type long so i have taken all the start and end station id and using this flat map i have iterated over all the start and end station id and then using the distinct function i'm taking the unique values and converting it to data frames so i can use these stations and using the station i'll basically uh, keep each of the stations in a vertex so this is the reason why i'm taking the stations or you can say uh, why i'm taking the unique stations from the start station id and end station id so that i can go ahead and i can define vertex as the stations and so now we are creating our set of vertices and attaching a bit of metadata to each one of them which in our case is the name of the station so as you can see we are creating this station vertices which is again an rdd with vertex id and string so we are using the stations which we have just created we are joining it with just stations and the station value should be equal to just station station id so as we have created stations and just station so we are joining it and then we are selecting the station id and start station name then we are mapping row zero and row one so your row zero will basically be your vertex id and row one will be the string that is the name of your station so let me quickly go ahead and execute this so now let us quickly print this using collect for each println so over here we are basically attaching the edges or you can say we are creating the trip edges to all our individual rights and then we'll get the station values and then we'll add a dummy value of one so as you can see that i am selecting the start station and end station from the df which is the first data frame which we have loaded and then i am mapping it to row zero and row one which is your source and destination and then and then i'm attaching a value one to each one of them so i'll hit enter now let me quickly go ahead and print this station edges so it is taking the source id of the vertex and destination id of the vertex or you can say source station id or vertex station id and it is attaching value one to each one of them so now you can go ahead and build your graph but again as we discussed that we need a default station so you can have some situations where your edges might be indicating some vertices but that vertices might not be present in your vertex red so for that situation we need to create a default station so i'll create a default station as missing station so now we are all set we can go ahead and create the graph so the name of the graph is station graph then the vertices are station vertices which we have created which basically contains the station id and station name and then we have station edges 
and at last we have default station so so let me quickly go ahead and execute this so now i need to cache this graph for faster access so i'll use cache function so let us quickly go ahead and check the number of vertices So these are the number of vertices again we can check the number of edges as well so these are the number of edges and to get a sanity check so let's go ahead and check the number of records that are present in the data frame so as you can see that the number of edges in our graph and the count in our data frame is similar or you can say the same so now let's go ahead and run page rank on our data so we can either run a set number of iterations or we can run it until the convergence so in my case i'll run it till convergence so it's rank then station graph then page rank so i specified a double value so it will run till convergence so let's wait for some time So now that we have executed the page rank algorithm so we got the ranks which are attached to each vertices so now let us quickly go ahead and look at the ranks so we are joining ranks with station vertices and then we are sorting it in descending values and we are taking the first 10 rows and then we are printing them so let's quickly go ahead and hit enter So you can see these are the top 10 stations which have the most page rank values so you can say it has more number of incoming trips now one question would be what are the most common destinations in the data set from location to location so we can do this by performing a grouping operator and adding the edge counts together so basically this will give a new graph except each edge will now be the sum of all the semantically same edges so again we are taking the station graph we are performing group by edges edge one and edge two so we are basically grouping edges edge one and edge two so we are aggregating them then we are using triplet and then we are sorting them in descending order again and then we are printing the triplets from the source vertex and the number of trips and then we are taking the destination attribute or you can say a destination vertex or you can say destination station So you can see there are 1933 trips from san francisco ferry building to the station then again you can see there are 1411 trips from san francisco to this location then there are 1025 trips from this station to san francisco and it goes so on so now we have got a directed graph that means our trip are directional from one location to other so now we can go ahead and find the number of trips that go into a specific station and then leave from a specific station so basically we are trying to find the inbound and outbound values or you can say we are trying to find in degree and out degree of the stations so let us first calculate the in degree so i'm using station graph and i'm using in degree operator then i'm joining it with the station vertices and then I'm sorting it again in descending order and then I'm taking the top 10 values. So let's quickly go ahead and hit enter. So these are the top 10 station and you can see the in degrees. So there are these many trips which are coming into these stations. Now similarly we can find the out degree. now again you can see the out degrees as well so these are the stations and these are the out degrees 
so again you can go ahead and perform some more operations over this graph so you can go ahead and find the station which has most number of trip sinks that is most number of people coming into that station but less people are leaving that station and again on the contrary you can find out the stations where there are more number of edges or you can say trip leaving those stations but there are less number of trips coming into those stations so i guess you guys are now clear with spa graphics then we discuss the different types of graphs then moving ahead we discuss the features of graphics then we discuss something about property graph we understood what is property graph how you can create vertex how you can create edges how to use vertex rdd edge rdd then we looked at some of the important vertex operations and at last we understood some of the graph algorithms so i guess now you guys are clear about how to work with spark graphics Today's video is on Hadoop versus Spark. Now, as we know, organizations from different domains are investing in big data analytics today. They are analyzing large data sets to uncover all hidden patterns, unknown correlations, market trends, customer preferences, and other useful business information. These analytical findings are helping organizations in more effective marketing, new revenue opportunities, and better customer service. and they're trying to get competitive advantages over rival organizations and other business benefits and apache spark and hadoop are the two of most prominent big data frameworks and i see people often comparing these two technologies and that is what exactly we're going to do in this video now we'll compare these two big data frameworks based on different parameters but first it is important to get an overview about what is hadoop and what is apache spark So let me just tell you a little bit about Hadoop. Hadoop is a framework to store and process large sets of data across computer clusters, and Hadoop can scale from single computer system up to thousands of commodity systems that offer local storage and compute power. And Hadoop is composed of modules that work together to create the entire Hadoop framework. These are some of the components that we have in the entire Hadoop framework or the Hadoop ecosystem. For example, let me tell you about HDFS, which is the storage unit of Hadoop. Yarn, which is for resource management. There are different analytical tools like Apache Hive, Pig, NoSQL databases like Apache EdgeBase, even Apache Spark and Apache Storm fits in the Hadoop ecosystem for processing big data in real time. For ingesting data, we have tools like flume and scoop flume is used to ingest unstructured data or semi structured data whereas scoop is used to ingest structured data into hdfs if you want to learn more about these tools you can go to edureka's youtube channel and look for hadoop tutorial where everything has been explained in detail now let's move to spark apache spark is a lightning fast cluster computing technology that is designed for fast computation The main feature of Spark is its in-memory cluster computing that increases the processing of speed of an application. Spark performs similar operations to that of Hadoop modules, but it uses an in-memory processing and optimizes the steps. The primary difference between MapReduce and Hadoop and Spark is that MapReduce uses persistent storage and Spark uses resilient distributed data sets which is known as RDDs. which resides in memory the different components in spark are the spark core engine the spark core is the base engine for large scale parallel and distributed data processing further additional libraries which are built on top of the core allow diverse workloads for streaming sql and machine learning spark core is also responsible for memory management and fault recovery scheduling and distributed and monitoring jobs in a cluster and interacting with the storage systems as well next up we have spark streaming spark streaming is the component of spark which is used to process real time streaming data it enables high throughput and fault tolerant stream processing of live data streams we have spark sql spark sql is a new module in spark which integrates relational processing with spark's functional programming api it supports querying data either via sql or via the hive query language for those of you familiar with rdbms spark sql will be an easy transition from your earlier tools where you can extend the boundaries of traditional relational data processing 
Next up is GraphX. GraphX is the Spark API for graphs and graph parallel computation, and thus it extends the Spark resilient distributed datasets with the resilient distributed property graph. Next is Spark MLlib for machine learning. MLlib stands for Machine Learning Library. Spark MLlib is used to perform machine learning in Apache Spark. Now, since you've got an overview of both these two frameworks, I believe that the ground is all set to compare Apache Spark and Hadoop. Let's move ahead and compare Apache Spark with Hadoop on different parameters to understand their strengths. We will be comparing these two frameworks based on these parameters. Let's start with performance first. Spark is fast because it has in-memory processing. It can also use disk for data that doesn't fit into memory. Spark's in-memory processing delivers near real-time analytics. And this makes Spark suitable for credit card processing system, machine learning, security analytics, and processing data for IoT sensors. Now let's talk about Hadoop's performance. Now Hadoop was originally designed to continuously gather data from multiple sources without worrying about the type of data and storing it across distributed environment. And MapReduce uses batch processing. MapReduce was never built for real-time processing. Main idea behind Yarn is parallel processing over distributed data set. The problem with comparing the two is that they have different way of processing and the idea behind the development is also divergent. Next, ease of use. Spark comes with a user-friendly APIs for Scala, Java, Python, and Spark SQL. Spark SQL is very similar to SQL, so it becomes easier for SQL developers to learn it. Spark also provides an interactive shell for developers to query and perform other actions and have immediate feedback. Now let's talk about Hadoop. You can ingest data in Hadoop easily, either by using Shell or integrating it with multiple tools like Scoop and Flume. And Yarn is just a processing framework that can be integrated with multiple tools like Hive and Pig for analytics. Hive is a data warehousing component which performs reading, writing, and managing large dataset in a distributed environment using SQL-like interface. To conclude here, both of them have their own ways to make themselves user-friendly. Now let's come to the costs. Hadoop and Spark are both Apache open source projects, so there's no cost for the software. Cost is only associated with the infrastructure. Both the products are designed in such a way that it can run on commodity hardware with low TCO or total cost of ownership. Well, now you might be wondering the ways in which they are different. They're all the same. Storage and processing in Hadoop is disk-based and Hadoop uses standard amounts of memory. So with Hadoop, we need a lot of disk space as well as faster transfer speed. Hadoop also requires multiple systems to distribute the disk input-output. But in case of Apache Spark, due to its in-memory processing, it requires a lot of memory, but it can deal with the standard speed and amount of disk. As disk space is a relatively inexpensive commodity, and since Spark does not use disk input-output for processing, instead it requires large amounts of RAM for executing everything in memory. So Spark systems incurs more cost. But yes, one important thing to keep in mind is that Spark's technology reduces the number of required systems. It needs significantly fewer systems that cost more. So there will be a point at which Spark reduces the cost per unit of the computation, even with the additional RAM requirement. There are two types of data processing, batch processing and stream processing. Batch processing has been crucial to the big data world. In simplest term, batch processing is working with high data volumes collected over a period. In batch processing, data is first collected, then processed, and then the results are produced at a later stage. And batch processing is an efficient way of processing large static data sets. Generally, we perform batch processing for archived data sets. For example, calculating average income of a country or evaluating the change in e-commerce in the last decade. Now, stream processing. Stream processing is the current trend in the big data world. Need of the hour is speed and real-time information, which is what stream processing does. 
batch processing does not allow businesses to quickly react to changing business needs in real time. Stream processing has seen a rapid growth in that demand. Now coming back to Apache Spark versus Hadoop, Yarn is basically a batch processing framework. When we submit a job to Yarn, it reads data from the cluster, performs operation, and writes the results back to the cluster. And then it again reads the updated data, performs the next operation, and writes the results back to the cluster, and so on. On the other hand, Spark is designed to cover a wide range of workloads such as batch application, iterative algorithms, interactive queries, and streaming as well. Now let's come to fault tolerance. Hadoop and Spark both provide fault tolerance, but have different approaches. For HDFS and Yarn both, master daemons, that is the name node in HDFS, and resource manager in Yarn checks the heartbeat of the slave daemons, the slave daemons are data nodes and node managers. So if any slave daemon fails, the master daemons reschedules all pending and in-progress operations to another slave. Now this method is effective, but it can significantly increase the completion time for operations with single failure also. And as Hadoop uses commodity hardware, another way in which HDFS ensures fault tolerance is by replicating data. Now let's talk about Spark. As we discussed earlier, RDDs, or Resilient Distributed Datasets, are building blocks of Apache Spark. And RDDs are the one which provide fault tolerant to Spark. They can refer to any dataset present in external storage system, like HDFS, EdgeBase, shared file system, etc. They can also be operated parallelly. RDDs can persist a dataset in memory across operations, which makes future actions 10 times much faster. If a RDD is lost, it will automatically get recomputed by using the original transformations. And this is how Spark provides fault tolerance. And at the end, let us talk about security. Well, Hadoop has multiple ways of providing security. Hadoop supports Kerberos for authentication, but it is difficult to handle. Nevertheless, it also supports third-party vendors like LDAP, for authentication. They also offer encryption. HDFS supports traditional file permissions as well as access control lists. Hadoop provides service level authorization, which guarantees that clients have the right permissions for job submission. Spark currently supports authentication via a shared secret. Spark can integrate with HDFS and it can use HDFS ACLs or access control list and file level permissions. Spark can also run on Yarn, leveraging the capability of Kerberos. Now, this was the comparison of these two frameworks based on these following parameters. Now, let us understand use cases where these technologies fit best. Use cases where Hadoop fits best, for example, when you're analyzing archived data. Yarn allows parallel processing over huge amounts of data. Parts of data is processed parallelly and separately on different data nodes and gathers result from each node manager. In cases when instant results are not required, now Hadoop MapReduce is a good and economical solution for batch processing. However, it is incapable of processing data in real time. Use cases where Spark fits best. In real-time big data analysis, Real-time data analysis means processing data that is getting generated by the real-time event streams coming in at the rate of millions of events per second. The strength of Spark lies in its abilities to support streaming of data along with distributed processing. And Spark claims to process data 100 times faster than MapReduce, while 10 times faster with the disks. It is used in graph processing. Spark contains a graph computation library called GraphX, which simplifies our life. In-memory computation, along with inbuilt graph support, improves the performance of algorithm by a magnitude of 1 or 2 degrees over traditional MapReduce programs. It is also used in iterative machine learning algorithms. Almost all machine learning algorithms work iteratively. As we have seen earlier, iterative algorithms involve input-output bottlenecks in the MapReduce implementations. MapReduce uses coarse-grained tasks that are too heavy for iterative algorithms. 
Spark caches the intermediate dataset after each iteration and runs multiple iterations on the cache dataset, which eventually reduces the input-output overhead and executes the algorithm faster in a fault-tolerant manner. So at the end, which one is the best? The answer to this is Hadoop and Apache Spark are not competing with one another. In fact, they complement each other quite well. Hadoop brings huge data sets under control by commodity systems, and Spark provides real-time in-memory processing for those data sets. When we combine Apache Spark's ability, that is the high processing speed and advanced analytics, and multiple integration support with Hadoop's low-cost operation on commodity hardware, it gives the best results. Hadoop complements Apache Spark capabilities. Spark cannot completely replace Hadoop, but the good news is that the demand of Spark is currently at an all-time high. If you want to learn more about the Hadoop ecosystem tools and Apache Spark, don't forget to take a look at the Edureka's YouTube channel and check out the Big Data and Hadoop playlist. Welcome everyone in today's session on Kafka Spark streaming. So without any further delay, let's look at the agenda first. We will start by understanding what is Apache Kafka. Then we will discuss about different components of Apache Kafka and its architecture. Further, we will look at different Kafka commands. After that, we'll take a brief overview of Apache Spark and we'll understand different Spark components. Finally, we'll look at the demo where we will use Spark streaming with Apache Kafka. Let's move to our first slide. So in a real-time scenario, we have different systems or services which will be communicating with each other. And the data pipelines are the ones which are establishing connection between two servers or two systems. Now let's take an example of e-commerce website where it can have multiple servers at front end like web or application server for hosting application. It can have a chat server for the customers to provide chat facilities. Then it can have a separate server for payment, etc. Similarly, organization can also have multiple server at the back end which will be receiving messages from different front end servers based on their requirements. Now they can have a database server which will be storing the records then they can have security systems for user authentication and authorization then they can have real time monitoring server which is basically used for recommendations. So all these data pipelines becomes complex with the increase in number of systems and adding a new system or server requires more data pipelines which will again make the data flow more complicated and complex. Now managing these data pipelines also become very difficult as each data pipeline has their own set of requirements. For example, data pipelines which handles transactions should be more fault tolerant and robust. On the other hand, click stream data pipeline can be more fragile. So adding some pipelines or removing some pipelines becomes more difficult from the complex system. So now I hope that you would have understood the problem due to which messaging systems was originated. Let's move to the next slide and we'll understand how Kafka solves this problem. Now, Messaging system reduces the complexity of data pipelines and makes the communication between systems more simpler and manageable. Using messaging system, now you can easily establish remote communication and send your data easily across network. Now your different systems may use different platform and languages and messaging system provides you a common paradigm independent of any platform or language. So basically it decouples the platform on which your front end server as well as your back end server is running. You can also establish an asynchronous communication and send messages so that the sender does not have to wait for the receiver to process the messages. Now one of the benefit of messaging system is that you can ensure reliable communication. So even when the receiver and network is not working properly, your messages wouldn't get lost. Now talking about Kafka, Kafka decouples the data pipelines and solves the complexity problem. The applications which are producing messages to Kafka are called producers. And the applications which are consuming those messages from Kafka are called consumers. Now, as you can see in the image, the front end server, then your application server 1, application server 2, and chat server are producing messages to Kafka. And these are called producers. And your database server, security systems, real time monitoring server, then other services, and data warehouse, these are basically consuming the messages and are called consumers. So, your producer sends the message to Kafka. And then Kafka store those messages and consumers who want those messages can subscribe and receive them. Now 
you can also have multiple subscribers to a single category of messages so your database server and your security system can be consuming the same messages which is produced by application server one and again adding a new consumer is very easy you can go ahead and add a new consumer and just subscribe to the message categories that is required so again you can add a new consumer say consumer one and you can again go ahead and subscribe to the category of messages which is produced by application server one so let's quickly move ahead let's talk about apache kafka so apache kafka is a distributed published subscribe messaging system messaging traditionally has two models queuing and publish subscribe in a queue a pool of consumers may read from a server and each record only goes to one of them whereas in publish subscribe the record is broadcasted to all consumers so multiple consumers can get the record the kafka cluster is distributed and have multiple machines running in parallel and this is the reason why kafka is fast scalable and fault tolerant now let me tell you that kafka is developed at linkedin and later it became a part of apache project now let us look at some of the important terminologies so we'll first start with topic so topic is a category or feed name to which records are published and topic in kafka are always multi subscriber that is a topic can have zero one or multiple consumers that can subscribe to the topic and consume the data written to it for an example you can have sales record getting published in sales topic you can have product records which is getting published in product topic and so on this will actually segregate your messages and consumer will only subscribe to the topic that they need and again your consumer can also subscribe to two or more topics now let's talk about partitions so kafka topics are divided into a number of partitions and partitions allow you to parallelize a topic by splitting the data in a particular topic across multiple brokers which means each partition can be placed on separate machine to allow multiple consumers to read from a topic parallelly so in case of sales topic you can have three partition partition 0 partition 1 and partition 2 from where three consumers can read data parallelly now moving ahead let's talk about producers So producers are the one who publishes the data to topics of their choice. Then you have consumers. So consumers can subscribe to one or more topic and consume data from that topic. Now consumers basically label themselves with a consumer group name, and each record published to a topic is delivered to one consumer instance within each subscribing consumer group. So suppose you have a consumer group, let's say consumer group one. and then you have three consumers residing in it that is consumer a consumer b and consumer c now from the sales topic each record can be read once by consumer group 1 and it can either be read by consumer a or consumer b or consumer c but it can only be consumed once by the single consumer group that is consumer group 1 but again you can have multiple consumer groups which can subscribe to a topic where one record can be consumed by multiple consumers that is one consumer from each consumer group so now let's say you have a consumer group 1 and consumer group 2 in consumer group 1 we have two consumer that is consumer a and consumer b and in consumer group 2 we have two consumers consumer c and consumer d so if consumer group 1 and consumer group 2 are consuming messages from topic sales so the single record will be consumed by consumer group 1 as well as consumer group 2 and a single consumer from both the consumer group will consume the record once so i guess you are clear with the concept of consumer and consumer group now consumer instances can be a separate process or separate machines now talking about brokers brokers are nothing but a single machine in the kafka cluster and zookeeper is another apache open source project it stores the metadata information related to kafka cluster like brokers information topics details etc so zookeeper is basically the one who is managing the whole kafka cluster now let's quickly go to the next slide so suppose you have a topic let's assume this is topic sales and you have four partition so you have partition 0 partition 1 partition 2 and partition 3 now you have five brokers over here now let's take the case of partition 1 so if the replication factor is 3 it will have three copies which will reside on different brokers so one replica is on broker 2 next is on broker 3 and next is on broker 5 and as you can see repl5 
so this 5 is from this broker 5 so the id of the replica is same as the id of the broker that hosts it now moving ahead one of the replica of partition 1 will serve as the leader replica so now the leader of partition 1 is replica 5 and any consumer coming and consuming messages from partition 1 will be served by this replica and these two replica is basically for fault tolerance so that once your broker 5 goes off or your disk becomes corrupt so your replica 3 or replica 2 one of them will again serve as a leader and this is basically decided on the basis of most in sync replica so the replica which will be most in sync with this replica will become the next leader so similarly this partition 0 may reside on broker 1 broker 2 and broker 3 again your partition 2 may reside on broker 4 broker 5 and say broker 1 and then your third partition might reside on these three brokers so suppose that this is the leader for partition 2 this is the leader for partition 0 this is the leader for partition 3 this is the leader for partition 1 right so you can see that four consumers can consume data parallelly from these brokers so it can consume data from partition 2 this consumer can consume data from partition 0 and similarly for partition 3 and partition 1 now by maintaining the replica basically helps in fault tolerance and keeping different partition leaders on different brokers basically helps in parallel execution or you can say parallelly consuming those messages so i hope that you guys are clear about topics partitions and replicas now let's move to our next slide so this is how the whole kafka cluster looks like you have multiple producers which is again producing messages to kafka then this whole is the kafka cluster where you have two nodes node one has two broker broker one and broker two and the node second has two brokers which is broker three and broker four again consumers will be consuming data from these brokers and zookeeper is the one who is managing this whole kafka cluster now let's look at some basic commands of kafka and understand how kafka works how to go ahead and start zookeeper how to go ahead and start kafka server and how to again go ahead and produce some messages to kafka and then consume some messages to kafka so let me quickly open my vm so now let me quickly open the terminal let me quickly go ahead and execute sudo jps so that i can check all the demons that are running in my system so you can see i have name node data node resource manager node manager job history server so now as all the sdfs demons are running let us quickly go ahead and start kafka services so first i'll go to kafka home so let me show you the directory so my kafka is in user lib now let me quickly go ahead and start zookeeper service but before that let me show you zookeeper.properties file so the client port is 2181 so my zookeeper will be running on port 2181 and the data directory in which my zookeeper will store all the metadata is slash temp slash zookeeper so let us quickly go ahead and start zookeeper and the command is bin zookeeper server start so this is the script file and then i'll pass the properties file which is inside config directory and i'll hit enter meanwhile let me open another tab so here i'll be starting my first kafka broker but before that let me show you the properties file so we'll go in config directory again and i have server.properties so this is the properties of my first kafka broker so first we have server basics so here the broker id of my first broker is zero then the port is 9092 on which my first broker will be running so it contains all the socket server settings then moving ahead we have log basics so in that log basics this is log directory uh, which is slash temp slash kafka hyphen logs so over here my kafka will store all those messages or records which will be produced by the producers so all the records which belongs to broker zero will be stored at this location now the next section is internal topic settings in which the offset topic replication factor is one 
then transaction state log replication factor is one next uh, we have log retention policy so the log retention hours is 168 so your records will be stored for 168 hours by default and then it will be deleted then you have zookeeper properties where we have specified zookeeper.connect and as we have seen in zookeeper.properties file that our zookeeper will be running on port 2181 so we are giving the address of zookeeper that is localhost 2181 and at last we have group coordinator setting so let us quickly go ahead and start the first broker so the script file is kafka server start.sh and then we have to give the properties file which is server.properties for the first broker i'll hit enter and meanwhile let me open another tab now i'll show you the next properties file which is server1.properties so the things which you have to change for creating a new broker is first you have to change the broker id so my earlier broker id was zero the new broker id is one again you can replicate this file and for a new server you have to change the broker id to two then you have to change the port because on 9092 already my first broker is running that is broker zero so my broker one should connect to a different port and here i have specified 9093 next thing what you have to change is the log directory so here i have added a hyphen one to the default log directory so all the records which is stored to my broker one will be going to this particular directory that is slash temp slash kafka logs hyphen one and rest of the things are similar so let me quickly go ahead and start second broker as well and let me open one more terminal And I'll I'll start broker two as well. So the zookeeper started. Then broker one is also started, and this is broker two, which is also started, and this is broker three. So now let me quickly minimize this, and I'll open a new terminal. Now first let us look at some commands related to Kafka topics. So I'll quickly go ahead and create a topic. So again, let me first go to my Kafka home directory. Then the script file is Kafka topic.sh. Then the first parameter is create. Then we have to give the address of zookeeper because zookeeper is the one who is actually containing all the details related to your topic. So the address of my zookeeper is localhost 2181 then we'll give the topic name so let me name the topic as kafka hyphen spark next we have to specify the replication factor of the topic so it will replicate all the partitions inside the topic that many times so replication hyphen factor as we have three brokers so let me keep it as three and then we have partitions so i'll keep it as three because we have three brokers running and our consumer can go ahead and consume messages parallelly from three brokers and let me press enter so now you can see the topic is created now let us quickly go ahead and list all the topics so the command for listing all the topics is dot slash bin again we'll open kafka topic script file then hyphen hyphen list and again will provide the address of zookeeper so to again list the topic we have to first go to the kafka topic script file then we have to give hyphen hyphen list parameter and next we have to give the zookeeper's address which is localhost 2181 i'll hit enter and you can see i have this kafka hyphen spark the kafka spark topic has been created now let me show you one more thing again we'll go to pen kafka topics dot sh and we'll describe this topic i'll pass the address of zookeeper which is localhost 2181 and then i'll pass the topic name which is kafka hyphen spark so now you can see here the topic is 
Kafka is spark, the partition count is 3, the replication factor is 3, and the config is as follows. So here you can see all the three partitions of the topic that is partition 0, partition 1, and partition 2. Then the leader for partition 0 is broker 2, the leader for partition 1 is broker 0, and leader for partition 2 is broker 1. So you can see we have different partition leaders residing on different brokers. So this is basically for load balancing so that different partition could be served from different brokers and it could be consumed parallelly. Again, you can see the replica of this partition is residing in all the three brokers. Same with partition one and same with partition two. And it's showing you the in sync replica. So in sync replica, the first is two, then you have zero and then you have one. And similarly with partition 1 and 2. So now let us quickly go ahead. I'll reduce this to half. Let me open one more terminal. The reason why I'm doing this is that we can actually produce message from one console and then we can receive the message in another console. So for that, I'll start Kafka console producer first. So the command is dot slash bin. Kafka console producer.sh and then in case of producer you have to give the parameter as broker hyphen list which is localhost 9092 you can provide any of the brokers that is running and it will again take the rest of the brokers from there so you just have to provide the address of one broker you can also provide a set of brokers so you can give it as localhost colon 9092 comma localhost colon 9093 and similarly so here i am passing the address of the first broker now next i have to mention the topic so topic is kafka spark and i'll hit enter so my console producer is started let me produce a message saying hi now in the second terminal i'll go ahead and start the console consumer so again the command is kafka console consumer.sh and then in case of consumer you have to give the parameter as bootstrap server so this is the thing to notice guys that in case of producer you have to give the broker list while in case of consumer you have to give bootstrap server and it is again the same that is localhost 9092 which is the address of my broker zero and then I'll give the topic which is Kafka Spark. Now adding this parameter that is from hyphen beginning will basically give me messages stored in that topic from beginning. Otherwise, if I'm not giving this parameter hyphen hyphen from beginning, I'll only consume the recent messages that has been produced after starting this console consumer. So let me hit enter and you can see I'll get a message saying hi first. Oh, I'm sorry guys the topic name I have given is not correct sorry for my typo let me quickly correct it and let me hit enter so as you can see I'm receiving the messages I received hi then let me produce some more messages So now you can see uh, all the messages that I am producing from console producer is getting consumed by console consumer. Now this console producer as well as console consumer is basically used by the developers to actually test the Kafka cluster. So what happens if you are if there is a producer which is running and which is producing those messages to Kafka then you can go ahead and you can start console consumer and check whether the producer is producing the messages or not or you can again go ahead and check the format in which your message are getting produced to the topic those kind of testing part is done using console consumer and similarly using console producer you do something like you are creating a consumer so you can go ahead you can produce a message to kafka topic and then you can check whether your consumer is consuming that message or not this is basically used for testing now let us quickly go ahead and close this now let us get back to our slides now i have briefly covered kafka and the concepts of kafka so here basically i am giving you a small brief idea about what kafka is and how kafka works now 
as we have understood why we need messaging systems what is kafka what are different terminologies in kafka how kafka architecture works and we have seen some of the basic kafka commands so let us now understand what is apache spark so basically apache spark is an open source cluster computing framework for near real time processing now spark provides an interface for programming the entire cluster with implicit data parallelism and fault tolerance we'll talk about how spark provides fault tolerance but talking about implicit data parallelism that means you do not need any special directives operators or functions to enable parallel execution spark by default provides you data parallelism spark is designed to cover a wide range of workloads such as batch applications iterative algorithms interactive queries machine learning algorithms and streaming so basically the main feature of spark is its in memory cluster computing that increases the processing speed of the application so what spark does spark does not store the data in disks what it does it transforms the data and keep the data in memory so that quickly multiple operations can be applied over the data and the final result is only stored in the disk now alongside spark can also do batch processing 100 times faster than mapreduce and this is the reason why apache spark is the go to tool for big data processing in the industry now let's quickly move ahead and understand how spark does this so the answer is rdd that is resilient distributed data sets now an rdd is a read only partitioned collection of records and you can say it is a fundamental data structure of spark so basically rdd is an immutable distributed collection of objects so each data set in rdd is divided into logical partitions which may be computed on different nodes of the cluster now rdd can contain any type of python java or scala objects now talking about the fault tolerance rdd is a fault tolerant collection of elements that can be operated on in parallel now how rdd does that if a rdd is lost it will automatically be recomputed by using original transformations and this is how spark provides fault tolerance so i hope that you guys are clear that how spark provides fault tolerance now let's talk about how we can create rdds so there are two ways to create rdds first is parallelizing an existing collection in your driver program or you can refer a data set in an external storage system such as shared file system it can be your hdfs edge base or any other data source offering a hadoop input format now spark makes use of the concept of rdd to achieve fast and efficient operations now let's quickly move ahead and look how rdd works so first we create an rdd which you can create either by referring to an external storage system and then once you create an rdd you can go ahead and you can apply multiple transformations over that rdd like you can perform filter map union etc and then again it gives you a new rdd or you can say the transformed rdd and at last you apply some action and get the result now this action can be count first take and collect all those kind of functions so now this is a brief idea about what is rdd and how rdd works so now let's quickly move ahead and look at the different workloads that can be handled by apache spark so we have interactive streaming analytics then we have machine learning we have data integration we have spark streaming and processing so let us talk about them one by one first is spark streaming and processing so now basically you know data arrives at a steady rate or you can say at a continuous streams right and then what you can do you can again go ahead and store that data set in disk and then you can actually go ahead and apply some processing over it some analytics over it and then get some result out of it but this is not the scenario with each and every case let's take an example of financial transactions where you have to go ahead and identify and refuse potential fraudulent transactions now if you will go ahead and store the data stream and then you will go ahead and apply some processing it would be too late and someone would have got away with the money so in that scenario what you need to do so you need to quickly take that input data stream you need to apply some transformations over it and then you have to take actions accordingly like you can send some notification or you can actually reject that fraudulent transaction or something like that and then you can go ahead and if you want you can store those uh, results or data set in some of the database or you can say some of the file system so we have some scenarios where we have to actually process the stream of data 
and then we have to go ahead and store that data or perform some analytics on it or take some necessary actions so this is where spark streaming comes into picture and spark is a best fit for processing those continuous input data streams now moving to next that is machine learning now as you know that first we create a machine learning model then we continuously feed those incoming data streams to the model and we get some continuous output based on the input values now we reuse intermediate results across multiple computation in multi-stage applications which basically incurs substantial overhead due to data replication disk io and serialization which makes the system slow now what spark does spark rdd will store intermediate result in a distributed memory instead of a stable storage and make the system faster so as we saw in spark rdd all the transformations will be applied over there and all the transformed rdds will be stored in the memory itself so we can quickly go ahead and apply some more iterative algorithms over there and it does not take much time in functions like data replication or disk io so all those overheads will be reduced now you might be wondering that memory is always very less so what if the memory gets over so if the distributed memory is not sufficient to store intermediate results then it will store those results on the disk so i hope that you guys are clear how sparks perform this iterative machine learning algorithms and why spark is fast let's look at the next workload so next workload is interactive streaming analytics now as we already discussed about streaming data so user runs ad hoc queries on the same subset of data and each query will do a disk io on the stable storage which can dominate applications execution time so let me take an example of a data scientist so basically you have continuous streams of data which is coming in so what your data scientist would do so your data scientist will either ask some questions execute some queries over the data then view the result and then he might alter the initial question slightly by seeing the output or he might also drill deeper into results and execute some more queries over the gathered result so there are multiple scenarios in which your data scientist would be running some interactive queries on the streaming analytics now how spark helps in this interactive streaming analytics so each transformed rdd may be recomputed each time you run an action on it right and when you persist an rdd in memory in which case spark will keep all the elements around on the cluster for faster access and whenever you will execute the query next time over the data then the query will be executed quickly and it will give you a instant result right so i hope that you guys are clear how spark helps in interactive streaming analytics now let's talk about data integration so basically as you know that in large organizations data is basically produced from different systems across the business and basically you need a framework which can actually integrate different data sources so spark is the one which actually integrate different data sources so you can go ahead and you can take the data from kafka cassandra flume edgebase then amazon s3 then you can perform some real time analytics over there or you can say some near real time analytics over there you can apply some machine learning algorithms and then you can go ahead and store the process result in apache edgebase then memsql hdfs it could be your kafka so spark basically gives you a multiple options where you can go ahead and pick the data from and again you can go ahead and write the data into now let's quickly move ahead and we'll talk about different spark components so you can see we have a spark core engine so basically this is the core engine and on top of this core engine you have spark sql spark streaming then mllib then you have graphx and then you have spark r let's talk about them one by one and we'll start with spark core engine so spark core engine is the base engine for large scale parallel and distributed data processing additional libraries which are built on top of the core allows diverse workloads for streaming sql machine learning uh, then you can go ahead and execute r on spark or you can go ahead and execute python on spark those kind of workloads you can easily go ahead and execute so basically your spark core engine is the one who is managing all your memory then all your fault recovery your scheduling your distributing of jobs and monitoring jobs on a cluster and interacting with the storage system so in in short we can say the spark core engine is the heart of spark and on top of this all of these libraries are there 
So first let's talk about Spark Streaming. So Spark Streaming is the component of Spark which is used to process real-time streaming data as we just discussed and it is a useful addition to Spark Core API. Now it enables high throughput and fault tolerant stream processing for live data streams. So you can go ahead and you can perform all the streaming data analytics using this Spark Streaming. Then you have Spark SQL over here. So basically Spark SQL is a new module in Spark which integrates relational processing of Spark's functional programming API and it supports querying data either via SQL or HQL that is Hive query language. So basically for those of you who are familiar with RDBMS Spark SQL is an easy transition from your earlier tool where you can go ahead and extend the boundaries of traditional relational data processing. Now talking about graphics. So GraphX is the Spark API for graphs and graph parallel computation. It extends the Spark RDD with a resilient distributed property graph. Uh, talking at high level, basically GraphX extend the graph RDD abstraction by introducing the resilient distributed property graph, which is nothing but a directed multigraph with properties attached to each vertex and edge. Next we have Spark R. So basically it provides you packages for R language and then you can go ahead and leverage spark power with R shell. Next you have spark MLlib. So MLlib is uh, basically stands for machine learning library. So spark MLlib is used to perform machine learning in Apache Spark. Now many common machine learning and statical algorithms have been implemented and are shipped with MLlib which simplifies large scale machine learning pipelines which basically includes summary statistics, correlations, classification and regression, collaborative filtering techniques, then cluster analysis methods, then you have dimensionality reduction techniques, you have feature extraction and transformation functions, then you have optimization algorithms. It is basically a MLlib package or you can say machine learning package on top of Spark. Then you also have something called PySpark which is Python package for Spark where you can go ahead and leverage Python over Spark. So I hope that you guys are clear with different Spark components. So before moving to Kafka Spark streaming demo, so I have just given you a brief intro to Apache Spark. If you want a detailed tutorial on Apache Spark or different components of Apache Spark like Apache Spark SQL, Spark Data Frames, or Spark Streaming, Spark Graphics, Spark MLlib, so you can go to Edureka's YouTube channel again. So now we are here guys. I know that you guys are waiting for this demo from a while. So now let's go ahead and look at Kafka Spark streaming demo. So let me quickly go ahead and open my virtual machine. And I'll open a terminal. So let me first check all the daemons that are running in my system. So my zookeeper is running, name node is running, data node is running, and then my resource manager is running, all the three Kafka brokers are running. Then node manager is running and job history server is running. So now I have to start my spark daemons. So let me first go to the spark home. And to start the spark daemon the command is spin start all dot sh. So let me quickly go ahead and execute sudo jps to check my spark daemons. So you can see master and worker daemons are running. So let me close this terminal. Let me go to the project directory. So basically I have two projects. This is Kafka transaction producer and the next one is the spark streaming Kafka master. So first we will be producing messages from Kafka transaction producer and then we'll be streaming those records which is basically produced by this producer using the spark streaming Kafka master. So first let me take you through this Kafka transaction producer. So this is our pom.xml file. Let me open it with gedit. So basically this is a maven project and and I have used spring boot server. So I have given Java version as 8. You can see Kafka client over here and the version of Kafka client. Then you can see I am importing Jackson data bind. Then JSON and then I'm packaging it as a war file that is web archive file and here I am again specifying the spring boot maven plugins which is to be downloaded. So let me quickly go ahead and close this and we'll go to the source 
directory and then we'll go inside main so basically this is the file that is sales chan 2009 file so let me show you the file first so these are the records which i'll be producing to the kafka so the fields are transaction date then product price payment type then name city state country account created then last login latitude and longitude so let me close this file and then the application.yml is the main property file so in this application.yml i'm specifying the bootstrap server which is localhost 9092 then i'm specifying the brokers which again resides on localhost 9092 so here i have specified the broker list now next i have product topic so the topic of the product is transaction then the partition count is one so basically your acks config controls the criteria under which requests are considered complete and the all setting we have specified will result in blocking on the full commit of the record it is the slowest but the most durable setting now talking about retry so it will retry thrice then we have minimum pool size and we have maximum pool size which is basically for implementing java threads and at last we have the file path so this is the path of the file which i have shown you just now so messages will be consumed from this file let me quickly close this file and we'll look at application.properties so here we have specified the properties for our spring boot server so we have server context path that is slash edureka then we have spring application name that is kafka producer we have server port that is double nine double eight and the spring events timeout is 20. so let me close this as well let's go back let's go inside java com edureka kafka so we'll explore the important files one by one so let me first take you through this dto directory and over here we have transaction.java so basically here we are storing the model so basically you can see these are the fields from the file which i have shown you so we have transaction date we have product price payment type name city state country and so on so we have created variable for each field so what we are doing we are basically creating a getter and setter function for all these variables so we have get transaction id which will basically return the transaction id then we have set transaction id which will basically set the transaction id similarly we have get transaction date for getting the transaction date then we have set transaction date and it will set the transaction date using this variable then we have get product set product get price set price and all the getter and setter methods for each of the variable this is the constructor so here we are taking all the parameters like transaction date product price and then we are setting the value of each of the variables using this operator so we are setting the value for transaction date product price payment and all of the fields that is present over there next we are also creating a default constructor and then over here we are overriding the two string method and what we are doing we are basically returning the transaction details and we are returning transaction date and then the value of transaction date product then value of product price then value of price and so on for all the fields so basically this is the model of the transaction so we can go ahead and we can create object of this transaction and then we can easily go ahead and send the transaction object as the value so this is the main reason of creating this transaction model now let me quickly go ahead and close this file let's go back and let's first take a look at this config so this is kafka properties.java so what we did again as i have shown you the application.yml file so we have taken all the parameters that we have specified over there that is your bootstrap product topic partition count then brokers file name and thread count so all these properties then you have file path then all these properties we have taken we have created a variable and then what we are doing again we are doing the same thing as we did with our transaction model we are creating a getter and setter method for each of these variables so you can see we have get file path and we are returning the file path then we have set file path where we are setting the file path using this operator similarly we have 
get product topic set product topic then we have getter and setter for thread count we have getter and setter for bootstrap and all those properties now we can again go ahead and call this kafka properties anywhere and then we can easily extract those values using getter methods so let me quickly close this file and i'll take you to the configurations so in this configuration what we are doing we are creating the object of kafka properties as you can see so what we are doing then we are again creating a properties object and then we are setting the properties so you can see that we are setting the bootstrap server config and then we are retrieving the value using the kafka properties object and this is the get bootstrap server function then you can see we are setting the acknowledgement config and we are getting the acknowledgement from this get acknowledgement function and then we are using this get retries method so from all these kafka properties object we are calling those getter methods and retrieving those values and setting those values in this property object so then we have partitioner class so we are basically implementing this default partitioner which is present in org apache kafka client producer internals package then we are creating a producer over here and we are passing this props object which will set the properties so over here we are passing the key serializer which is the string key serializer and then this is the value serializer in which we are creating new custom json serializer and then we are passing transaction over here and then it will return the producer and then we are implementing thread we are again getting the get minimum pool size from kafka properties and get maximum pool size from kafka properties so over here we are implementing java threads now let me quickly close this kafka producer configuration where we are configuring our kafka producer let's go back now let us quickly go to this api which have event producer api dot java file so here we are basically creating a event producer api which has this dispatch function so we'll use this dispatch function to send the records so let me quickly close this file let's go back we have already seen this config and configurations in which we are basically retrieving those values from application.yml file and then we are setting the producer configurations then we have constants so in kafka constants or java we have created this kafka constant interface where we have specified the batch size account limit checksum limit then read batch size minimum balance maximum balance minimum account maximum account then we are also implementing date time for matter so we are specifying all the constants over here let me close this file let's go back then this is performance so we'll not look at these two files but let me tell you what does these two files do uh, these two files are basically to record the metrics of your kafka like time in which your thousand records have been produced in kafka or you can say time in which records are getting published to kafka it will be monitored and then you can record those stats so basically it helps in optimizing the performance of your kafka producer right you can uh, actually know how to tweak or how to adjust those configuration factors and then you can see the difference or you can actually monitor the stats and then understand or uh, how you can actually make your producer more efficient so these are basically for those factors but uh, let's not worry about this right now let's go back next let me quickly take you through this file utility so you have file utility.java so basically what we are doing over here we are reading each record from the file using buffer reader so over here you can see we have this list and then we have buffer reader then we have file reader so first we are reading the file and then we are trying to split each of the fields present in the record and then we are setting the value of those fields over here and then we are specifying some of the exceptions that may occur like number format exception or parse exception all those kind of exception we have specified over here and then we are closing this so in this file we are basically reading the records now let me close this let's go back now let's take quickly look at the serializer so this is custom json serializer so in serializer we have created a custom json serializer now this is basically to write the values as bytes 
so the data which you will be passing will be written in bytes because as we know that data is sent to kafka in form of bytes and this is the reason why we have created this custom json serializer so now let me quickly close this let's go back uh, this file is basically for my spring boot web application so let's not get into this let's look at event thread dot java so basically over here we have event producer api so now we are trying to dispatch those events and to show you how dispatch function works let me go back let me open services and event producer impl that is implementation so let me show you how this dispatch works so basically over here what we are doing first we are initializing so using the file utility we are basically reading the files and to read the file we are getting the path using this kafka properties object and we are calling this getter method of file path then what we are doing we are basically taking the product list and then we are trying to dispatch it so in dispatch we are basically using kafka producer and then we are creating the object of the producer record then we are using the get topic uh, from this kafka properties we are uh, getting this transaction id from the transaction and then we are using event producer dot send to send the data and finally we are trying to monitor this but let's not worry about the monitoring and cache and monitoring and stats part so we can ignore this part let's let's quickly go back and look at the last file which is producer so let me show you this event producer so what we are doing here we are actually creating a logger so in this on completion method we are basically passing the record metadata and if your e exception is not null then it will basically throw an error saying this and recorded metadata else it will give you the sent message to topic partition and offset and then the record metadata and topic and then it will give you all the details regarding topic partitions and offsets so i hope that you guys have understood how this kafka producer is working now is the time we need to go ahead and we need to quickly execute this so let me open a terminal over here now first to build this project we need to execute mvn clean install this will install all the dependencies so as you can see our build is successful so let me minimize this and this target directory is created after you build a bevan project so let me quickly go inside this target directory and this is the root.war file that is root.webarchive file which we need to execute so let's quickly go ahead and execute this file but before this to verify whether the data is getting produced in our kafka topics so for testing as i already told you we need to go ahead and we need to open a console consumer so that we can check that whether the data is getting published or not so let me quickly minimize this so let's quickly go to kafka directory and the command is dot slash pin kafka console consumer and then hyphen hyphen bootstrap server Nine zero nine two. Okay, uh, let me check the topic. What's the topic? Let's go to our application dot yml file. So the topic name is transaction. Let me quickly minimize this. Specify the topic name and I'll hit enter. So now let me place this console aside and now let's quickly go ahead and execute our project so for that the command is java hyphen jar and then we'll provide the path of the file that is inside target and the file is root dot war and here we go
so now you can see in the console consumer the records are getting published right so there are multiple records which have been published in our transaction topic and you can verify this using the console consumer so this is where the developers use the console consumer so now we have successfully verified our producer so let me quickly go ahead and stop the producer let, let me stop consumer as well let's quickly minimize this and now let's go to the second project that is spark streaming kafka master again we have uh, specified all the dependencies that is required let me quickly show you those dependencies now again you can see over here we have specified java version then we have specified the artifacts or you can see the dependencies so we have scala compiler then we have spark streaming kafka then we have kafka clients then json data binding then we have maven compiler plugin so all those dependencies which are required we have specified over here so let me quickly go ahead and close it let's quickly move to the source directory main then let's look at the resources again so this is application.yml file so we have port 8080 then we have bootstrap server over here then we have brokers over here then we have topic is as transaction the group is transaction partition count is one and then the file name so we won't be using this file name then let me quickly go ahead and close this let's go back let's go back to java directory com spark demo then this is the model so it's same so these are all the fields that are there in the transaction you have transaction date product price payment type then name city state country account created and so on and again we have specified all the getter and setter methods over here and similarly again we have created this transaction dto constructor where we have taken all the parameters and then we are setting the values using this operator next uh, we are again overriding this two string function and over here we are again returning the details like transaction date and then value of transaction date product and then value of product and similarly all the fields so let me quickly close this model let's go back let's look at kafka first then we have serializer so this is the json serializer which was there in our producer and this is transaction decoder let's take a look now you have decoder which is again implementing decoder and we are passing this transaction dto then again you can see we have this from bytes method which we are overriding and we are reading the values using this bytes and then transaction dto class again if it is failing to pass we are giving json processing failed for object this and you can see we have this transaction decoder constructor over here so let me quickly again close this file let's quickly go back and now let's take a look at spark streaming app where basically the data which the producer project will be producing to kafka will be actually consumed by spark streaming application so spark streaming will stream the data in real time and then will display the data so in the spark streaming application we are creating conf object and then we are setting the application name as kafka sandbox the master is local star then we have java spark context so here we are specifying the spark context and then next we are specifying the java streaming context so this object will basically be used to uh, take the streaming data so we are passing this java spark context over here as a parameter and then we are specifying the duration that is 2000 next we have kafka parameters so to connect to kafka you need to specify those parameters so in kafka parameters we are specifying the meta broker list that is uh, localhost 9092 then we have auto offset reset that is smallest then in topics the name of the topic from which we will be consuming messages is transaction next java we are creating a java pair input d streams so basically this d stream is discrete stream which is the basic abstraction of spark streaming and is a continuous sequence of rdds representing a continuous stream of data now dstream can either be created from live data from kafka sdfs or flume or it can be generated from transforming existing dstreams using operations
So over here we are again creating a Java input D stream. We are passing string and transaction D to us parameters and we are creating direct Kafka stream object. Then we are using this Kafka utils and we are calling the method create direct stream where we are passing the parameters as SSC that is your spark streaming context. Then you have string dot class which is basically your key serializer then transaction D to dot class that is basically your value serializer then string decoder that is to decode your key and then transaction decoder basically to decode your transaction then you have kafka parameters which you have created here where you have specified broker list and auto offset reset and then you are specifying the topics which is your transaction so next using this kafka d stream you are actually continuously iterating over the rdd and then you are trying to print your new RDD with then RDD partition and size, then RDD count and the record. So RDD for each record. So you are printing the record and then you are starting the Spark streaming context and then you are waiting for the termination. So this is the Spark streaming application. So let's first quickly go ahead and execute this application. Let me close this file. Let's go to the source. Now let me quickly go ahead and delete this target directory. So now let me quickly open the terminal MVN clean install. So now as you can see the target directory is again created and this spark streaming Kafka snapshot jar is created. So we need to execute this jar. So let me quickly go ahead and minimize it. Let me close this terminal. So now first I'll start this spark streaming job. So the command is Java hyphen jar and inside the target directory we have this spark streaming Kafka jar. So let's hit enter. So let me now quickly go ahead and start producing messages. So I'll minimize this and I'll wait for the messages. So let me quickly close this spark streaming job and then I'll show you the consumed records. So you can see the record that is consumed from spark streaming. So here you have got record and transaction DTO and then transaction date products all the details which we have specified. You can see it over here. So this is how spark streaming works with Kafka. Now it's just a basic job. Uh, again, you can go ahead and you can take those transactions. You can perform some real time analytics over there and then you can go ahead and write those results. So over here we have just given you a basic demo in which we are producing the records to Kafka and then using spark streaming. We are streaming those records from Kafka again. You can go ahead and you can perform multiple transformations over the data multiple actions and produce some real time results using this data. So this is just a basic demo where we have shown you how to basically produce records to Kafka and then consume those records using spark streaming. So let's quickly go back to our slide. Now as this was a basic project, let me explain you one of the Kafka spark streaming project uh, which is at Edureka. So basically there is a company called techreview.com. So this techreview.com basically provide reviews for your recent and different technologies like your smartwatches, phones, different operating systems and anything new that is coming into market. So what happens is the company decide to include a new feature which will basically allow users to compare the popularity or trend of multiple technologies based on the Twitter feeds and second uh, for the USP they are basically trying this comparison to happen in real time. So basically they have assigned you this task. So that you have to go ahead. You have to take the real time Twitter feeds. Then you have to show the real time comparison of various technologies. So again the company is, is asking you to identify the minutely trend between different technologies by consuming Twitter streams and writing aggregated minutely count to Cassandra from where again a dashboarding team will come into picture and then they will try to dashboard that data. And it can show you a graph where you can see how the trend of two different or you can see various technologies are going ahead. 
now the solution strategy which is there so you have to continuously stream the data from twitter then you will be storing that those tweets inside a kafka topic then second again you have to perform spark streaming so you will be continuously streaming that data and then you will be applying some transformations which will basically give you the minute trend of the two technologies and again you will write it back to a kafka topic and at last you'll write a consumer that will be consuming messages from the kafka topic and that will write the data in your cassandra database so first you have to write a program that will be consuming data from twitter and write it to kafka topic then you have to write a spark streaming job which will be continuously streaming that data from kafka and perform analytics to identify the minutely trend and then it will write the data back to a kafka topic and then you have to write the third job which will be basically a consumer that will consume data from that kafka topic and write the data to a cassandra database apache spark is a powerful framework which is being heavily used in the industry for real time analytics and machine learning purposes so before i proceed with this session let's have a quick look at the topics which we'll be covering today So I'm starting off by explaining what exactly is PySpark and how it works. Moving ahead, we'll find out the various advantages provided by PySpark. Then I'll be showing you how to install PySpark in your systems. Once we are done with the installation, I will talk about the fundamental concepts of PySpark, like the Spark context, data frames, MLlib, RDDs, and much more. And finally, I'll close off this session with a demo in which I'll show you how to implement PySpark to solve real-life use cases. So without any further ado, Let's quickly embark on our journey to PySpark. Now before I start off with PySpark, let me first brief you about the PySpark ecosystem. As you can see from the diagram, the Spark ecosystem is composed of various components like Spark SQL, Spark Streaming, MLlib, Graphics and the core API component. The Spark SQL component is used to leverage the power of declarative queries and optimize storage by executing SQL like queries on Spark data, which is presented in RDDs and other external sources. Spark streaming component allows developers to perform batch processing and streaming of data with ease in the same application. The machine learning library eases the development and deployment of scalable machine learning pipelines. Graphics component lets the data scientists work with graph and non-graph sources to achieve flexibility and resilience in graph construction and transformations. And finally, the Spark core component It is the most vital component of Spark ecosystem which is responsible for basic input output functions. scheduling and monitoring the entire spark ecosystem is built on top of this core execution engine which has extensible apis in different languages like scala python r and java and in today's session i will specifically discuss about the spark api in python programming languages which is more popularly known as the pyspark now you might be wondering why pyspark well to get a better insight let me give you a brief into pyspark Now as we already know PySpark is the collaboration of two powerful technologies which are Spark which is an open source clustering computing framework built around speed ease of use and streaming analytics and the other one is Python of course Python which is a general purpose high level programming language it provides wide range of libraries and is majorly used for machine learning and real time analytics now which gives us PySpark which is a python api for spark that lets you harness the simplicity of python and the power of apache spark in order to tame big data a pyspark also lets you use the rdds and come with the default integration of py4j library we'll learn about rdds later in this video now that you know what is pyspark let's now see the advantages of using spark with python as we all know python itself is very simple and easy so when spark is written in python it makes apache spark quite easy to learn and use Moreover it's a dynamically typed language which means RDDs can hold objects of multiple data types. Not only this it also makes the API simple and comprehensive. And talking about the readability of code, maintenance and familiarity with the Python API for Apache Spark is far better than other programming languages. Python also provides various options for visualization which is not possible using Scala or Java. Moreover you can conveniently call R directly from Python. On top of this, Python comes with a wide range of libraries like NumPy, Pandas, Kotlin, Seaborn, Matplotlib, and these libraries aids in data analysis and also provide mature and time-tested statistics. With all these features, you can effortlessly program in PySpark in case you get stuck somewhere or have a doubt. 
there is a huge PySpark community out there whom you can reach out and put your query and that is very active. So I will make good use of this opportunity to show you how to install PySpark in your system. Now here I'm using a Red Hat Linux based CentOS system. The same steps can be applied for using Linux systems as well. So in order to install PySpark, first make sure that you have Hadoop installed in your system. So if you want to know more about how to install Hadoop, please check out our Hadoop playlist on YouTube or you can check out our blog on Edureka website. Now first of all, you need to go to the Apache Spark official website, which is spark.apache.org. And the download section, you can download the latest version of Spark release, which supports the latest version of Hadoop or Hadoop version 2.7 or above. Now once you have downloaded it, all you need to do is extract it or rather say untar the file contents. And after that, you need to put in the path where the Spark is installed in the bash RC file. Now you also need to install pip and Jupyter notebook using the pip command and make sure that the version of pip is 10 or above. So as you can see here, this is what our bash RC file looks like. Here you can see that we have put in the path for Hadoop, Spark and as well as PySpark driver Python, which is the Jupyter notebook. What it'll do is that the moment you run the PySpark shell, it will automatically open a Jupyter notebook for you. Now I find Jupyter notebook very easy to work with rather than the shell. It's a personal choice. Now that we are done with the installation part, let's now dive deeper into PySpark and learn a few of its fundamentals, which you need to know in order to work with PySpark. Now this timeline shows the various topics which we will be covering under the PySpark fundamentals. So let's start off with the very first topic in our list, that is the Spark context. The Spark context is the heart of any Spark application. It sets up internal services and establishes a connection to a Spark execution environment. Through a Spark context object, you can create RDDs, accumulators, and broadcast variables, access Spark services, run jobs, and much more. The Spark context allows the Spark driver application to access the cluster through a resource manager, which can be Yarn or Spark's cluster manager. The driver program then runs the operations inside the executors on the worker nodes, and Spark context uses the Py4j to launch a JVM, which in turn creates a Java Spark context. Now there are various parameters which can be used with a Spark context object like the master, app name, Spark home, the Py files, the environment in which it's set, the batch size serializer, configuration gateway, and much more. Among these parameters, the master and app name are the most commonly used. Now to give you a basic insight on how a Spark program works, I have listed down its basic lifecycle phases. The typical life cycle of a Spark program includes creating RDDs from external data sources or parallelize a collection in your driver program. Then we have the lazy transformation. You know, lazily transforming the base RDDs into new RDDs using transformation, then caching few of those RDDs for future reuse, and finally performing action to execute parallel computation and to produce the results. The next topic in our list is RDD, and I'm sure people who have already worked with Spark are familiar with this term. But for people who are new to it, let me just explain it. Now, RDD stands for Resilient Distributed Dataset. It is considered to be the building block of any Spark application. The reason behind this is these elements run and operate on multiple nodes to do parallel processing on a cluster. And once you create a RDD, it becomes immutable. And by immutable, I mean that it is an object whose state cannot be modified after it is created. But we can transform its values by applying certain transformation. They have good fault tolerance ability and can automatically recover from almost any failures. This adds an added advantage. Now to achieve a certain task, multiple operations can be applied on these RDDs which are categorized in two ways. The first is the transformation and the second one is the actions. Now transformations are the operations which are applied on an RDD to create a new RDD. Now these transformations work on the principle of lazy evaluation. And transformations are lazy in nature meaning when we call some operation in RDD, it does not execute immediately. Spark maintains the record of the operations it is being called through with the help of dialectic acyclic graphs, which is also known as DAGs. And since the transformations are lazy in nature, so when we execute operation anytime by calling an action on the data, the lazy evaluation data is not loaded until it's necessary. And the moment we call out the action, all the computations are performed parallelly to give you the desired output. Now a few important transformations are the map, flat map, filter, distinct, reduce by key, map partition, sort by. Actions are the operations which are applied on an RDD to instruct Apache Spark to apply computation and pass the result back to the driver. Few of these actions include collect, 
the collect as map reduce take first now let me implement few of these for your better understanding so first of all let me show you the bash rc file which i was talking about so here you can see in the bash rc file we provide the path for all the frameworks which we have installed in the system so for example you can see here we have installed hadoop the moment we install and unzip it or rather say untar it i have shifted all my frameworks to one particular location as you can see it's the usr the user and inside this we have the library and inside that i have installed the hadoop and also the spark now as you can see here we have two lines i'll highlight this one for you the PySpark driver Python, which is the Jupyter, and we have given it as a notebook. The option available as notebook. What it'll do is that the moment I start Spark, it will automatically redirect me to the Jupyter notebook. So let me just rename this notebook as RDD Tutorial. So let's get started. So here to load any file into an RDD, suppose I'm loading a text file, you need to use the SC, which is a Spark context, sc.txt file, and you need to provide the path of the data which you are going to load. So one thing to keep in mind is that the default path which the RDD takes or the Jupyter Notebook takes is the SDFS path. So in order to use the local file system, you need to mention the file colon and double forward slashes. Now once our sample data is inside the RDD, now to have a look at it, we need to invoke using it the action. So let's go ahead and take a look at the first five objects or I'd rather say the first five elements of this particular RDD. Now the sample data I have taken here is about blockchain. As you can see, we have one, two, three, four, and five elements here. Suppose I need to convert all the data into a low case and split it according to word by word. So for that, I'll create a function and in that function i'll pass on this rdd so i'm creating as you can see here i'm creating rdd1 that is a new rdd and using the map function or rather say the transformation and passing on the function which i just created to lower and to split it so if we have a look at the output of rdd1 so you can see here all the words are in the lower case and all of them are separated with the help of a space bar now there's another transformation which is known as the flat map to give you a flat and output and i'm passing the same function which i created earlier so let's go ahead and have a look at the output for this one so as you can see here we got the first five elements which are the same one as we got here the contracts transactions and and the records so just one thing to keep in mind is that the flat map is a transformation whereas take is the action now as you can see that contents of the sample data contains stop words so in, if i want to remove all the stop words all i need to do is start and create a list of stop words in which i have mentioned here as you can see we have a all the as is and now these are not all the stop words so i have chosen only a few of them just to show you what exactly the output will be and now we are using here the filter transformation and with the help of lambda function in which we have x specified as x not in stop words and we have created another RDD, which is RDD3, which will take the input from RDD2. So let's go ahead and see whether the and and the are removed or not. So as you can see, contracts, transaction, records of them. If you look at the output five, we have contracts, transaction, and and the. And and the are not in this list. Now suppose I want to group the data according to the first three characters of any element. So for that, I'll use the group by and I'll use the lambda function again. So let's have a look at the output. So you can see we have EDG and edges. So the first three letters of both words are same. Similarly, we can find it using the first two letters also. Let me just change it to two. So you can see we have GU and GUID, which is the guide. Now these are the basic transformations and actions, but suppose I want to find out the sum of the first thousand numbers or rather say first 10,000 numbers. All I need to do is Initialize another RDD, which is the num underscore RDD, and we use the sc dot parallelize. And the range we have given is 1 to 10,000. And we'll use the reduce action here to see the output. As you can see here, we have the sum of the numbers ranging from 1 to 10,000. Now, this was all about RDD. Now, next topic that we have on our list is broadcast and accumulators. 
Now in Spark, we perform parallel processing through the help of shared variables. Or when the driver sends any task to the executor present on the cluster, a copy of the shared variable is also sent to the each node of the cluster, thus maintaining high availability and fault tolerance. Now this is done in order to accomplish the task. And Apache Spark supports two types of shared variables. One of them is broadcast and the other one is the accumulator. Now broadcast variables are used to save the copy of data on all the nodes in a cluster, whereas the accumulator is the variable that is used for aggregating the incoming information via different associative and commutative operations. Now moving on to our next topic, which is a Spark configuration. Now Spark configuration class provides a set of configurations and parameters that are needed to execute a Spark application on the local system or any cluster. Now when you use Spark configuration object to set the values to these parameters, they automatically take priority over the system properties. Now this class contains various getters and setter methods. Now some of which are set method which is used to set a configuration property. We have the set master which is used for setting the master URL. We have the set app name which is used to set an application name and we have the get method to retrieve a configuration value of a key and finally we have set spark home which is used for setting the spark installation path on worker nodes now coming to the next topic on our list which is the spark files the spark file class contains only the class methods so that the user cannot create any spark files instance now this helps in resolving the path of the files that are added using the spark context add file method the class Spark files contain two class methods, which are the get method and the get root directory method. Now, the get is used to retrieve the absolute path of a file added through Spark context dot add file, and the get root directory is used to retrieve the root directory that contains the files that are added through the Spark context dot add file. Now, these are small topics, and the next topic that we'll covering in our list are the data frames. Now, data frames in Apache Spark is a distributed collection of rows under named columns, which is similar to the relational database tables or Excel sheets. It also shares common attributes with the RDDs. Few characteristics of data frames are immutable in nature. That is the same as you can create a data frame, but you cannot change it. It allows lazy evaluation. That is the task not executed unless and until an action is triggered. And moreover, data frames are distributed in nature, which are designed for processing large collection of structured or semi-structured data. It can be created using different data formats, like loading the data from source files such as JSON or CSV, or you can load it from an existing RDD. You can use databases like Hive, Cassandra. You can use Parquet files. You can use CSV, XML files. There are many sources through which you can create a particular RDD. Now let me show you how to create a data frame in PySpark and perform various actions and transformations on it. So let's continue this in the same notebook which we have here. Now here we have taken the NYC flight data and I'm creating a data frame which is the NYC flights underscore df. Now to load the data we are using the spark.read.csv method. I need to provide the path which is the local path. By default it takes the SDFS same as RDD. And one thing to note down here is that I've provided two parameters extra here, which is the info schema and the header. If we do not provide this as true or we skip it, what will happen is that if your data set contains the name of the columns on the first row, it will take those as data as well. It will not infer the schema. Now, once we have loaded the data in our data frame, we need to use the show action to have a look at the output. So as you can see here, we have the output, which is exactly it gives us the top 20 rows of the particular data set. We have the year, month, day, departure time, departure delay, arrival time, arrival delay, and so many more attributes. Now to print the schema of the particular data frame, you need the transformation or as say the action of print schema. So let's have a look at the schema. As you can see here, we have year, which is integer, month, integer, Almost half of them are integer. We have the carrier as string, the tail number as string, we have the origin string, destination string, and so on. Now, suppose I want to know how many records are there in my database or the data frame, I'd rather say. So, you need the count function for this one, and it will provide you with the results. So, as you can see here, we have 3.3 million records here, 3,036,776 to be exact. Now suppose I want to have a look at the flight name, the origin and the destination of just these three columns for the particular data frame. We need to use the select option. So as you can see here, we have the top 20 rows. Now what we saw was the select query on this particular data frame. 
but if I want to see or rather I want to check the summary of any particular column suppose I want to check the what is the lowest count or the highest count in the particular distance column I need to use the describe function here so I'll show you what the summary looks like so the distance the count is the number of rows total number of rows we have the mean the standard deviation we have the minimum value which is 17 and the maximum value which is 4983 now this gives you a summary of the particular column if you want to now that we know that the minimum distance is 17 let's go ahead and filter out our data using the filter function in which the distance is 17. so you can see here we have one data in which in the 2013 year the minimum distance here is 17. now similarly we suppose i want to have a look at the flights which are originating from ewr similarly we'll use the filter function here as well now the another clause here which is the where clause it is also used for filtering now suppose i want to have a look at the flight data and filter it out to see if the day at which the flight took off was the second of any month suppose so here instead of filter we can also use a where clause which will give us the same output now we can also pass on multiple parameters and rather say the multiple conditions so suppose i want the day of the flight should be 7th and the origin should be jfk and the arrival delay should be less than zero i mean that is for none of the postponed flights so uh, just to have a look at these numbers we'll use the way clause and separate all the conditions using the and symbol so as you can see here all the data the day is 7 the origin is jfk and the arrival delay is less than zero now these were the basic transformations and actions on a particular data frame now one thing we can also do is create a temporary table for sql queries if someone is not good or is not acquainted to all these transformation and action and would rather use sql queries on the data they can use this register.temp table to create a table for their particular data frame what it'll do is convert the nyc flights underscore df data frame into a nyc underscore flight table which can be used later and sql queries can be performed on this particular table so you remember in the beginning we used the nyc flights underscore df dot show now we can use the select asterisk from nyc underscore flights to get the same output now suppose we want to look at the minimum air time of any flights we use the select minimum airtime from NYC flights. That is the SQL query. We pass all the SQL query in the SQL context or SQL function. So as you can see here, we have the minimum airtime as 20. Now to have a look at the records in which the airtime is minimum 20. Now we can also use nested SQL queries. Now suppose if I want to check which all flights have the minimum airtime as 20. Now that cannot be done in a simple SQL query. We need nested query for that one. So selecting asterisk from New York flights where the airtime is in and inside that we have another query which is select minimum airtime from NYC flights. Let's see if this works or not. So yes, as you can see here, we have two flights which have the minimum airtime as 20. So guys, this is it for data frames. So let's get back to our presentation and have a look at the list which we were following. We completed data frames. Uh, next we have storage levels. Now storage level in PySpark is a class which helps in deciding how the RDDs should be stored. Now based on this RDDs are either stored in disk or in memory or in both. Now class storage level also decides whether the RDDs should be serialized or replicate its partition. Now the final and the last topic for or the today's list is the MLlib. Now MLlib is the machine learning API which is provided by Spark which is also present in Python. And this library is heavily used in Python for machine learning as well as real time streaming analytics. Now, various algorithms supported by these libraries are so first of all, we have the spark.mllib. Now, recently, the SpySpark MLlib supports model based collaborative filtering by a small set of latent factors. And here, all the users and the products are described, which we can use to predict the missing entries. However, to learn these latent factors, spark.mllib uses the alternating least square, which is the ALS algorithm. Next, we have the mllib.clustering, and a supervised learning problem is clustering. Now, here we try to group subsets of entities with one another on the basis of some notion of similarity. 
Next we have the frequent pattern matching which is the FPM. Now frequent pattern matching is mining frequent items, item set subsequences or other substructures that are usually among the first steps to analyze a large scale data set. This has been an active research topic in data mining for years. We have the linear algebra. Now this algorithm supports PySpark MLLib utilities for linear algebra. We have collaborative filtering. We have classification for binary classification. Various methods are available in spark.mllib packets such as multi-class classification as well as regression analysis. In classification, some of the most popular algorithms used are naive bias, random forest, decision tree, and so much. And finally, we have the linear regression. Now basically linear regression comes from the family of regression algorithms. To find relationships and dependencies between variables is the main goal of regression. Although PySpark MLLib package also covers other algorithm classes and functions, let's now try to implement all the concepts which we have learned in PySpark tutorial session. Now here we are going to use a heart disease prediction model and we are going to predict it using the decision tree with the help of classification as well as regression. Now these all are part of the MLLib library here. Let's see how we can perform these types of functions and queries. The so first of all, what we need to do is initialize the Spark context. So next, we are going to read the UCI dataset of the heart disease prediction and we are going to clean the data. So let's import the pandas and the numpy library here. Now let's create a data frame as heart disease df and as mentioned earlier we are going to use the read csv method here. And here we don't have a header so we have provided header as none. Now the original data set contains 303 rows and 14 columns. Now the categories of diagnosis of heart disease that we are predicting if the value 0 is for 50% less than narrowing and for the value 1 which we are giving is for the values which have 50% more diameter of narrowing. So here we are using the numpy library. Now these are particularly old methods which is showing the deprecated warning but no issues it will work fine. So as you can see here we have the categories of diagnosis of heart disease that we are predicting the value 0 is for less than 50 and value 1 is greater than 50. So what we did here was clear the row which have the question mark or which have the empty spaces. Now to get a look at the data set here now you can see here we have 0 at many places instead of the question mark which we had earlier. And now we are saving it to a txt file. And you can see here after dropping the rows with any empty values we have 297 rows and 14 columns. Now this is what the new clear data set looks like. Now we are importing the MLLib library and the regression here. Now here what we are going to do is create a label point which is a local vector associated with a label or a response. So for that we need to import the MLLib.regression. So for that we are taking the text file which we just created now without the missing values. Now next what we are going to do is pass the MLLib data line by line into the MLLib label point object and we are going to convert the minus one labels to the zero. Now let's have a look after passing the number of training lines. Okay we have the label point zero one. That's cool. Now next what we are going to do is perform classification using the decision tree. So for that we need to import the pyspark.mllib.tree. So next what we have to do is split the data into the training and testing data and we split here the data into 70s to 30s which is a standard ratio. 70 being the training data set and the 30% being the testing data set. Now next what we do is that we train the model which we have created here using the training set. We have created a training model decision tree dot train classifier. We have used the training data, number of classes is filed, the categorical feature which we have given. Maximum depth to which we are classifying it is 3. The next what we are going to do is evaluate the model based on the test data set now and evaluate the error. So here we are creating predictions and we are using the test data to get the predictions through the model which we created here. And we are also going to find the test errors here. 
So as you can see here, the test error is 0 0.2297. We have created a classification decision tree model in which the feature less than 12 is 3. The value of the features less than 0 is 54. So as you can see, our model is pretty good. So now next we'll use regression for the same purposes. So let's perform the regression using decision tree. So as you can see, we have the train model where we are using the decision tree dot train regressor using the training data. The same which we created using the decision tree model up there. We use the classification. Now we are using regression. Now similarly, we are going to evaluate our model using our test data set and find the test errors, which is the mean squared error here for regression. So let's have a look at the mean squared error here. The mean squared error is 0 0.168. That is good. Now finally, if we have a look at the learned regression tree model, so you can see we have created the regression tree model to the depth of three with 15 nodes and here we have all the features and classification of the tree. Hello folks, welcome to Spark interview questions. The session has been planned collectively to have commonly asked interview questions related to the Spark technology and the general answer and the expectation is Already you are aware of this particular technology to some extent and in general the common questions being asked as well as I'll give introduction about the technology as well. So let's get this started. So the agenda for this particular session is the basic questions we are going to cover and uh, questions related to the Spark Core technologies. That's when I say Spark Core, that's going to be the base and top of Spark Core we have four important components which work. That is streaming, graphics, MLlib and SQL. All these components have been created to satisfy a specific requirement. I'll give you an introduction about these technologies and get into the commonly asked interview questions. And the questions also framed such a way it covers the spectrum of the doubts as well as the features available within that specific technology. So let's take the first question and look into the answer like how commonly this covered. What is Apache Spark? And Spark it's with Apache Foundation now. It's an open source, it's a cluster computing framework for real-time processing. So three main keywords over here. Apache Spark is an open source project. It's used for cluster computing and for in-memory processing. Along with real-time processing, it's going to support in-memory computing. So there are lots of projects which supports cluster computing. Along with that, Spark differentiates itself by doing the in-memory computing. It's a very active community and out of the Hadoop ecosystem technologies, Apache Spark is very active. Multiple releases we got last year. It's a very active project among the Apache projects. Basically, it's a framework going to support in-memory computing and cluster computing. And you may face this specific question, how Spark is different than MapReduce or how you can compare it with the MapReduce. MapReduce is the processing methodology within the Hadoop ecosystem. And within Hadoop ecosystem, we have HDFS, Hadoop Distributed File System. MapReduce going to support distributed computing and how Spark is different. So I hope you can compare Spark with the MapReduce. In a way, this comparison is going to help us to understand the technology better, but definitely like we cannot compare these two or two different methodologies by which it's going to work. Spark is very simple to program, but MapReduce, there is no abstraction or the sense like all the implementations we have to provide. And interactivity, it has an interactive mode to work with in Spark. A MapReduce, there is no interactive mode. There are some components like Apache Pig and Hive, which facilitates us to do the interactive computing or interactive programming. And Spark supports real-time stream processing. And to precisely say, within Spark, the stream processing is called near real-time processing. There's nothing in the world is real-time processing. It's near real-time processing. It's going to do the processing in micro batches. I'll cover in detail when we are moving on to the streaming concept. I are going to do the batch processing on the historical data in MapReduce. When I say stream processing, I'll get the data that is getting processed in real time and do the processing and get the result, either store it or publish it to public community. We will be doing it. Latency wise, MapReduce will have very high latency because it has to read the data from hard disk. But Spark, it will have very low latency because it can reprocess or use the data already cached in memory. But there's a small catch over here. In Spark, first time when the data gets loaded, it has to read it from the hard disk. Same as MapReduce. 
So once it is read, it will be there in the memory. So Spark is good whenever we need to do a iterative computing. So Spark, whenever you do iterative computing again and again, do the processing on the same data, especially in machine learning, deep learning, all we will be using the iterative computing. Here Spark's performance much better. You will see the Spark performance improvement 100 times faster than MapReduce. But if it is one-time processing and fire and forget, that type of processing, Spark, relatively it may be the same latency you will be getting it than MapReduce, maybe like some improvements because of the building block of Spark, that's the RDD. We may get some additional advantage. So that's the key feature or the key comparison factor of Spark and MapReduce. Now let's get on to the key features, explain key features of Spark. We discussed about the speed and performance. It's going to use the in-memory computing. So speed and performance wise, it's going to much better when we do iterative computing. And it's a polygot. In the sense, the programming language to be used with the Spark, it can be any of these languages. It can be Python, Java, R, R Scala. We can do programming with any of these languages. And data formats to give us an input, we can give any data formats like JSON, Parquet, any data formats we can give that as an input. And the key selling point with the Spark is its lazy evaluation. In the sense, it's going to calculate the DAG cycle, directed acyclic graph, DAG, we call that as a DAG. It's going to calculate what all steps needs to be executed to achieve the final result. So we need to give all the steps as well as what final result I want. It's going to calculate the optimal cycle or optimal calculation. What all steps needs to be calculated or what all steps needs to be executed. Only those steps it will be executing it. So basically it's a lazy execution. Only if the results needs to be processed, it will be processing that specific result. And it supports real-time computing. It's through Spark Streaming. There is a component called Spark Streaming which supports real-time computing. And it gels with Hadoop ecosystem very well. It can run on top of Hadoop Yarn or it can leverage the HDFS to do the processing. So when it leverages the HDFS, the Hadoop cluster container can be used to do the distributed computing as well as it can uh, leverage the resource manager to uh, manage the resources. So Spark can gel with the HDFS very well as well as it can leverage the, the resource manager to share the resources as well as data locality it can leverage. Data locality, it can do the processing near to the data where data is located within the HDFS. And it has a fleet of machine learning algorithms already implemented, right from clustering, classification, regression, all those logic already implemented. And machine learning, it's achieved using MLlib within Spark. And there is a component called graphics, which supports graph theory. So we can solve the problems using graph theory, using the component graphics within the Spark. So these are the things we can consider as the key features of Spark. So when you discuss with the installation of the Spark, you may come across this yarn. What is yarn? Do you need to install Spark on all nodes of yarn cluster? So yarn is nothing but yet another resource negotiator. That's the resource manager within the Hadoop ecosystem. So that's going to provide the resource management platform. Yarn going to provide the resource management platform across all the clusters. And Spark, it's going to provide the data processing. So wherever the resource being used, that location the Spark will be used to do the data processing and of course yes we need to have Spark installed on all the nodes where Spark clusters are located. That's basically we need those libraries. And additional to the installation of Spark in all the worker nodes, we need to increase the RAM capacity on the worker machines as well. The Spark is going to consume huge amount of memory to do the processing. It will not do the MapReduce way of working. Internally it's going to generate the DAG cycle and do the processing on top of YARN. So YARN at the high level, it's like resource manager or like an operating system for the distributed computing. So it's going to coordinate all the resource management across the fleet of servers. On top of it, I can have multiple components like Spark, Taze, Giraffe. So Spark, especially it's going to help us to achieve in-memory computing. So Spark, YARN is nothing but it's a resource manager to manage the resource across the cluster. On top of it, we can have Spark. And yes, we need to have Spark installed in all the nodes of where the Spark yarn cluster is used. And also additional to that, we need to have the memory increased in all the worker nodes. The next question was like this, what file system does Spark support? When I say file system, when we work in an individual system, we will be having a file system to work 
within that particular operating system. But in a distributed cluster or in a distributed architecture, we need a file system with which where we can store the data in a distributed mechanism. Hadoop comes with a file system called HDFS. It's called Hadoop Distributed File System, where data gets distributed across multiple systems and it will be coordinated by two different types of components called name node and data node. And Spark, it can use this HDFS directly. So you can have any files in HDFS and start using it within the Spark ecosystem. And it gives another advantage of data locality. When it does the distributed processing, wherever the data is distributed, the processing could be done locally to that particular machine where data is located. And to start with, as a standalone mode, you can use the local file system as well. So this could be used especially when we are doing the development or any POC, we can use the local file system. And Amazon Cloud provides another file system called S3, Simple Storage Service. We call that as the S3. It's a block storage service. This can also be leveraged or used within Spark for the storage. And lot other file system also it supports. There are some file systems like Alexo, which provides in-memory storage. So we can leverage that particular file system as well. So we have seen all features, what all uh, functionalities available within Spark. We are going to look at the limitations of using Spark. Of course, every component, when it comes with a huge power and advantage, it will have its own limitations as well. So the next question illustrates some limitations of using Spark. Spark utilizes more storage space compared to Hadoop. When it comes to the installation, it's going to consume more space. But in the big data world, that's not a very huge constraint because storage cost is not very great or very high in a big data space. A developer needs to be careful while running the apps in Spark. The reason because it uses in-memory computing. Of course, it handles the memory very well. But if you try to load a huge amount of data in the distributed environment, and if you try to do join, when you try to do join with in the distributed world, the data are going to get transferred over the network. Network is really a costly resource. So the plan or design should be such a way to reduce or minimize the data transfer over the network. And however the way possible, with all possible means, we should facilitate distribution of the data over multiple machines. The more we distribute, the more parallelism we can achieve and the more results we can get. And cost efficiency, if you try to compare the cost, how much cost involved to do a particular processing, take any unit in terms of processing 1 GB of data with uh, say like 5 iterative processing. If you compare cost wise in memory computing always it's costlier because memory it's relatively com costlier than the storage. So that may act like a bottleneck and we cannot increase the memory capacity of the machine beyond some limit. So we have to grow horizontally. So when we have the data distributed in memory across the cluster, of course the network transfer, all those bottlenecks will come into picture. So we have to strike the right balance, which will help us to achieve the uh, in-memory computing. Whatever the in-memory computing requires, it will help us to achieve. And it consumes huge amount of data processing compared to Hadoop. And Spark, it performs better when user does uh, iterative computing. Because like for both Spark and the other technologies, it has to read data for the first time from the hard disk or from other data source. And Spark performance is really better when it reads the data or do, does the processing when the data is available in the cache. Of course, yes, the DAG cycle, it's going to give us a lot of advantage while doing the processing. But the in-memory computing processing, that's going to give us lots of leverage. The next question lists some use cases where Spark outperforms Hadoop in processing. The first thing is the real-time processing. Hadoop cannot handle real-time processing, but Spark can handle real-time processing. So any data that's coming in, in the Lambda architecture, you will have three layers. And most of the big data projects will be in the Lambda architecture. You will have speed layer, batch layer, and service layer. And the speed layer, whenever the data comes in, that needs to be processed, stored, and handled. So in those type of real-time processing, Spark is the best fit. Of course, within Hadoop ecosystem, we have other components which does the real-time processing like Storm. But when you want to leverage the machine learning along with the Spark streaming on such computation, Spark will be much better. So that's why like when you have architecture like a Lambda architecture, you want to have all three layers, patch layer, speed layer, and service layer. Spark can gel the speed layer and service layer far better. And it's going to provide a better performance. 
and whenever you do the batch processing especially like doing a machine learning processing we will leverage the iterative computing and can perform 100 times faster than Hadoop. The more the iterative processing that we do the more data will be read from the memory and it's going to get us a much faster performance than Hadoop MapReduce. So again remember whenever you do the processing only once so you're going to do the processing only once read process it and deliver the result spark may not be the best fit that can be done with the MapReduce itself and there is another component called Akka it's a messaging system or message coordinating system spark internally uses Akka for scheduling or any task that needs to be assigned by the master to the worker and the follow up of that particular task by the master basically asynchronous coordination system and that's achieved using Akka Akka programming internally it's used by the spark as such for the developers we don't need to worry about Akka programming of course we can leverage it but Akka is used internally by the spark for scheduling and coordination between master and the worker and within spark we have a few major components let's see what are the major components of Apache spark the name the components of spark ecosystem spark comes with a core engine so that has the core functionalities of what is required from by the spark or for the spark RDDs are the building blocks of the spark core engine on top of spark core the basic functionalities of file interaction file system coordination all that's done by the spark core engine on top of spark core engine we have a number of other offerings to do machine learning to do graph computing to do streaming we have n number of other components so the majorly used components are these components like spark sql spark streaming mllib graphics and spark car at the high level we will see what are these components spark sql especially it's designed to do the processing against a structured data so we can write sql queries and we can handle or we can do the processing so it's going to give us the interface to interact with the data especially structured data and uh, the language that we can use it's more similar to what we use within the SQL I can say 99 percentage it's same and most of the commonly used functionalities within the SQL have been implemented within spark SQL and spark streaming is going to support the stream processing that's the offering available to handle the uh, stream processing and MLlib is the offering to handle machine learning so the component name is called MLlib and it has a list of components a list of machine learning algorithms already defined we can leverage and use any of those machine learning algorithms graphics again it's a graph processing offerings within the spark it's going to support us to achieve graph computing against the data that we have like page rank calculation how many connected entities how many triangles all those going to provide us a meaning to that particular data and spark r is the component is going to interact or help us to leverage the language R within the Spark environment. R is a statistical programming language where we can do statistical computing within the Spark environment and we can leverage R language by using the Spark R to get that executed within the Spark environment. Additional to that there are other components as well like approximate database it's called blink DB all other things like in beta stage so these are the majorly used components within Spark. So next question how can spark be used alongside Hadoop so when we say spark performance much better it's not a replacement to Hadoop it's going to coexist with the Hadoop so it's uh, leveraging the spark and Hadoop together it's going to help us to achieve the best result a yes, spark can do in memory computing or can handle the speed layer and Hadoop comes with the resource manager so we can leverage the resource manager of Hadoop to make spark to work and few processing we don't need to leverage the in-memory computing for example one-time processing do the processing and forget or just store it we can use MapReduce so the processing cost or computing cost will be much less compared to Spark so we can amalgamize and get strike the right balance between the batch processing and stream processing when we have Spark along with Hadoop so let's have some detailed question related to Spark core Within Spark Core, as I mentioned earlier, the core building block of Spark Core is RDD, Resilient Distributed Data Set. It's a virtual, it's not a physical entity, it's a logical entity. You will not see this RDDs existing. The existence of RDD will come into picture when you take some action. 
So this RDD will be used or referred to create the DAG cycle and RDDs will be optimized to transform from one form to another form to make a plan how the data set needs to be transformed from one structure to another structure. And finally, when you take some against an RDD, the existence of the data structure, the resultant data will come into picture and that can be stored in any file system, either HDFS, S3 or any other file system can be stored. And RDDs can exist in a partitioned form, in the sense it can get distributed across multiple systems and it's fault tolerant. When I say fault tolerant, if any of the RDD is lost, any partition of the RDD is lost, it can regenerate only that specific partition it can regenerate. So that's the huge advantage of RDD. So if someone asks like what's the huge advantage of RDD, it's a fault tolerant where it can regenerate the last RDDs and it can exist in a distributed fashion and it is immutable. So since once the RDD is defined or like created, it cannot be changed. The next question is how do we create RDDs in Spark? The two ways we can create the RDDs. One is using the Spark context. We can use any of the collections that's available within the Scala or in the Java and using the parallelize function, we can create the RDD and it's going to use the underlying file systems distribution mechanism. If the data is located in a distributed file system like HDFS, it will leverage that and it will make those RDDs available in a number of systems. So it's going to leverage and follow the same distribution in RDD as well. Or we can create the RDD by loading the data from external sources as well, like HPs. Generally, HDFS we may not consider as an external source. It will be considered as a file system of Hadoop. So when Spark is working with Hadoop, mostly the file system we will be using will be the HDFS. So we can read from HPs or even we can read from other sources like Parquet file or from S3, different sources, Avro, we can read and create the RDD. Okay. Next question is what is executor memory in Spark application? So every Spark application will have a fixed heap size and fixed number of cores for the Spark executor. Executor is nothing but the execution unit available in every machine and that's going to facilitate to do the processing, to do the task in the worker machine. So irrespective of whether you use Yarn, resource manager or any other Mesos like resource manager, Every worker mission we will have one executor and within the executor the task will be handled and uh, the memory to be allocated for that particular executor is what we define as the heap size and we can define how much amount of memory should be used for that particular executor within the worker mission as well as number of cores can be used within the executor or by the executor within the Spark application and that can be controlled through the configuration files of Spark. Next question is define partitions in Apache Spark. So any data irrespective of whether it is a small data or larger data, we can divide those data sets across multiple systems. The process of dividing the data into multiple pieces and making it to store across multiple systems as a different logical units is called partitioning. So in simple terms, partitioning is nothing but the process of dividing the data and storing in multiple systems is called partitions and by default, the conversion of the data into RDD will happen in the system where the partition is existing. So the more the partition, the more parallelism we are going to get. At the same time, we have to be careful not to trigger huge amount of network data transfer as well. And every RDD can be partitioned within Spark. And uh, the parallel, the partitioning going to help us to achieve parallelism. More the partition that we have, more distributions can be done. And uh, the key thing about the success of the Spark program is minimizing the network traffic while doing the parallel processing and minimizing the data transfer within the systems of Spark. What operations does RDD support? So I can operate multiple operations against the RDD. So there are two type of things we can do. We can group it into two. One is transformations. In transformations, RDD will get transformed from one form to another form. Say like filtering, grouping, all that it's like it's going to get transformed from one form to another form. One small example like reduce by key, filter, all that will be transformations. The resultant of the transformation will be another RDD. At the same time, we can take some actions against the RDD that's going to give us the final result. I can say count how many records are they or store that result into the HDFS. They all are actions. So multiple actions can be taken against the RDD. So the existence of the data will come into picture only if I take some action against the RDD. Okay. 
Okay, next question. What do you understand by transformations in Spark? So transformations are nothing but functions. Mostly it will be higher, higher order functions. Within Scala, we have something like a higher order functions, which will be applied against that RDD. Mostly against the list of elements that we have within the RDD, that function will get applied. But the existence of the RDD will come into picture only if we take some action against it. In this particular example, I am reading the file and having it within the RDD called raw data. Then I am doing some transformation using a map. So it's going to apply a function. So within map, I have some function which will split each record using the tab. So the split with the tab will be applied against each record within the raw data. And the resultant movies data will again be another RDD. But of course, this will be a lazy operation. The existence of movies data will come into picture only if I take some action against it, like count or print or store. Only those actions will generate the data. So next question, define functions of Spark core. So that's going to take care of the memory management and fault tolerance of RDDs. It's going to help us to schedule, distribute the task and manage the jobs running within the cluster. And so it's going to help us to uh, store the data in the storage system as well as read the data from the storage system. That's to do the file system level operations. It's going to help us. And Spark core programming can be done in any of these languages like Java, Scalar, Python, as well as using R. So core is at the horizontal level. On top of Spark core, we can have a number of components. And there are different type of RDDs available. One such special type is pair RDD. So next question, what do you understand by pair RDD? So it's going to exist in pairs as a keys and values. So I can do some special functions within the pair RDDs or special transformations, like collect all the values corresponding to the same key, like sort and shuffle. What happens within the sort and shuffle of Hadoop? Those type of operations, like you want to consolidate or group all the values corresponding to the same key or apply some functions against all the values corresponding to the same key. Like I want to get the sum of the value of all the keys. We can use the pair RDD and get that achieved. So it's going to the data within the RDD going to exist in pairs, keys and values. All right. Okay. Uh, question from uh, Jason. What are uh, vector RDDs? In machine learning, you will have a huge amount of processing handled by vectors and matrices and uh, we do lots of operations vector operations like effective vector or transforming any data into a vector form so vectors like as the normal way it will have a direction and magnitude so we can do some operations like sum two vectors and what is the difference between the vector a and b as well as a and c if the difference between vector a and b is less compared to a and c we can say the vector a and B is somewhat similar okay, in terms of features. So the vector RDD will be used to represent the vector directly and that will be used extensively while doing the machine learning. Yeah, Jason. Thank you. And there's another question, what is RDD lineage? So here, any data processing, any transformations that we do, it maintains something called a lineage. So how data is getting transformed? When the data is available in a partition form in multiple systems, and when we do the transformation, it will undergo multiple steps. And in the distributed world, it's very common to have failures of machines or uh, machines going out of the network. And the system or framework as such, it should be in a position to handle. Spark handles it through RDD lineage. So it can restore the last partition only. Assume like out of 10 machines, data is distributed across five machines. Out of that, those five machines, one machine is lost. So whatever the latest transformation that had that data for that particular partition, the partition in the last machine alone can be regenerated. And it knows how to regenerate that data or how to get that resultant data using the concept of RDD lineage. So from which data source it got generated, what was its prior step? So the complete lineage will be available. And it's maintained by the Spark framework internally. We call that as RDD lineage. What is Spark driver? To put it simply for those who are from Hadoop background, Yarn background, we can compare this to AppMaster. Every application will have a Spark driver that will have a Spark context which is going to coordinate the complete execution of the job that will connect to the Spark master and uh, delivers the RDD graph that is the lineage to the master 
and uh, coordinate the tasks. What are the tasks that gets executed in the distributed environment? It can do the parallel processing, do the transformations and actions against the RDD. So it's a single point of contact for that specific application. So Spark driver is a short lived and the Spark context within the Spark driver is going to be the coordinator between the master and the tasks that are running. And Spark driver can get started in any of the executor within Spark. Okay. Name types of cluster managers in Spark. So whenever you have a group of machines, you need a manager to manage the resources. There are different type of cluster manager. Already we have seen the YARN, yet another resource negotiator, which manages the resources of Hadoop. On top of YARN, we can make Spark to work. Sometimes I may want to have Spark alone in my organization and not along with the Hadoop or any other technology, then I can go with the standalone. Spark has built-in cluster manager. So only Spark can get executed multiple systems. But generally, if we have a cluster, we will try to leverage various other computing platforms or computing frameworks like graph processing, giraffe, these, all that we will try to leverage. In that case, we will go with YARN or some generalized resource manager like Mesos. YARN is very specific to Hadoop and it comes along with Hadoop. Mesos is a cluster level resource manager. When I have multiple cl clusters within an organization, then I can use Mesos. Mesos is also a resource manager. It's a separate top level project within Apache. Next question, what do you understand by worker node? So in a cluster, in a distributed environment, we will have n number of workers. We call that as a worker node or a slave node, which does the actual processing. Going to get the data, do the processing and get us the result. And master node going to assign what task to be done by what worker node. And it's going to read the data available in the specific worker node. Generally, the task assigned to the worker node or the task will be assigned to the worker node where data is located. In big data space, especially Hadoop, always it will try to achieve the data locality. That's what we call it is the uh, resource availability. As well as the availability of the resource in terms of CPU, memory as well will be considered. Assume I have some data in replicated in three machines. All three machines are busy doing the work and no CPU or memory available to start the other task. It will not wait for those machines to complete the job and get the resource and do the processing. It will start the processing in some other machine which is going to be near to that the machines having the data and read the data over the network. So to answer straight, worker machines are nothing but which does the actual work and going to report to the master in terms of what is the resource utilization and the tasks running within the worker machines will be doing the actual work. And what is a sparse vector? Just few minutes back I was answering a question like what is a vector? Vector is nothing but representing the data in multidimensional form. A vector can be multidimensional vector as well. Assume I am going to represent a point in space. I need three dimensions, the x, y and z. So the vector will have three dimensions. If I need to represent a line in the space, then I need two points to represent the starting point of the line and the end point of the line. Then I need a vector which can hold, so it will have two dimensions. The first dimension will have one point, the second dimension will have another point. At the same way, if I have to represent a plane, then I need another dimension to represent two lines. So each line will be representing two points. Same way I can represent any data using a vector form. Assume I have huge number of feedback or ratings of products across an organization. Let's take a simple example, Amazon. Amazon have millions of products. Not every user, not even a single user would have used millions of all the products within Amazon. So only hardly we would have used like a 0.1% or like even less than that. Maybe like few hundred products we would have used and rated the products within Amazon for the complete lifetime. If I have to represent all ratings of the products with a vector, I'll say the first position of the rating, it's going to refer to the product with ID 1. Second position, it's going to refer to the product with ID 2. So I'll have million values within that particular vector. Out of million values, I'll have only values for 100 products where I have provided the ratings. So it may vary from number 1 to 5. For all others, it will say 0. Sparse means thinly distributed. Yeah. So to represent the huge amount of data with the position and saying this particular position is having a 0 value, we can mention that with the a key and value. So what position having what value? Rather than storing all zeros, I can store only non-zeros, the position of it 
and the corresponding value. That means all others are going to be a zero value. So we can mention this particular sparse vector, mentioning it to represent the non-zero entities. So to store only the non-zero entities, the sparse vector will be used. So that we don't need to waste additional space while storing the sparse vector. Let's discuss some questions on Spark Streaming. How is streaming implemented in Spark? I explain with examples. Spark Streaming is used for processing real-time streaming data to precisely say it's a micro-batch processing. So data will be collected between every small interval, say maybe like 0.5 seconds or every seconds, and it will get processed. So internally it's going to create micro-batches. The data created out of that micro-batch we call that is a D-stream. D-stream is like a RDD. So I can do transformations or actions, whatever that I do with RDD, I can do it with DStream as well. And Spark Streaming can read data from Flume, HDFS, or other streaming sources as well, and store the data in the dashboard or in any other database. And it provides a very high throughput, as it can be processed with a number of different systems in a distributed fashion. Again, streaming, DStream will be partitioned internally, and it has the built-in feature of fault tolerance. Even if any data is lost, any transformed RDD is lost, it can regenerate those RDDs from the existing or from the source data. So DStream is going to be the building block of streaming and it has the fault tolerance mechanism what we have within the RDD. So DStream or specialized RDD, specialized form of RDD specifically to use it within the Spark Streaming. Okay, next question, what is the significance of sliding window operation? That's a very interesting one. In the streaming data, whenever we do the computing, the data density or the business implications of that specific data may oscillate a lot. For example, within Twitter, we used to say the trending tweet hashtag. Just because that hashtag is very popular, maybe someone might have hacked into the system and used a number of tweets. Maybe for that particular hour, it might have appeared millions of times. Just because it appeared millions of times for that specific a minute duration or like say two, three minute duration, it should not get into the trending tag or trending hashtag for that particular day or for that particular month. So what we will do, we will try to do an average. So like a window, this current time frame and T minus one, T minus two, all the data we will consider and we will try to find the average or some. So the complete business logic will be applied against that particular window. So any drastic changes or to precisely say the spike or dip, any drastic spike or drastic dip in the pattern of the data will be normalized. So that's the biggest significance of using the sliding window operation within Spark Streaming. And Spark can handle this sliding window automatically. It can store the prior data, the T minus one, T minus two, and how big the window needs to be maintained, all that can be handled easily within the program, handles at the abstract level. Next question is what is DStream? The expansion is discretized stream. So that's the abstract form or the virtual form of representation of the data for the Spark streaming. The same way how RDD getting transformed from one form to another form, we will have series of RDDs all put together called as a DStream. So DStream is nothing but it's another representation of RDD are like a group of RDDs, we call that as a stream. And I can apply the streaming functions or any of the functions, transformations or actions are available within the streaming against this stream. So within that particular micro batch, so I'll define what interval the data should be collected or should be processed. We call that as a micro batch. It could be every one second or every 100 milliseconds or every five seconds. I can define that particular period. So all the data received in that particular duration will be considered as a piece of data and that will be called as a DStream. Next question, explain caching in Spark Streaming. Of course, yes, Spark internally it uses in-memory computing. So any data when it is doing the computing that's getting generated, it will be there in memory. But further, if you do more and more processing with other jobs, when there is a need for more memory, the least used RDDs will be cleared off from the memory or the least used data uh, available out of actions from the RDD will be cleared off from the memory. Sometimes I may need that data forever in memory. Very simple example like dictionary. I want the dictionary words should be always available in memory because I may do a spell check against the tweet commands or feedback commands a number of times. So what I can do, I can say 
cache those any data that comes in we can cache it or persist it in memory so even when there is a need for memory by other applications this specific data will not be removed and especially that will be used to do the further processing and the caching also can be defined whether it should be in memory only or in memory and hard disk that also we can define it let's discuss some questions on spark graphics so next question is is there an api for implementing graphs in spark so in graph theory everything will be represented as a, a graph when i say graph it will have nodes and edges so all will be represented using the rtds so it's going to extend the rtd and there is a component called graphics and it exposes the functionalities to represent a graph we can have a edge rdd vertex rdd by creating the edges and vertex i can create a graph and this graph can exist in a distributed environment so same way we will be in a position to do the parallel processing as well so graphics is just a form of representing the data the graphs with edges and vertices and of course yes it provides the api to implement or create the graph do the processing on the graph the apis are provided what is page rank in graphics so within graphics once the graph is created we can calculate the page rank for a particular node so that's very similar to how we have the page rank for the websites within google the higher the page rank that means it's more important within that particular graph it's going to show the importance of that particular node or edge within that particular graph when i say graph it's a connected set of data all data will be connected using the property and how much important that property makes we will have a value associated to it so within page rank we can calculate like a static page rank it will run a number of iterations or there is another page rank or dynamic page rank that will get executed till we reach a particular saturation level and the saturation level can be defined with multiple criteria and the apis we call that as a graph operations can be directly executed against those graph and they all are available as api within the graphics what is lineage graph so the rdd is very similar to the graphics how the graph representation every rdd internally it will have the relation saying how that particular rdd got created and from where how that got transformed rdd is how they got transformed so the complete lineage or the complete history or the complete path will be recorded within the lineage that will be used in case if any particular partition of the rdd is lost it can be regenerated even if the complete rdd is lost we can regenerate so it will have the complete information on what all partitions where it is existing what all transformations it had undergone what is the resultant value if anything is lost in the middle it knows where to recalculate from and what all essential things needs to be recalculated it's going to save us a lot of time and if that rdd is never being used it will never get recalculated so the recalculation also triggers based on the action only on need basis it will recalculate that's why it's going to use the memory optimally does apache spark provide checkpointing especially like take the example like a streaming and uh, if any data is lost within that particular sliding window we cannot get back the data or like the data will be lost as i am making a window of say 24 hours to do some average i am making a sliding window of 24 hours every 24 hours it will keep on getting slided and if you lose any system assume there is a complete failure of the cluster i may lose the data because it's all available in the memory so how to recalculate if the data system is lost it follows something called a checkpointing so we can checkpoint the data and directly it's provided by the spark api we have to just provide the location where it should get checkpointed and you can read that particular data back when you start the system again whatever the state it was in we can regenerate that particular data so yes to answer the question straight apache spark provides checkpointing and it will help us to regenerate the state what it was earlier let's move on to the next component spark mlli how is machine learning implemented in spark so machine learning again it's a very huge ocean by itself and it's not a technology specific to spark machine learning is a common data science it's a subset of data science 
world where we have different type of algorithms, different categories of algorithm like clustering, regression, dimensionality reduction, all that we have. And all these algorithms or most of the algorithms have been implemented in Spark. And Spark is the preferred framework or preferred application component to do the machine learning algorithm nowadays or machine learning processing. The reason because most of the machine learning algorithms needs to be executed iteratively a number of times till we get the optimal result. Maybe like say 25 iterations or 50 iterations or till we get that specific accuracy. We will keep on running the processing again and again. And Spark is very good fit whenever you want to do the processing again and again. Because the data will be available in memory. I can read it faster. Store the data back into the memory. Again read it faster. And all these machine learning algorithms have been provided within the Spark as a separate component called MLlib. And within MLlib we have other components like featureization to extract the features. You may be wondering how we can process the images. The core thing about processing an image or audio or video is about extracting the feature and comparing the feature how much they are related. So that's where vectors, matrices, all that will come into picture. And we can have pipeline of processing as well. Do the processing one, then take the result and do the processing two. And it has persistence algorithm as well. The result of it, the generated or processed result, it can be persisted and reloaded back into the system to continue the processing from that particular point onwards. Next question, what are categories of machine learning? Machine learning as such different categories are available, supervised, unsupervised and reinforced learning. Supervised and unsupervised it's very popular where we will know, so I'll give with an example, I'll know well in advance what category that belongs to. As if I want to do a character recognition. While training the data, I can give the information saying this particular image belongs to this particular category, character or this particular number and I can train. Sometimes I will not know well in advance, assume like I may have um, different type of images like it may have cars, bikes, cat, dog, all that. I want to know how many category available, I will not know well in advance. So I want to group it, how many category available. And then I'll realize saying, okay, the, all this belongs to a particular category. I'll identify the pattern within that category and I'll give a category name. Say like all these images belongs to boat category or looks like a boat. So leaving it to the system by providing this value or not, that's where the cat different type of machine learning comes into picture. And as such machine learning is not specific to Spark. It's going to help us to achieve to run this machine learning algorithms. What are Spark MLlib tools? MLlib is nothing but machine learning library or machine learning offering within the Spark. It has a number of algorithms implemented and it provides a very good feature to persist the result. Generally in machine learning we will generate a model. The pattern of the data we call that as a model. The model will be persisted either in uh, different forms like Parquet, Avro, different forms it can be stored or persisted and has methodologies to extract the features from a set of data. I may have a million images. I want to extract the common features available within those millions of images and there are other utilities available to process to define or like to define the seed, the randomizing it. So different utilities are available as well as pipelines. That's very specific to Spark where I can channel or arrange the sequence of steps to be undergone by the machine learning. So machine learning one algorithm first and then the result of it will be fed into machine learning algorithm two. Like that we can have a sequence of execution and that will be defined using the pipelines. These all are inbuilt features of Spark MLlib. What are some popular algorithms and utilities in Spark MLlib? So these are all some popular algorithms like regression, classification, basic statistics, recommendation systems. Recommendation system is like well implemented. All we have to provide is give the data. If you give the ratings and products within an organization, if you have the complete dump, we can build the recommendation system in no time. And if you give any user, it can give a recommendation. These are the products the user may like and those products can be displayed in the search result. Recommendation system purely works on the basis of the feedback that we are providing for the earlier products that we had bought. 
clustering dimensionality reduction, whenever we do processing with a huge amount of data, it's very, very compute intensive and uh, we may have to reduce the dimensions, especially the metrics dimensions within the MLA without losing the features. Whatever the features are available, without losing it, we should reduce the dimensionality and there are some algorithms available to do that dimensionality reduction and feature extraction. So what are all the common features or features available within that particular image? And I can compare what are all the common across common features available within those images. That's how we will group those images. So get me whether this particular image, the person looking like this image available in the database or not. For example, assume the organization or, or the police department, crime department maintaining a list of persons committed crime. And if they get a new photo, when they do a search, they may not have the exact photo bit by bit. The photo might have been taken with a different background, different lightings, different locations, different time. So 100% the data will be different or bits and bytes will be different. But look wise, yes, they are going to be seen. So I'm going to search the photo looking similar to this particular photograph as the input I'll provide. To achieve that, we will be extracting the features in each of those photos. We will extract the features and we will try to match the feature rather than the bits and bytes. And optimization as well in terms of processing or doing the piping. There are a number of algorithms to do the optimization. Let's move on to Spark SQL. Is there a module to implement SQL in Spark? How does it work? So directly not the SQL, maybe very similar to Hive. Whatever the structured data that we have, we can read the data or extract the meaning out of the data using SQL. And it exposes the API and we can use those API to read the data or create data frames. And Spark SQL has four major categories. Data source, data frame, Data frame is like the representation of X and Y data or like a Excel data, multidimensional structure data in abstract form. On top of data frame, I can do the query. And internally, it has the interpreter and optimizer. Any query I fire that will get interpreted or optimized and will get executed using the SQL services and get the data from the data frame or it can read the data from the data source and do the processing. What is a Parquet file? It's a format of the file where the data in some structured form, especially the result of the Spark SQL can be stored or returned in some persistence. And the Parquet again, it is a open source from Apache. It's a data serialization technique where we can serialize the data using the Parquet form. And to precisely say it's a columnar storage. It's going to consume less space. It will use the keys and values and store the data. And also it helps you to access a specific data from that Parquet form using the query. So Parquet, it's another open source format, data serialization form to store the data or persist the data as well as to retrieve the data. List the functions of Spark SQL. It can be used to load the varieties of structured data. Of course, yes, Spark SQL can work only with the structured data. It can be used to load varieties of structured data and you can use a SQL like statements to query against the program and it can be used with the external tools to connect to the Spark as well. It gives a very good integration with the SQL and using Python, Java, or Scala code, we can create a RDD from the structured data available directly using the Spark SQL. I can generate the RDD. So it's going to facilitate the people from database background to make the program faster and quicker. Next question is what do you understand by lazy evaluation? So whenever you do any operation within the Spark world, it will not do the processing immediately. It will look for the final result that we are asking for it. If it doesn't ask for the final result, it doesn't need to do the processing. So based on the final action, till we do the action, there will not be any transformations or there will not be any actual processing happening. It will just understand what are transformations it has to do. Finally, if you ask for the action, then in an optimized way, it's going to complete the data processing and get us the final result. So to answer straight lazy evaluation is doing the processing only on need of the resultant data. If the data is not required, it's not going to do the processing. Can you use Spark to access and analyze data stored in Cassandra database? Yes, it is possible. Okay, not only Cassandra, any of the NoSQL database, it can very well do the processing. And Cassandra also works in a distributed architecture. It's a NoSQL database. 
So it can leverage the data locality. The query can be executed locally where the Cassandra nodes are available. That's going to make the query execution faster and reduce the network load. And Spark executors, it will try to get started or the Spark executors in the machine where the Cassandra nodes are available or data is available, it's going to do the processing locally. So it's going to leverage the data locality. Next question, how can you minimize data transfers when working with Spark? If you ask the core design, the success of the Spark program depends on how much you are reducing the network transfer. Because network transfer is very costly operation and you cannot parallelize. It gives multiple ways or especially two ways to avoid this. One is called broadcast variable and accumulators. Broadcast variable, it will help us to transfer any static data or any information. Keep on publishing it to multiple systems. So I'll say if any data to be transferred to multiple executors to be used in common, I can broadcast it. Or I might want to consolidate the values happening in multiple workers in a single centralized location. I can use accumulator. So this will help us to achieve the data consolidation or data distribution in the distributed world at the API level or at the abstract level where we don't need to do the heavy lifting that's taken care by the Spark for us. What are broadcast variables? Just now as we discussed, the value, the common value that we need, I may want that to be available in multiple ex executors, multiple workers. Simple example, you want to do a spell check on the tweet comments. The dictionary which has the right list of words, I'll have the complete list. I want that particular dictionary to be available in each executor. So that with the task with, that's running locally in those executors can refer to that particular map task and get the processing done by avoiding the network data transfer. So the process of distributing the data from the Spark context to the executors where the task is going to run is achieved using broadcast variables. And it's a built-in within the Spark API. Using the Spark API, we can create the broadcast variable. And the process of distributing this data available in all executors is taken care by the Spark framework. Explain accumulators in Spark. The similar way how we have uh, broadcast variables, we have accumulators as well. Simple example, you want to count how many error records are available in the distributed environment. Assume data is distributed across multiple systems, multiple executors. Each executor will do the processing, count the records, and atomically I may want the total count. So what I'll do, I'll ask to maintain an accumulator. Of course, it will be maintained in the Spark context in the driver program because the driver program going to be one per application. It will keep on getting accumulated and whenever I want I can read those values and take any appropriate action. So it's like more or less the accumulators and broadcast variables looks opposite to each other but the purpose is totally different. Why is there a need for broadcast variable when working with Apache Spark? It's a read-only variable and it will be cached in memory in a distributed fashion and it eliminates the work of moving the data from a centralized location that is a Spark driver or from a particular program to all the executors within the cluster where the task is going to get executed. We don't need to worry about where the task will get executed within the cluster. So when compared with uh, the accumulators, broadcast variables, it's going to have a read-only operation. The executors cannot change the value. It can only read those values. It cannot update. So mostly it will be used like a cache that we have for the RDD. Next question, how can you trigger automatic cleanups in Spark to handle accumulated metadata? So there is a, a parameter that we can set, TTL, that will get triggered along with the running jobs and uh, intermediately it's going to write the data result into the disk or clean the unnecessary data or clean the RDDs that's not being used. The least used RDD, it will get cleaned and it will keep the metadata as well as the memory clean. What are the various levels of persistence in Apache Spark? When we say data should be stored in memory, it can be in different level, it can be persistent. So it can be in memory only, or memory and disk, or disk only. And when it is getting stored, we can ask it to store it in a serialized form. So the reason why we may store or persist is, I want this particular RDD, this form of RDD, later back for reusing. So I can read it back. Maybe I may not need it very immediately, so I don't want that to keep occupying my memory. I'll write it to the disk 
and I'll read it back whenever there is a need, I'll read it back. The next question, what do you understand by schema RDD? So schema RDD will be used especially within the Spark SQL. So the RDD will have the meta information built into it. It will have the schema also. Very similar to what we have the database schema, the structure of that particular data. And when I have the structure, it will be easy for me to handle the data. So data and the structure will be existing together. And the schema RDD now it's called as a data frame within Spark. And data frame term is very popular in languages like R, as other languages it's very popular. So it's going to have the data and the meta information about that data saying what column, what structure it is in. Explain the scenario where you will be using Spark streaming. Assume you want to do a sentiment analysis of tweeters. So data will be streamed. So we will use a Flume sort of a tool to harvest the information from Twitter and feed it into Spark streaming. It will extract or identify the sentiment of each and every tweet and mark it whether it is positive or negative. And accordingly the data will be the structured data, the tweet ID, whether it is positive or negative, maybe percentage of positive and percentage of negative sentiment. Store it in some structured form. Then you can leverage the Spark SQL and do grouping or filtering based on the sentiment. And maybe I can use a machine learning algorithm. What drives that particular tweet to be in the negative side? Is there any similarity between all those negative sentiment, negative tweets? Maybe specific to a product or specific time by when the tweet was tweeted or from a specific region the tweet was tweeted. So those analysis could be done by leveraging the MLlib of Spark. So MLlib streaming core all going to work together. All these are like different offerings available to solve different problems. So with this we are coming to end of this interview questions discussion of Spark. I hope you all enjoyed. I uh, hope it was a constructive and useful one. The more information about Edureka is available in this website edureka.co. All the best and keep visiting the website for blogs and latest updates. Thank you folks. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning!